I looked down at the professionally wrapped box sitting on the wraparound porch. The wrapping paper was red with little Christmas trees all over it. A large blue bow sat on the top, shaped like a spiked navel mine. Next to the bow, I saw the cheery, looping cursive of my stalker. I knelt down reading the tag, never knowing what it would say. To my best friend, from the cleaner. I sighed, picking up the package. I heard something wet sloshing around inside. Drops of blood started leaking out of the cardboard lining as I carried it. It left a trail of crimson in my wake. I went to the kitchen, grabbing a sharp knife. Inhaling deeply, I unwrapped the paper before slitting open the cardboard box underneath. I peered inside. Two cloudy, lifeless eyes stared back at me. The smell of decay and death became so thick as soon as I opened the box that I could taste it in the back of my mouth. I backed away quickly, but even when I closed my eyes, the mental image stayed with me. He had sent the decapitated head of a child, its blue lips pressed tightly together as if in an expression of disapproval. Squirming larvae ate at the stump of his neck and came out of the child's ears. Next to the head I saw a DVD case. On the front cover in huge, spiky letters were the words, Watch me. I sat in front of the TV, the DVD spinning rapidly in the player. The black screen rippled with static. A jarring cacophony emanated from the speakers, and then a second later, a face appeared. The Valley Ripper always wore the costume of a Baphomet in these videos. He had on a black robe. On his face, he wore a mask that made him look like a goat. Two giant black horns twisted from his head. The eyes of the mask looked bleached white and dead. I have sent you a present, he said, using a synthesizer to change his voice. It came through as a deep and demonic. Our game is not yet over. Do you know why I have chosen you? Because you're a friggin' psychopath, I whispered to myself. Because you have potential. I saw it in you on the first day we met. You're not like the others. Within you, you have the seeds of the Overman. You have the seeds of greatness. For the last ten years, I have tried to push you towards self-realization. You have the same power within you that I do, but I did not realize it on my own. My father took what was a formless lump of clay and molded it into a masterpiece. I see now that I will have to do the same with you. Oh god, I moaned. Ah, oh, man. I felt nervous about the ominous promises he made on the video. Moreover, I mourned the loss of life. But, most of all, I knew these deaths were all my fault because, in reality, I could have helped stop the Valley Ripper at any time. But I didn't. I reflected back on how I had gotten myself stuck in this quagmire. The first time I met the Valley Ripper, I had been roaring drunk. I drank constantly back then. Every night I would pass out. Undoubtedly I was an alcoholic. I stopped drinking a few years ago, but not before the poison did inestimable damage to my life and liver. If it weren't for rehab and AA, I strongly believe I would be dead. I remember driving home from some concert. I can't even remember the band now. A friend from work had invited me and I never missed an opportunity to drink socially. I never missed an opportunity to drink, period, now that I think about it. My friend Ellis pounded me on the shoulder as I downed my second shot of imported Russian vodka. Puts hair on your chest, he yelled, trying to be heard over the jarring music. He started laughing, the bright multicolored lights flashing off his glasses. I motioned to his shot. You next. I said. He took it down without expression, slamming the empty shot glass on the wooden counter. Ellis was a huge man, nearly seven feet tall. He had a dark brown mustache. Matching wavy hair ran down over his forehead. Thick muscles covered his arms and legs. His skin looked as white and pale as powdered milk. The bartender brought out two Long Island iced teas. I started chugging the delicious, boozy concoction. I could feel total release just around the corner, an impending blackout. The music blared in our ears, the metal guitar solos blasting a rapid succession of chords. I think I'm going to get headed out, I shouted loudly in Ellis's ear after I finished my drink. If I stay here much longer, I'll be way too drunk to get home and I have to work tomorrow. Ellis nodded, yawning. He got up and threw some money on the counter. I did the same. Alright, let's go, he said. It's only a ten minute drive away. Ellis lived close, 
only about a three minute walk from my house. As I walked outside, the cool air swept over my skin. I felt the sweat start to evaporate like light mist in a breeze. So, you watched the news lately? Ellis asked conversationally. My ears still rang from the shrill whine of the guitars and the harsh shrieking of the vocalist. I shook my head. I don't own a TV, I said. He looked at me in amazement. Really? He said. Why not? I shrugged. It's a waste of time and it makes you stupid. I read books mostly. Ellis nodded at this. So you didn't hear the latest news? He asked in a hushed, secretive tone. Without waiting for an answer, he kept talking. I guess there's a serial killer nearby. I rolled my eyes. There's probably always a serial killer nearby, I said. There's over 300 million people in this country. What are the chances that there are no psychotic murderers in a 50 mile radius where hundreds of thousands of people live? Pretty low, I think. We had gotten close to my car, a fully restored Ford Thunderbird. Ellis always complained about the lack of space and legroom, and in his defense, he did kind of look like a clown in a clown car when I put the top down. Yeah, you're probably right, but this is no ordinary serial killer, Ellis continued. He's a real-life Satanist, like something out of a horror movie. How do you know? I asked. He laughed sardonically at that. Everyone knows. It's all over the news. He's done three houses so far. At the first house, he found the husband in his bed. The guy saw him breaking in and the killer slit his throat. The husband still fought like a madman, though, even with a slit throat. There were signs of a struggle and his knuckles all looked bruised. This is according to the media anyway, so take it with a grain of salt. I nodded. So the guy goes into his house and takes all their most valuable stuff, like any money or jewelry. He seems to kill randomly. In some houses he kills everyone, but at the first house, he let the wife live and only killed the husband and children. The wife said that she was crying and pleading with him, and she apparently didn't know that the rest of her family was dead as he had bound and blindfolded her downstairs, where she was sleeping in front of the TV. She said she would give him anything he wanted if he didn't hurt her kids. She started swearing to God, and he slapped her. No, bitch, he growled. Swear to Satan. Swear to Satan, I asked, appalled. Ellis nodded grimly. Yeah, apparently the guy is a real-life Satanist. He believes Satan protects him. He worships the devil and offers him sacrifices. And since those sacrifices are all suburban rich people, you can imagine the uproar. It would be different if he was killing people in the inner city. No one would give a damn. Ellis laughed at that, though I didn't see the humor. I drove down the dark country roads as we talked about the Valley Ripper. The booze made my head feel light and empty. All my problems seemed to have dissolved and I was just happy to be alive. Until the woman started walking in front of my car. I was trying to light a cigarette at the time. If I hadn't drunk so much, I might have been able to save the situation. But by the time I looked up, a collision had become inevitable. Hey, look out! Ellis screamed in panic. Looking up from his phone at the last possible second, I braced for impact. The woman's body smashed into my front passenger's side headlight. I heard a tinkling of breaking plastic and glass accompanied by a revolting cracking sound as the woman's bones shattered. Her body rolled, spinning in mid-air and denting my hood. Then she hit the windshield, leaving jagged cracks like lightning bolts. She flew over the car and landed with a nauseating thud on the cold, empty street behind us. I pulled over, putting on the hazard lights. Ellis looked like he was in shock. Is she... is she dead? He asked, gulping heavily. I opened the driver's side door and vomited on the pavement before stumbling out of the car. My heart was beating so fast I thought it would explode, and I had a whining, ringing sound in my ears. I started walking back to the woman. Yes, she was very dead. I could see her neck jutting to the side at a 45 degree angle, like a bird with its spine broken. A long, gasping exhalation escaped her bloody, open lips, and then she lay silent. She looked like she was in her early 20s, with long black hair and blue eyes. She had on all sorts of rings and necklaces, many of them with occult symbols. I saw upside-down pentagrams, the Ouroboros, the black sun, and the OM symbol. A rather esoteric collection, I thought to myself. Oh no, I whispered to myself, suddenly feeling very sober. A thousand thoughts ran through my head a second, and all of them seemed worthless. Ellis stood by my side, one hand on my shoulder, 
He tried giving comfort, but I only felt disassociated and scared. You have to report this, Ellis said, trying to be comforting. A moment later, his head disintegrated before my eyes. I heard a deafening gunshot. The stump of his neck continued to pump blood for a few seconds before his body fell, his hands sliding down my back as he went. I started screaming, trying to run, but I hadn't gotten more than ten feet when a hand grabbed me by the arm and spun me around. I saw a man standing there in a black robe with a goat mask over his head. He had a sniper rifle slung around his shoulder and a pistol in his right hand. He tilted his head slightly, like someone curious about a new arrival. Do you know who I am? He asked in a deep, almost robotic voice. He had no inflection to his words or change in cadence. It gave his voice a reptilian quality. The, 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 the Valley Reaper? I said, feeling very cold. Goosebumps began rising all over my skin, and I started shaking, my hands trembling. He nodded slowly. That's what the media calls me, so I hear. It's as good a name as any. He knelt close to me. I've been watching you, John. You scam your own co-workers, family, and friends. Stealing their money and leaving town. How many times have you done it? How long until you got in, too? He pointed at Ellis's nearly headless corpse. I gaped at the man. How did he know so much about me? Don't get me wrong, I admire what you do, the serial killer continued. There is no such thing as right and wrong. The only right in this world is what serves the strong. The only wrong is weakness. You have exploited the weakness of others. This is only natural for superior beings like you and me. I'm nothing like you, I said, spitting the words at him. He didn't seem the slightest bit affected. Then why haven't you called the police yet? He asked. You just killed a girl. You're just going to let her rot here? Are you planning on driving away? No, I responded slowly. Actually, I didn't know what I had planned. A rising sense of panic and dread had nearly convinced me to just hop in my car and get far away from the accident. Look, it's not entirely your fault, the man said, a note of glee in his voice. I did happen to drug her and send her out into the road when you were near. I figured with the amount you drank, you would plow right into her. Crack and smash and bang. He shrieked with laughter at the image. And you did. Right on cue, brother. Right on cue. I'm not sure what you want with me, I said, a flash of anger rising and dissipating within my chest in an instant. I don't understand why you're doing any of this. Because you have potential, and I want to talk to you and make a deal. He pointed at the two corpses on the road. I was grateful that almost no cars traveled this way at night. The town we found ourselves in only had a hundred people in it, and when it got late, the roads looked like ghost towns. I'll clean up this mess, but no, I have the entire thing on video. Even right now, you're being recorded. I recorded the accident from multiple angles. You and your license plate are visible in every single one. I gawked at the man. This entire encounter seemed impossible. What I want from you in exchange for my silence and help is simply this. I want someone who can look at my work and appreciate it for what it is. Every Christmas I will send you a present and a videotape. I want you to open the present and watch the tape. If you don't, I'll know, and I'll send a copy of this little incident here to the police. Okay. Okay said, backing away. I expected the man to shoot me at any moment. Whatever you want. If you want to send me Christmas presents, you could have just asked. You didn't need to set up this whole insane charade. The man clucked his tongue condescendingly. We'll see about that, he said ominously. I decided I had had enough. I changed my life over the course of the last ten years. I no longer went around doing Ponzi schemes and stealing people's life savings. Though I really didn't want to go to prison. I figured I needed help from the authorities at this point, and that would only happen if I gave a full confession. I tried putting it off for a couple more days. I got home from work late that night, stomping through the snow to get to the front door. Freezing and wet, I quickly unlocked it and went into the house. The light from the living room streamed into the kitchen. Odd, I thought. I never left the lights on. 
I went into the living room, seeing the black-robed man standing there. In front of him I saw a middle-aged man strapped to a fold-out table, gagged and chained. His eyes rolled wildly, looking from me to the ominous killer who stood before us like the angel of death. You have become weak, the killer said, a note of disappointment in his voice. I thought you were different from the others. It seems to me that you have swallowed their poisoned morality and become a sheep. And the only thing sheep are good for, my friend, is slaughtering. He pointed to the bound man on the table. I want you to kill him. I want you to prove your worth to myself. And Lucifer, give thanks to Satan and cut his throat. No, I screamed. I'm done with this game. The killer shook his head slowly. Are you sure? He asked. I nodded, suddenly feeling very afraid. I began to take a step back, intending to turn around and run. The killer pointed a gun at me and fired. It made a soft popping sound. I looked down to see a dart in my chest. Don't worry, he said, a note of mirth in his voice. It's just a tranquilizer gun. I'm sorry that we have to do this the hard way. He took the sharp knife from the table next to the man, raising it high and plunging it into the victim's throat. The man's eyes widened. A bubbling, gurgling sound started as he choked on his own fluids. The world began to spin and go black. I remember falling on the kitchen floor, trying to crawl away, and then nothing. I awoke in prison, surrounded by countless guards and police officers. They all gave me looks of disgust and hatred. We've got him, one said. We finally caught the Valley Ripper. We found all the knives, guns, and rope used in his house and even the body of one of his victims. They had also found videotapes, including the one of me hitting the woman. They had found the black robes and mask he used. No one believed me when I protested and tried telling the story. I barely believed it. It's too fantastic, too bizarre. I'm writing this from prison. My lawyer grudgingly agreed to share it, even though no one will believe me. I want to let people know, because the Valley Ripper is still free. And I don't know what he's going to do next. Questioning mom about Middleview was a bad idea. For the past few days, I have been losing my mind over my own existence. In my mother's eyes, my mind was wiped clean of the horrific discovery behind my childhood upbringing and the life I thought was mine. Per my last post, I was keeping a low profile, playing along with the lie that my memory had been successfully wiped. Mom works late, so I only had to keep up the facade over breakfast, and it looked like it was working. I couldn't eat or sleep, or look at my mother in the eye for longer than several seconds. In class, I couldn't concentrate. All I could think about was the lie I was playing along with. The delusions I had been taking meds for were real. The Middle View 4, a fantasy my therapist and mother had insisted was a trauma response from a head injury as a child, were real. The three kids I thought were characters in my own head, a vicious blend of my favorite cartoons as an imaginative kid, they existed. Not just that, I had found them again, and they were made of strings. As the days progressed, it became harder to keep up the facade that I was oblivious. Mom knows when I'm not feeling well. I don't know if it was mother's intuition or she was just perceptive. When I couldn't bring myself to eat my cereal, her expression seemed to twitch. Perfectly painted lips curling into a frown. I made the mistake of not answering one of her obligatory how were classes yesterday questions. I'm human. I can't hide my emotions. Especially when they control me more than I control them. So far, I was doing well playing along with the memory wipe, which was exactly what she wanted. I feigned confusion and complained of mind blanks when she casually questioned what I had been doing the night I snuck into her work and discovered my childhood was a glorified stage show. This time I was a lot sloppier in answering, because the truth was that I had been kneeling in the bathroom all day, my head pressed against the cool porcelain of a toilet seat, choking up everything I had eaten. You're quiet today. Mom straightened in her seat to pour me more orange juice. I could sense she was on edge. Mom had not touched her own breakfast, her fingers gripping the pitcher a little too tight. I dazedly watched freshly squeezed orange juice fill my glass to the top. 
and then overflowing, pooling across the table. The way it moved, seeping across wooden grains, reminded me of the wet congealing mess of red dribbling down my best friend's chin as he was pulled left to right, string to string. Noah Presley did not make sense. He was alive, conscious, and yet his body was no longer human, just a sick joke, a plastic, artificial body made from old flesh. Noah Presley, the first member in the Middle View 4, was nothing but an entanglement of string. I had to swallow warm bile creeping its way up my throat and filling my mouth. I'm fine, Mom. I forced another smile. You're spilling juice everywhere. Mom stopped pouring, her hand jerking when she realized her mistake. She placed the pitcher back on the table. Her smile made me sick to my stomach, a grin that was more of a grimace, full of desperation and almost pity. Mom remembered my reaction. I was in her arms, screaming, sobbing, and I could see the after effects in her inability to sit still, the slight trembling in her hands. She was so obsessed with hiding behind a lie and forcing me to drown in an oblivion and obliviousness I didn't want. I needed to forget what I saw to protect her job and whoever the puppeteer of Middleview was, whatever my mother thought she had done to my head and wiped away. I could still see it. I could still see the contorted dancing strings pulling my friends into a frenzied prance. Strings that were slick red Strings that entangled their arms and legs and expressions, hooked inside their mouths and prying their eyes open. I thought I could get it out of my head. I thought drinking enough and then drugging myself with sleeping pills would pull me away from the reality of what I saw, but I couldn't escape it. I still saw them. I see them dangling on strings, hollowed out shells carved of everything that they were, horrifying mimics of the middle view four. I could still remember her words in my ear, each one choking on my tongue. I choose you. Forcing a spoonful of cereal into my mouth, I chewed mechanically. I could see them dancing on strings being pulled back and forth, left and right, up and down. Eris's laughing grin, his mouth and lips carved into that of a marionette. May's head bobbing, following the puppeteer, and Noah's vacant eyes penetrating through me before something seemed to contort, to come alive in his expression. I saw real pain, agony ripping through him, a self-awareness, confusion, pain and anger that was killing him, awakening as a, a plastic puppet bound a string severed right through him, entangling every part of him. I could see them, blood red string wrapped around his wrists, elbows, arms and legs, locked under his jaw and contorting his removable mouth. I remember his eyes frantically following me, silently begging for help. Until he was dragged back, a pained howl escaped his lips. How could Noah Presley scream? I thought dizzily. How could he feel pain and despair, agony, even when he was no longer something I recognized? No longer human. I thought back to his younger self sitting with me in the playground. The two of us, seven years old. Did I miss the boy's strings? I could still remember him, a blur of dark brown curls and mischievous eyes. Was my best friend on strings the whole time, dancing to someone else's tune? May. She was still laughing, her mouth abnormally large, Eris still bobbing up and down, his limbs limp. Taping my head back, I couldn't see a puppeteer, only entangled strings hanging in thin air. I remember opening my mouth to try and talk to them, to demand why this was the reality of them. But then my mother's arms were around me, her face pressed into the back of my neck, mumbling an explanation I didn't want to hear. Her presence should have been comforting, because I sure as hell wanted my mom. But was this woman my mom? She had taken me from Middleview at the age of 15 years old, and then filled my head with delusions that my friends were figments of my imagination. Their here was all that could slip from my mouth, and my mother was responding in a sob. No, sweetie. No, they're not. She was whispering to me in sharp breaths, just like when I was a kid and needed her most, but I could barely understand her. I was watching the people responsible for this stage show on strings, calmly pulling Noah away, bleeding from the blinding illumination of the floodlights and into the shadow. 
These people moved quickly, carrying Eris and May like they were inanimate objects. Well, they were. Their heads were bowed, bodies limp and unmoving, wobbling on jerking strings. I was going to expose them to the world. Mom's voice didn't even sound real, a vicious white noise in my ears. The stage crew worked fast and efficiently. They wrapped their hands around Eris's neck, yanking May by her ponytail. They didn't react, their limbs jerking, moving with the strings, and I screamed, a raw scream that burned my throat. I wanted the two of them to tell me they were okay, that they missed me, and they were back, and never going to leave me again. Except I was already seeing all of them, their painful reality. Hollowed out torsos and old flesh and bone that had been stitched and melded together. Eris's smile was tragically permanent, unless his puppeteer wrapped their fingers where his spine had become a stand. Mom tightened her grip on me, but I could barely feel it, her fingernails slicing into the flesh of my shoulders. My head was spinning, and at one point I clawed my way out of my mom's arms, sinking my teeth into her elbow. I got maybe half a step before my knees hit the ground, and Mom was back next to me, her heaving, heavy breath in my ear. You are the property of an evil and very powerful little girl who owns this town and everyone in it. My mom spat in my ear. They made me keep my mouth shut, Marin. She calmly shoved me into the back of my car and slammed the door shut. I begged them to save one of you. Just one and I wouldn't talk. I had to cut one of you down. There were lights flashing in my eyes, and my head was hitting the window with a gentle thunk. Mom's voice swam in and out, joining phantom ones threaded in my mind. Something sharp pricked the back of my neck, and I plunged down, 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 into the dark, with her voice still grazing my skull while my body shut down. I was no longer screaming, my mouth numbed and wrong. I choose you, Mom said, her voice breaking. The car was picking up speed, flying over bumps in the road. Mom was sobbing, her palms turning white around the wheel. I had the choice to take any one of you, and all of you were special. All of you were my children, Marin. I wanted to take you away from her. The rest of that memory splintered into fragments of nothing, the drugs doing their job, but now that I had time to go over it, memorize it, try and study it, I could delve further into what I had lost. So sitting with my mother at breakfast, trying not to throw up cereal, the more I prodded on those particular words in my head, replaying them over and over in my... Another memory began to slowly unravel in my mind, previously filled with fog. I was in the back of her car. My mom was driving, her fingers gripped around the wheel. It was pitch dark outside, rain thundering on the window. This time my hands were wet and warm, slick with something. Strings? They covered my hands, knotted between my fingers, and I couldn't pull them away. They didn't hurt because I don't think they were mine. My cheek was uncomfortably pressed to the cool glass of the window, my eyes flickering, dazedly drinking in the glow of passing streetlights, down the seemingly never-ending stretch of road. I couldn't speak, my lips numb, thoughts scattered from whatever she had forced into my bloodstream. Instead of focusing on the slowly collapsing pinprick of darkness we were driving into, I idly followed a single raindrop, sliding down the pane, spiraling, and joining the others in their graceful dance. My gaze had been glued to the raindrop, entranced in its beauty, when something or someone moved in the passenger seat. I lifted my head as far as my topsy-turvy brain would let me, blinking stars from my eyes. There was a hooded figure curled up on the seat their head resting against the window. I tried to open my mouth, to ask my mother who this was, but my eyes were too heavy, coaxed by the drug seeping through my blood, and I fell back into the dark, lulled by my mom singing me her favorite song. In a town where I was born, lived a man who sailed the sea, and he told us of his life in the land of submarines. Sweetie, are you okay? Presently, mom snapped me out of it. Her humming was still in my mind, rooted into my thoughts, a false sense of security. Lifting my head, my gaze went to my untouched bowl of cereal. I didn't notice I'd been mindlessly stirring it into an unappetizing mush. 
Early morning sunlight filtered through the blinds in the kitchen, and part of me craved the unfamiliar darkness and tranquility of the car ride in my memory. A thought was already brewing in the back of my mind. Who was in the passenger seat? The sunlight was too bright, too sharp, stabbing at my eyes, just like the mysteries I solved as a kid. The splinter of memory was nothing but a jaggered puzzle piece that led nowhere. I felt frustration and anger, but most of all, my brain was itching to understand, to solve this gap inside my mind. There were two questions I still needed answering, on top of the gruesome reality that was Noah, Eris, and May. One, what happened on the night the Middleview 4 entered the string factory? And two, who was the other passenger in my mother's car? I was suffocated with questions, both about my fake life and my real one. I had known this woman my whole life. Was that part of the show? The helplessness and despair that filled me, my brain replaying what my friends really were, the shattered, hollowed out shells of their former selves, or what led me to dropping my spoon and fixing my mother with a textile fake smile. Who are they? I asked casually, my tone hardening. Ignoring my mom's paling cheeks, I spooned cereal into my large, gaping mouth, mimicking Eris's two-eyed puppet grin. Mom's expression twisted, but she still feigned obliviousness. I watched her pour more orange juice. Even when my glass was full, her hands were shaking. You're going to have to be more specific, sweetie, she laughed. Who? Mr. Main, my middle school principal, I said, gulping down my juice which was a little too spicy for my liking. I felt like I was interrogating suspects again. At 14 years old, we managed to convince the sheriff to let us talk to perps. Back then, it felt natural with Noah perched on the side of the desk, playing good cop, bad cop. May standing with her arms folded, her expression enough to freak out perps, and Eris idly standing next to me, recording the whole thing. I felt on top of the world as a kid, with the unwritten responsibility to protect my town. As an adult, interrogating my mother who had just gone ten shades of white, I was terrified. All of that magic was gone, and the people who made the magic were nothing more than plastic dolls. Mr. Stevens, my creepy janitor, I was aware of my voice cracking. Noah Presley, May Lee, Eris Kane, the names were only reminding me of their fate, and my eyes were filling with tears my gut twisting. Mom continued to eat her breakfast, and every bite looked painful. Who are they, Mom? I only asked one question. One simple question, and my mother became a different person right in front of me. I was waiting for a response when the world jolted to the left, and then to the right. I was frowning at my mother's pursed smile, and then I was sideways, my cheek pressed into the cool marble table, my glass of juice seeping underneath me, a wet patch gluing my hair to my cheek. My breakfast was on the floor, and my mother was hissing into her phone, her shadow swimming in and out of my view in my pinprick vision. My mouth moved, but words were difficult. Twisted enigmas on my tongue, it was almost funny. I'd been a junior detective since I was seven years old, and somehow, I'd been fooled by the oldest trick in the book. The orange juice, I thought, my mind slowing. The orange juice tasted... A little too orangey. Drug. Of course. Before I knew what was happening, I was in my mother's arms, my head awkwardly hanging down, bile dribbling down my chin. This was a stronger sedative than the car ride. I remember being carried outside and being thrown onto uh, odd-smelling car seats that smelled like leather and rich people. The ride was short. I only remember seeing the towering walls hiding middle view from the world and an oldish man peeking through the window. Long, winding hallways followed. I was so out of it, still hanging from my mother's arms, I swore we passed a playroom. The door was wide open. I could see colorful letters and sponge blocks on the floor. Then I was lying on my back on an unfamiliar bed, surrounded by white walls. The hospital was my first thought, until my gaze found the lack of a window. Mom loomed over me, a broken smile on her face and swollen eyes. She grabbed my arm, stabbing into my flesh. I tried to move, tried to snatch it back, but I was paralyzed. Don't worry, honey. I'm going to fix you. Her smile was hopeful, and I almost trusted it. I noticed her hands were covered, entangled in something. 
string. I can see it coming apart down my arm, like a seam in a dress. The color reminded me of blood, a river of red running down my skin, and my sobbing mother was pulling, pulling, pulling the string until I was unraveling completely, my body and mind falling. I could feel her slicing something cruel and cold into my skin, snipping away the thread, and then moving to my left arm. Mom pressed a kiss to my forehead, and it felt familiar. I'm going to make it all go away, and then we're going to move far away. I heard a door open and close, footsteps thudding towards me and something plastic being strapped over my face. Mom's voice hung around in my mind, dancing almost like my puppet friends. Far away, she sang, far away where she won't find us. If I could describe the last three days, I would liken them to a never-ending acid trip. I guess that's what happens when you're looped up on wacky drugs, which isn't the first time I've been drugged. Marin, hell, wake up! The slightly muffled and very slurred voice was enough to jerk me awake. The memory was so clear, and yet reliving it all over again was trippy as hell. Case number 14. We were 14 years old, and it was our first mystery I didn't fully remember. All over town, people, teenagers especially, have been found with severe burn marks to their faces and torsos. The photos from the crime scene were gut-churning. Five victims and one casualty, and all of them had competed in that year's high school beauty pageant. We were yet to find a suspect, even after grilling every past and present contestant. Eris was convinced it was an elder resident's act of jealousy, while I was keeping an eye on a victim's 14-year-old sister, who seemed a little too upset about her big sister's death. And by upset, I mean her fake crying was hard to take seriously. Noah's swell idea to check out the abandoned sawmill for clues backfired in our faces, and when the four of us walked directly into a cloud of sweet-smelling gas, that's laughing gas, Noah hissed out, slamming his jacket sleeve over his mouth and nose. Oh my god, it's a trap! Eris stumbled back, coughing. Move back slowly. His flashlight beam illuminated the dark. Look for tripwires. Noah, you moron. Wait, what did I do? Noah twisted around, flashlight in hand. You sent us to our deaths, Eris deadpan. Oh, and you did last week? Noah snapped back one hand over his mouth. His voice was still in the puberty squeak stage, so every time he yelled, he sounded like Mickey Mouse. Didn't you almost get us eaten by cannibals? Yes, but that doesn't count. It was an out-of-town case. Eris shot the boy a somewhat bemused smile. Also, they weren't cannibals. You saw blood on a spoon and just assumed they were cannibals. You can't justify almost getting us killed by cannibals, Eris. May chuckled from her place on the floor. She was following a set of footprints with her phone light. That was your fault. She's right. I sent him a smirk. Own up to it. The boy's lip curled. Traitor. He mouthed at me. His grin illuminated in my flashlight. When a second hiss of gas sounded, the playful atmosphere dissipated. Noah twisted to me. Keep an eye on the door, Marin. He ordered. Whatever they're playing with right now isn't strong enough to cause an effect, as long as that door stays open. Got it? We need to get out of here, but slowly. Eris backed away, his frantic eyes searching for the source of the gas. Yeah, but where is it? He stumbled and Noah's expression softened a little. Before any of us could react, the doors were slamming behind us, sealing us in, and fresh air out. Something spiked me. I felt it. A sudden stab in my arm, but when I reached to press the wound, my arms went limp. In the corner of my eye, I caught Noah twisting around. Eyes wide, lips moving, mouthing, ow. A loud hiss sounded, and this time, we were trapped. Immediately, I pressed my hands over my mouth, but I was already on my knees. Strong stuff. I think that's what I said. But from the look on Eris's face, I don't think I was speaking English. The boy staggered back, using his flashlight to find an escape. Nitrous oxide. He dropped his flashlight. Is a sweet-smelling sedative used as general anesthetic. When administered in large doses, such as being blasted in someone's face in an enclosed space, it can, uh, can do something. Eris's voice slurred. May was throwing herself into the door, trying to force it open. 
and Noah was frantically searching for an exit. But Eris didn't mention, on account of him passing out next to me, along with Noah and then May, was that nitrous oxide made me feel like I was on Saturn. It didn't even feel like sleeping. I was staring blankly at the ceiling, lying on my back, drowning at cracks in the wood, and then there were dancing shadows around me, phantom figures that picked me up. Then I was hovering ten feet in the air, uncomfortably tied to the others, whose wiggling bodies against mine were dangerously close to sending us plunging to our deaths. If I wasn't still high on wacky gas, I would have screamed. We were at a height that could kill us if we were unceremoniously dropped to the ground. Blinking rapidly, it took me several seconds to register my kicking feet beneath me, and my wrists painfully pinned behind my back. Another disorienting moment of trying to keep my eyes open, and risking a peek below me. I realized why the others were squirming, twitching in their restraints. The mill was lit up in ghostly light, and directly below us was a giant vat of acid. I could tell it was acid because the shadow, who I guessed was our perpetrator's little helper, threw a soccer ball into the bubbling liquid, only for it to disappear under foggy suds, disintegrating. I think I lost the ability to speak after imagining what that stuff did to human flesh. Squeezing my eyes shut, I forced myself to stay calm. Oh. Oh, no. We are so screwed. Noah's voice was muffled. It sounded like he had something over his mouth. Come on, it's like the Powerpuff Girls. What if we get superpowers? May's voice was shaking despite her optimism. I wouldn't mind swimming in it. Oh yeah, sugar and spice and scoliosis. Noah mumbled, struggling. No thanks. Also, why was I the only one gagged? Because you never stopped talking. The boy responded with a cry, kicking his legs violently. Stop wiggling. May was using her body weight to swing us across two metal platforms. I'm trying to save us, idiot. You think swinging us is saving us? Noah spat what I guessed was a strip of duct tape from his mouth. If you keep putting pressure on the rope, we're going to fall. And, and it'll be your fault. Do you want to fall into that? She scoffed. What? No, no, I don't want to fall into a vat of toxic waste. Well, stop moving us. We're fine where we are. We just need to get free. I'm going to make soup out of your bones. A disembodied voice giggled through an overhead speaker. Who, who is that? Noah demanded. Show yourself. He struggled violently. Who are you? Let Middleview rot. It responded in a laugh. I could see a camera set up pointing directly at us. I had no doubt it wasn't streaming. You can't save this town or the people in it. And your deaths will prove that. Watch, Middleview, as your precious junior protectors meet their demise. I'm so damn scared. Harry's unusual whisper snapped me into fruition. Me too, I said, risking another look down. My heart catapulted into my throat. Even if we got free, falling from that height would kill us instantly. The nodding around my wrists meant our kidnapper knew how to expertly tie ropes. They're probably bluffing. No, Eris whispered. I mean, can't you see them? His voice was different, almost an entirely different boy. For a moment I forgot about the bubbling pool of death beneath us, and bled back to reality where a thought grazed the back of my mind. Reality felt different being so high up and yet also free from what I wasn't allowed to look at. I was never allowed to look at what was behind me and in front of me, above me and below me. I opened my mouth, really opened it, pushing out my own words that were for once actually mine. Mine. Not the endless seam of words tumbling from my tongue every day. What? In front of us I could already see crisscrosses, invisible lines in the sky that I could see if I allowed myself to look, contorting red lines in every direction. The eyes, Eris whispered. His voice felt too real, his tone splintering the delusion wrapped around me. We weren't hanging ten feet from the ground. In fact, we were safely tucked into safety harnesses. The pool of bubbling, toxic waste was an overflowing tub of cold water and suds. I wasn't allowed to look, but when I did, I felt it. I could feel the agonizing tightness in my arms and legs and head, something holding me together, pulling me together and apart. There are so many of them, 
Harris said. So many eyes and so many faces and lights and cameras following us. But I'm not allowed to look at them. When I look at them, they make me hurt. He let out a sob. I want my mom, Marin. She's coming, don't worry, I said when the rope holding us jolted and we began our slow descent. Oh, hell, no, 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 no! Noah yelped, struggling violently. No, Harris's tone hardened. My real mom. His words severed something inside of me. Can't you see them? His clammy fingers around mine, clawing for an anchor. The lines, Marin. Harris surprised me with a spluttered giggle. The lines holding us together. Noah was yelling, May trying to reason with our kidnapper, the two of them completely blind, oblivious of the lines cruelly slicing and cutting into our reality. Endless crisscrosses that I could see, tipping my head back. I was barely aware of my dangling legs submerged in cold water, when something velvet, something dark, fell in front of us. I idly watched the ripples in the material, moving my mouth which wasn't mine. Whatever was attached to it didn't allow me to scream, didn't allow me to cry. Cut! A male voice shouted, and I realized what was in front of us. Curtain. Behind it, thundering applause, and my body was tugged violently. I could feel the others still bound to me, but they weren't moving, their heads hanging. I held on to the warmth in their hands, still entangled with mine. Great work, everyone! The voices grew louder, and I couldn't move couldn't breathe. My body was stuck, my spine straight, my breaths shuddered. Figures bled through the curtains while one strayed behind. One strayed in front of me, pricking my chin with a perfect manicure and lifting my head up. Mom. In the dimming lights, my half-lidded eyes found my mother's. I opened my mouth to cry out, but I could feel them. Finally, jaggered lines severing through me and tangled around my fingers. My arms, my legs, strings. I was dancing, hanging, suspended on strings. And it was agony. A tight, pulling agony that incited a raw screech in my throat. Mom, I managed to croak. It hurts. I sensed her fingers cradling my face. I know it does, Marin. Just hold still for me. The sound of cutting filled me with fear. But then my body was relaxing growing limp, and finally, with one final snip, I was tumbling onto my knees. Fully aware of the strings now, I could see them still hanging from me, severed pieces of bloody thread and pooling red seeping down my skin. But I was free. Mom pulled me into her arms, and my head was hanging at an awkward angle, clumsy with no strings. Wait, Harris croaked. You're leaving us? His voice, sharp pants of breath, felt like a whirlwind slamming into me, when I tried to spring out of Mom's arms, but she was already pulling me away. When I twisted my head, Eris was still awake, still suspended on cruel strings cutting through him, severing him apart, but still human, still warm, still breathing. His glassy eyes found mine, jerking lips, twisting in agony. Instead of speaking, his mouth stretched into a horrifying grin. His strings were being pulled, vicious cutting lines slicing all the way through him, making him dance. Please, Mom whispered, her arms protective around me. Let me take Peter. Just two of them, Peter and Marin. I'll take them far away. I won't speak a word about any of this, I promise. One, a man's voice grumbled. We agreed on one. Take her to the last viewing point. But he's... He, he, he's, he's still conscious. Viewing point, the man repeated. Now. No, I fought against my mom's grasp. Through half-lidded eyes, I watched Eris's head drop, bouncing on strings. Noah and May were immobile, but he was still conscious, still aware, still in agony. My mouth was full of wriggling insects, suffocating my breath. You can't leave them. Marin, you have to be quiet. Mom hissed into my hair. She'll hear you. No! The last pieces of this memory were foggy, disjointed and wrong. Splintered parts of other memories seeping through the black hole in my head. I remember being dragged away, kicking and screaming. There were bright lights in my eyes, a gentle hymn in my ear. It's hard to differentiate memories, especially the ones that have been long suppressed, the ones that I wasn't allowed to see. I was sitting on a table made of stone, a single light shining down on me. I was entangled in something. Rope? 
No, it hurt too much to be rope. I could sense it, feel it, wrapping around my being. My own string, string that had already been cut from me, was back, binding me to three other bodies. They were so cold, while I was warm, soaked in wet warmth that dripped down my face. Their backs pressed to mine felt wrong, like cold lumps of flesh. It was pitch dark apart from that single spotlight. I lazily followed the beam, glimpsing trails of scarlet splashed across the table, turning black in the shadow. There was a blade above us, already tinted with new blood. Red, that shined like rubies. Red, that was supposed to be beautiful, and yet stained on those horrific cutting teeth were them. I already knew what I was for, and what it had done. Why I was wet, why I would never be clean again. But I was still breathing, still human, while they were still. Are you leaving us? Ares' phantom voice echoed in my ears when I was retching from my own strings. I jumped off of the table and pulled away his restraints, ripping apart his strings, except Eris wasn't human anymore. His head hung down, eyes carved out and replaced with more animated ones, glass ones that would last forever. When my trembling hands found his torso, all of him had been hollowed out. His mouth dropped open. I tried Noah, and then May. When I pulled away their ropes, they fell limp. Their heads tipped back, I shook them, and they didn't move. But they did move, but only when I touched them. Something was dripping. Stumbling back, I stepped into something wet, something that squelched between my toes. My gaze found the floor in the river of red of gore, seeping across pristine marble. No wonder they took that memory away from me. Why I was found, screaming inconsolable. I could still see it. I can see the slithering red reality of my friends would have been scooped out of them to maintain their roles. In a town where I was born, lived a man who sailed the sea, and he told us of his life in the land of submarines. Back in the present, inside the white room, slowly coming down from the cocktail of drugs forced inside me, Someone was singing directly in my face. Sorry. Eris came, laughed, and my body jolted. When I opened my eyes, he was standing over me, surrounded in a halo of white light, still in the same clothes as the diner, though no sign of strings. His freckles looked like they were moving. Eris blew in my face, and his breath felt real, cold against my cheeks. This version of him looked older, thick, sandy hair hanging in dark eyes. Uh, I don't know the rest of the lyrics, but hey, you're awake now. Sitting up, I blinked in the weird heavenly halo. It was the drugs playing with my head, but this was the kind of trip I wasn't going to complain about. I could feel a weight next to me. May, her pigtails were in my face, already making me want to sneeze. The girl's back was turned. She was talking to someone. Her voice a hissed whisper. Noah. His shadow was in the door. Reddish brown hair slicked back. He wasn't smiling, lips set into a thin line. Behind him I could make out flashing. The door was open ajar, the hallway awash with red light. She's awake. Eris's murmur turned my attention back to him. He was awkwardly kneeling on my bed. May twisted around to me, her eyes softening. Before I could speak, she shook her head. We've got maybe two minutes, Noah said, hastily glancing over his shoulder. May nodded. She reached out to grab my hand. I noticed a pair of scissors tucked into her jeans. Do you remember our sixth mystery? I nodded dizzily. Uh, we had to stay quiet to avoid being caught by old lady Carlisle in the missing piano case. May's lips pricked into a smile. Exactly, she said. You need to stay quiet, okay? Just like back then. Eris pressed a finger to his lips. Don't say a word. Mouth shut, weirdo. Noah said, leaning against the door. There was a pair of scissors tucked into his belt. I pretended to zip my lips, still half-conscious, hallucinating the middle view four just like how I remembered them, filled me with copious amounts of joy. Mouth shut, I promised. Okay, May's expression hardened. Marin, you need to be brave for me. She reached out and cradled my cheeks, just like my mother. At that moment, May Lee was real. Her wide eyes, lips pressed into a thin line, 
pigtails loose in her hair, and all of it was real. You need to remember our last case. I could sense her desperation. May twisted to the door, only to get a thumbs up from Noah. She turned back to me, her expression contorting. What did we see when we entered the string factory that night? One minute. Noah's focus was on the outside. May, hurry the hell up. I'm going as fast as I can, she gritted out. Her grip on my shoulders tightened. I, I can't remember, I told her in a breath. Why? Eris, Noah grumbled from the door. Little help. The guy nodded, joining Noah in the doorway, the two of them speaking in low murmurs. Think, May urged me, her eyes wild, searching mine, like she could delve directly inside my head. She squeezed tighter, tight enough for me to feel her biting nails. Go back to that moment. The girl caught herself, exhaling a breath. Please, you need to remember. What did we see? Following May's words, I mentally went back to our last case. Noah and Eris helped throw open the door. It was cold. I could see my breath in front of me. I remembered our four flashlight beams hitting darkness. Before... nothing. Oblivion. And then I was sitting on the sidewalk, covered in string, screaming, just like how I remembered it. When I opened my eyes to tell May that, she was gone. The door to my room was closed, and the three of them had finally faded. My mind finding its footing. Time passed quickly. Mom visited, wearing her usual smile. She told me everything was going to be okay. I didn't listen to her. Instead, hyper-focused on the noticeable crease on my bed where May had been sitting. Marin? I blinked, turning my attention to my mother. Yes? Mom cleared her throat. I said, this is Dr. Delaney. He's going to help you. I didn't even notice a second presence in the room. It was a guy, a trainee by the look of him, dressed in blue scrubs, his face hidden behind a mask. Time seemed to quicken as soon as the guy was in front of me. I remember feeling the warmth of his fingers on my temples, and the sudden buzzing sensation that I knew them. His touch was gentle but firm, lulling me into half slumber. I was still frowning at the crease in my bedsheets when Mom's voice slammed into me, and my head tipped back. Erase her completely. Mom's voice was stern. I could hear her pacing back and forth, the click-clack of her heels jolting my body awake. We've already had to deal with deaths among stage crew, and she already cut one of them down. We just need things to go back to the way they were. Marin has nothing to do with this, and as for the middle view four, just like her last attempt to memory wipe me, this one didn't work either. I came to fruition back home, orange juice and ice cream carefully laid out in front of me. It was morning. Two days had passed and that same sunlight pierced through the blinds, scratching at my eyes. Mom was sitting across the table, her lips kissing the rim of her glass. How are you this morning, sweetheart? Hey! Noah threw a lucky charm at me across the table. He straightened in his seat. I liked his presence. They made sure to sit as far away from mom as possible, making faces when she inched near him. I think the overall consensus is that you can't trust this woman. She could be our puppeteer. Also, she's drugged you, like 10,000 times. I don't she's bad, Eris sat next to him, idly playing with his own bowl of cereal. Why would she save Marin? Noah shrugged, flicking a lucky charm in the boy's face. I don't know, man. Does your mom drug you to keep you quiet? Eris rolled his eyes. What makes you think her mom is the mastermind? That? Noah pointed to my mother. Mom was talking on the phone. I didn't understand what he was talking about, until I saw a single string above her. I felt my stomach revolt at the sight, a single string somehow wrapped around my mother's mind. Yes? Mom spoke softly. Everything is sorted. Is the situation okay now? I've been informed that we are no longer in code black. She's talking about us. Meg grumbled next to me. How do you know that? Eris raised a brow. Duh. One of us was cut down. They're making sure Marin isn't compromised. Eris inclined his head. Hmm? But what are they talking about? Who knows? May sighed. Whoever is our puppeteer is powerful enough to control the stage crew too. Her lips curled into a grimace. Unlike us though, they're still alive. We need to figure out who did this, Noah announced, his eyes lighting up. It's been eight years and we still haven't solved the string murders. Eris blew a raspberry, leaning his fist on his chin. On account of us being dead, he turned to me. Still though, I talk about us when we're dead. 
Even if she cut one of us down, they can just string us back up, right? Because we're important, May said. But to who? Noah slapped the table. That is what we gotta figure out, he grinned. I've missed this. Middleview 4, back at it. I found myself smiling. I've missed this too. Solving the mystery of ourselves, May hummed. Marin. Mom was frowning at me, her phone still in her hand. She inclined her head. What have you missed? Nothing, I said. Have fun at work. Four hours since she left, and I'm pretty sure I'm hallucinating my dead friends. I just need to do one more thing and cut them all down. This is going to kill me. I could be putting myself back on strings, but I'm not leaving them there. I'm terrified of what my mother and her work will do, but I'm not leaving them again. No way. One last mystery to solve. They called us the Middleview Four. Initially, it was just me and the mayor's son, Noah Presley. We were the first two members, and in the second grade, the two of us hated each other. He pulled my hair during nap time, and I scribbled on his drawings when he wasn't looking. When a dastardly crime hit our class, a milk thief, we reluctantly threw aside our differences and came together to catch the evildoer. Spoiler alert, it was Jessica S. After a nap time stakeout, when we were supposed to be asleep, Noah and I caught her red-handed, literally. Jessica's palms were still stained crimson from arts and crafts. Her plan was foolproof. Wait until we were all sleeping, and then drink all of our milk. Noah and I were hailed heroes. Well, no, we actually got in trouble for not sleeping. But our teacher did quietly thank us for catching Jessica before her evil crimes could continue. After the milk incident, Noah Presley didn't seem that bad anymore. I didn't have any friends. Instead of playing with the other kids, I spent the entirety of recess examining the dirt on the playground for unusual footprints. Jessica S. had been sternly reprimanded for stealing milk, but I had a feeling there were still criminals out there, and I would be the one to find and catch them. Mr. Stevens, the janitor, looked suspicious before lunch. I saw him crouched behind a dumpster with his head down. I thought he was pooping, until I saw the small bag in his hands. Hiding behind a wall, I watched him open it up and stare at it for a while, before another teacher yelled his name. I ran away before he could catch me, but I was sure the janitor had run across the playground. Studying the dirt in front of me, I was sure the footprint belonged to Mr. Stevens. I had already checked his shoes. Mr. Miller, our teacher, asked me to collect everyone's workbooks from the faculty room. I couldn't resist. After an incident involving a faculty member trailing an animal poop from outside, all students and teachers had to take off their outdoor shoes and wear indoor ones. The janitor's outdoor shoes were neatly placed under his desk. Before I could hesitate, I checked the bottom of them, memorizing their pattern, swirls and seas. Stabbing at the footprints in the dirt, I idly traced the exact same swirly pattern. What are you doing, weirdo? Noah Presley knelt next to me, his curious eyes following my fingers that were digging into the dirt. I wanted to trace the footprints with my fingers. Mom told me to keep my dress clean, but it was already filthy, my cheeks smeared with dirt. I didn't look up from my clue. Noah was a good sidekick, admittedly, but he did eat all the snacks during our stakeout and he got distracted easily. We were almost caught when he freaked out over a moth. Investigating crime. I said, grabbing a stick and tracing the shoe pattern for the hundredth time. The footprint was too blurry. I could barely see any swirls. Noah sighed, snatching the stick off of me. You're doing it wrong, he grumbled. Before I could speak, the boy jumped up, prodding the dirt with the stick. You need to look at the patterns on the shoe, and then see if they match. Whose shoe? I said, coughing over my panicked tone. He was on to me. That's what I've been doing! The boy's lips curled into a smile. He was the mayor's son, so I was careful around him. Even when we worked together to catch the milk thief, I kept my distance. He folded his arms, giggling. The janitor's shoe. I saw you spying on him while he was eating white powder. I stepped back. I wasn't spying. Noah followed me, mocking my backing away. Another step and he was standing on my shoes. You were too. I saw you hiding behind the wall before recess. You were spying on the janitor. 
Ugh, I stuck out my tongue. Boy cooties. Leaning away from him, I pulled a face. No, I didn't, and you can't prove it. Yeah, I can, he sang. I can also prove that you were playing with the janitor's shoes during class time. I dropped the stick, stepping on it. You wouldn't. He danced back, laughing. I would. Noah patted his jeans pockets where a phone was nestled inside. He was the only kid allowed a phone in class due to him getting special treatment for being the mayor's son. The boy had two incriminating videos that would get me in trouble. Maybe in even more trouble than the milk thief. The first one was a clear shot of me playing with the janitor's shoes in the teacher's lounge, and the second exposed me in perfect detail on my tiptoes trying to peer behind the wall. Immediately I tried to grab the phone off of him, but Noah Presley had an ulterior motive. I want to help you, he said, pocketing his phone. When I could only frown at him in confusion, he lowered himself into the dirt. Old man Critter is hiding something, he murmured, tracing the dirt with his fingers. Noah lifted his head, peering at me through dark curls hanging in his eyes. His smile was mischievous, definitely not the type I was used to. The mayor's son was more interesting than I thought. So, let's find out what it is. Old man Critter? I questioned. Noah shrugged. He looks like a cockroach. The mystery white powder was cocaine, obviously. However, to two seven-year-olds, this so-called white powder was a mind-controlling substance, or maybe even something that could end the world. After all, per Noah's detective skills, he saw the woman in public, and she was acting a little strange. Noah and I uncovered our janitor's evil plan after stalking him for weeks, writing our findings in crayon and staking out his house when we were supposed to be playing in the park. I became a regular visitor to the Presley household, and Noah's father wasn't as bad as I thought. He gave me cookies when I stayed over. Look, we were seven years old, so our findings weren't exactly concrete. But we still managed to uncover the clues leading to catching the janitor. There was a strange woman who met up with him outside the school gates at lunchtime. After some digging, we concluded she was buying the white powder from him. We managed to get a picture. Noah told the principal, presenting the evidence, and the janitor was fired for the possession of foreign substances. Noah and I were also reprimanded, again, for sticking our noses into business which wasn't ours. The adults tried to tell us the white powder was not bad, and was in fact candy. My parents were called, and Noah's father did not look happy to be there, sending Noah scary death glares from across the principal's desk. My mother stood up and apologized for my behavior, blaming my imagination on the cartoons I was watching. In front of my mom, I brought up the argument that a teacher wouldn't be selling candy to a woman. I received the look in return, but I didn't back down. She shook her head stubbornly, refusing to believe we were onto something, gently grabbing my hand and pulling me into my seat. I was threatened with a zero dessert for a week and no cartoons, which did shut me up eventually. There was no way I was missing Saturday morning adventure time. The adults seemed to have won this silent battle, and the principal began a speech which was basically, Children tend to have vivid imaginations, but will grow out of it. That was until a bored-looking Noah jumped out of his chair and grabbed the seized baggie of white powder, ripping it open, his mouth curling into a grin. Well, if it's candy, I can eat it, right? Following a loud cacophony of no from the adults who really thought a seven-year-old was about to down a half a pound of cocaine, and my mother almost fainting, our disgruntled parents finally agreed to take our claim seriously. The principal searched the janitor's locker, and sure enough, he pulled out multiple bags of white powder. Old man Critter had an audience of kids and faculty when he was being led away. Noah and I stood at the front. I remember him twisting around, teeth clenched in a manic snarl, saliva dripping down his chin. I'll get you, you little brats. I'll find you. That was the day we found our third member. I opened my mouth to shout back at him, but my mother was quick to shut me out. May Lee, who was standing between me and Noah, nudged me, and then elbowed him hard enough to get a hiss out of the boy. May was half Korean, a tiny girl with orange pigtails, who knocked Johnny Summers out during reading time for poking her in the face. May scared me. She scared Noah too, judging from the fearful look he shot me. 
I had a vague memory of her pigtails hitting me in the face during recess and were somehow sharp enough to bruise my eye. May's gaze trailed our school janitor being violently dragged outside. Do you two even know how to catch bad guys? Yes, Noah mumbled under his breath. Obviously. He let out another hiss when she hit him again. Ow! Noah shoved her back. Your elbows are pointy. Well, you're not very good, May teased. I can help you catch bad guys. He snorted. Oh yeah? And what makes you think you can help us? May proved herself a few weeks later when we were on our second official case. Who stole Mrs. Johnson's award-winning carrots? I turned eight years old on the day May officially became part of our gang. We were supposed to be celebrating my birthday in the park, but of course, we had work to do. Mrs. Johnson's award-winning carrots were still missing, and we were determined to find them. After tracking down the missing vegetables to a seedy house at the end of my block, Noah had stupidly decided to check out the inside for himself, leaving me alone with zero help. This was the first time I felt genuine fear striking through me, the first time I wanted to run and crawl under my bed. The carrot thief was, in fact, the crazy old woman who screamed at cheese in the store, the one mom told me to stay away from, using my dad's ancient binoculars and my mediocre lip-reading skills, I watched the crazy lady hold Noah hostage in her kitchen, armed with an old World War II grenade she swore she would detonate. It's not like I could follow him. I was in danger of getting caught too. Hiding behind the wall in front of her house, I had a perfect view of her kitchen window, and my friend awkwardly sitting at her table eating cookies. Had he switched sides? My attention flicked to the chocolate cookie in my friend's hand. My hands were growing clammy around the binoculars. Could those cookies be forcing Noah to join the side of evil? When Noah pointed toward the window, right at me, I ducked, slamming my hand over my mouth, stifling a cry. I was so close to proving my mom right that I was putting myself in danger with this investigative hobby and calling for help when no other than May Lee stepped out of the crazy old woman's house hand in hand with an embarrassed looking Noah. Immediately, I hugged him. Then, I hit him. Why did you sell me out, stupid head? I yelled. What did she do to you? The boy blinked at me through thick brown hair. She gave me a cookie. What? But it could be controlling you. Noah pushed me away when I tried to check his ears for mind control devices. Stop hitting me. I was telling her I had a friend waiting for me outside. He grumbled. The boy refused to look at his rescuer, hiding under his hood. She wanted the carrots to feed her bunny. A proud-looking May held up the stolen carrots with a grin. I snuck in the back window. She shoved Noah with a giggle. Sorry, what did you say about not needing me, Mr. Know-it-all? Noah groaned, his gaze glued to the ground. Noah Presley was stubborn. She was like a thousand years old and feeding her bunny when you had attacked her. She didn't even tie me up and besides, he stuck out his tongue. I didn't even need rescuing. She made me cookies and I got to hold Sir Shrooms. Sir Shrooms? Noah giggled. Her bunny. May folded her arms. Say thank you, dumb butt. I already said thank you. Noah's cheeks were burning bright. You need to clean your ears. No, you didn't. I would have heard you. Thank you. Noah muttered under his breath. The girl snickered. What did you say, Noah? I said thank you. The boy ducked his head and I couldn't resist a giggle. He still refused to acknowledge being rescued by a girl. You're still stupid. Despite Noah making it clear he did not want another member joining our secret gang, we welcomed May into our group with our ritual, which was a chocolate cupcake and pushing her into the town lake. I did the same to Noah and the tradition kind of stuck. May wasn't just valuable to us for her fighting skills. She could talk her way out of a situation too. Noah and I got stuck in the principal's private bathroom investigating a small case of a stolen phone from a classmate. Our prime suspect was the principal himself who had been the last person with it. I was convinced he'd stuff the phone in his bathroom trash after accidentally breaking it. We found numbers for phone repairs on his laptop. Noah and I were searching the trash when he came back from lunch early. If May wasn't there to interrogate him on his favorite video games, we would have been caught. 
And that year, we were rewarded a special Junior Police Award at the Christmas Parade for solving the mystery behind the disappearing holiday decorations. A teenage girl who wanted to ruin Christmas for everyone. I still remember Mom's scowl in the crowd. She really did not like my obsession with finding and bringing Middleview criminals to justice. Starting fourth grade, we became a trio of wannabe detectives, and even earned a name for ourselves, the Middleview Three. Mom tried to keep me inside, but at the age of ten, we were getting tip-offs from the sheriff's daughter. We found missing cats, tracked down stolen vegetables, and even found a baby. When our names started to appear in the local gazette, Mom grounded me for two weeks, and Noah's father threatened to send him to private school. May's mother was strangely supportive, often providing snacks for stakeouts, and when Noah cut his knee chasing a runaway dog, stitching him back up, and not telling our parents. We were on our fifth or sixth case when a new kid joined our class halfway through the year. I wasn't concentrating, already planning out our stakeout in my notebook. It was our first serious case. All of the third grade had gotten food poisoning the previous day, and I was already suspicious of the new lunch lady. I swore she spat in my lunch, and May came down with the stomach flu after eating slimy-looking hamburger helper. The new kid didn't get my attention, until he ignored our teacher's prompt to tell us three interesting facts about himself, and proudly introduced himself as the fourth member of the Middleview Four. Noah, who was sitting behind me, kicked my seat, and May threw her workbook at me. They had a habit of resorting to violence when I was daydreaming. Lifting my head, I blinked at a private school kid standing in front of the class with far too much confidence, a grin stretched across his mouth. Rich, judging by his actual school uniform and the tinge of a British accent, the kid had dark blonde hair and freckles. My name is Harris Kane, he announced loudly, and I want to join the Middleview Four. Middleview Three, Noah corrected with a scoff. When fifteen pairs of eyes turned to us, I turned in my chair to shoot him a warning look. His death glare was typical. We don't need anyone else, he said through a pencil lodged between his teeth. The mayor's son had grown fiercely protective of our little gang. I could already sense his irritation that some random kid was trying to join us. Our confused teacher ushered the new kid to a seat, but he kept talking. I was the smartest student in my old school. Eris folded his arms. I want to help you with your current case. The boy cocked his head when I feigned a confused expression. The food poisoning case? He nodded at my notebook. I'm not stupid. I know you're already working on it. Eris strolled over to Noah's desk and pulled out the boy's notes from under his workbooks. Noah had been studying the footage we salvaged from the faculty lounge. You're looking at the wrong piece of footage, he announced. If you let me join, I'll lead you to the culprit. He stabbed at Noah's notes. Not bad, but you're missing something. Noah leaned back on his chair. Like what, new kid? Eris knew he had an audience of intrigued eyes. I think that thrilled him. You've been searching in the place most likely to have clues, he murmured. Which is the scene of the crime? Eris was right. We were going crazy trying to find anything incriminating in the cafeteria. But all we had found was old custard and a scary amount of recycled pasta. Eris prodded at Noah's notes again. Why not look in the place least likely to hold a clue? You might be surprised. Something in Noah's expression lit up, his eyes widening. The teacher's lounge, he said, just as the thought crossed my mind. May audibly gasping. Mr. Kane? Mrs. Jacobs was red-faced. She had already seized several of our phones and some earphones Noah had been using to listen to a potential culprit on a missing cat case. Please take your seat and stop talking about things that do not concern children. She put way too much emphasis on the latter word. I felt like telling her we were ten years old, not six, but that counted as talking back and my mom would be informed, so I kept my mouth shut. Noah, however suffered from the doesn't think before he speaks disease. Well, maybe if the cops actually did their jobs, he spoke up, a group of children wouldn't have to help them. Mr. Presley? You know I'm right, Mrs. Jacobs, he said, with that innocent and yet mocking tone. We put our old janitor in jail when we were in the second grade. 
He laughed, and the rest of the class joined in. It's not our fault the sheriff is totally incompetent at his job. The laughs grew louder, but this time the class were laughing at him, not with him. Mrs. Jacobs pursed her lips, her hands going to her hips. I believe the word you are trying to say is incompetent, which makes sense because you're failing at basic English. Perhaps if you focus on actual schoolwork and not your juvenile Scooby-Doo fantasies, you might be able to speak basic words. The teacher's eyes were far too bright to be mocking a ten-year-old. Twisting around in my chair, Noah's gaze was burning into his desk. The teacher's attention turned to Eris, who was frowning at Noah, not with sympathy or pity. No, he was disappointed that a member of the famous Middleview Three, who were known to go against adults, had backed down to a teacher with no snarky remark. Eris Kane, Mrs. Jacobs raised her voice. Sit down. Eris slumped into his seat and pretended to zip his lips before leaning over my desk and dropping a memory drive into my pencil case. Here is the real footage, he murmured, shooting Noah a grin. Thank me later. We're not going to thank you because we don't know you, Noah spat back. However, the footage the new kid provided was just what we needed. The puzzle piece that put everything together. We were right, the new lunch lady had rushed into the office before lunchtime, grabbed a vial of something from her bag and disappeared back through the door. We had been too busy studying the camera footage from the kitchen to realize our clue was in fact inside the teacher's lounge. When the four of us stepped inside our principal's office, he regarded us with a scowl. I wasn't a stranger to his office. I had even picked my own seat, the fluffy beanbag near the door. The Middleview Three were in his office every week usually for breaking into classrooms and the time Noah tried to jump into the vent because he saw it on TV. Principal Maine was drinking something that definitely wasn't coffee or water. His desk was an avalanche of paper, and I swore I could already see steam coming out of his ears. You three. The man leaned forward, raising his brow at Eris, who looked way too comfortable at a school he had just joined. And you've dragged the new kid into your antics? I can't say I'm surprised when I've been on the phone with four separate reporters who want details on this Middleview 3 garbage. Noah's eyes lit up. Wait, really? Wait, what did you tell them? Principal Maine's eyebrows twitched. I told them the truth. He leaned back in his chair. This guy had some serious stress lines. You are three stubborn children with zero respect for authority. We have broken multiple rules and are very close to acquiring criminal records before reaching the age of 11. Which, I, uh, might I say, is a first. The youngest person in this town to get a criminal record was Ellie Daly, back in the 80s. She was 13 years old. We haven't broken any rules, May said. We've been catching bad people. The man's lip curled. We have a full force of officers whose jobs are to find bad people, he said. Middleview does not need the protection of three children who are barely old enough to know right from wrong. His eyes found Noah. He was always the punching bag for our teachers, and I never understood why. Like there was this ongoing joke between the adults to point fun at him. Or left from right, for that matter. Mr. Presley has demonstrated that several times, which is why you are in school, why you three should be learning, instead of playing Sherlock Holmes. He shook his head. Get on with it. Why are you here this time? I hated our principal's condescending tone. He was angry, but I didn't think he'd be this angry. Go on, he urged us. What did you solve this time? Principal Maine inclined his head. Let me guess, he said. You found the Zodiac Killer. Well, that's quite the achievement. Noah opened his mouth to speak, and the man's expression darkened. Choose your next words very carefully, Mr. Presley. Your father may be able to cover up your detective games, but I will happily lose my job over suspending you from this school. Noah's eyes widened. But that's not... One more word, Maine said, emphasizing his threat by picking up his phone, like he was about to make important phone calls. 
My mom did that too when I refused to shower or didn't eat my broccoli. Do not test me. The new kid surprised us by stepping forward, the flash drive clutched in his fist. It wasn't them, Principal Maine. It was me. He placed the evidence on the desk. Eris was a good actor. He was playing the innocent kid pretty well. I almost believed him, until he winked at us. I went to the middle view, I mean to these three, because I didn't want to come and see you alone, because I'm scared she'll poison me too. Eris dramatized a sob, and in the corner of my eye, Noah's eyes rolled to the back of his head. May, however, was entranced, her eyes wide. The performance was award-worthy. The shaking hands, the slight stutter in his words that was subtle enough to be noticeable, but not enough to be faking it. Eris Kane was already our fourth member, and all of us knew it. Principal Main took the flash drive, a frown creasing his expression. He inserted it into his laptop, and just from studying his expression as he watched the footage, widening eyes and slightly parted lips that were definitely stifling bad words, I knew he had them. Eris made sure to give commentary, which wasn't necessary, but I did enjoy the look in our principal's shell-shocked face. That's the new lunch lady, Eris pointed out. He started to lean over to prod the screen, but seeing the visible veins pulsing in our principal's forehead, the three of us dragged him back. Eris stumbled and we tightened our grip. I was already smiling, and even Noah was trying to hide a grin. This kid was definitely a member of the Middleview Three. I haven't met her, but as you can see, she is putting something into the third grader's food. Poison, May nodded. Or, uh, according to the police report, Maine went deathly pale. Salmonella. Noah finished with a smirk. The man didn't react, but he did shut his laptop and excuse himself, immediately calling the cops. I was grounded again after the food poisoning case. Worse still, I got sick for two weeks and was bedridden, so I missed out on two cases involving stolen birthday decorations. Noah was insistent that the new kid was not joining us. I received a multitude of texts cramming up my mom's notifications. She ended up muting him. He's not joining. I don't crew how smart he is. I don't like him, and I'm technically the first member. May is being stupid. We can talk when you're better and get well soon, okay? Two weeks later, I stepped into class, and Noah had taken the seat next to Eris, the two of them enveloped in the mountain of Pokemon cards on Eris's desk. May was trying to play, but apparently she needed Pokemon cards to join. When I questioned them, Noah looked up with a grin. Eris is cool now. His announcement stapled our fourth member. Entering teenagehood made me realize Middleview was not a good town, and its people had masks, even the ones I thought I knew. At 12 years old, we hunted down a child killer, a sadistic man who turned his victims into angels. It didn't take us long to realize the people we put away as little kids wanted revenge, and in their heads we were old enough to receive proper punishment. Mom told me we would regret our so-called fame as the town's junior detectives, and I thought she was wrong. I had spent my childhood chasing bad guys, so I was sure I could catch the real bad ones too. I was 14 when we ran into our first real criminal who specifically wanted us. Danny Budge was the reason why Noah started going to therapy at 14 and why Eris refused to go near the edge of town. May had taken time off to go see her family abroad and I was put under house arrest. Seven-year-old Maisie Eaton had disappeared from her yard and after searching for her for two nights alongside the police who had learned to tolerate us working with them, we found her tied up inside an old barn. Sitting cross-legged on a pile of hay was Maisie. Awake, I could see her eyes were wide, but she wasn't moving or struggling. It didn't make sense to me. Wait, I nudged May. She's not moving. Eris rushed forward to untie the little girl, only to trip on a wire which was connected to a Final Destination-style contraption. Eris lifted his head, pointing above him. One more step and he would have sent a sharpened spear directly through the little girl's head. Ow! Eris hissed, already freaking out. He was frozen. What do I do? Stay calm, Noah said from my side, the rest of us hiding behind an old car. 
The mayor's son had become our unofficial leader. Ever since hitting puberty, he was now our brawn alongside May. Noah jumped forward, watching for tripwires. I'll save the kid. May, you help Eris. Before I could get a word in, he was dragging me to my feet. Marin, you're with me. I nodded, stumbling in the dark, keeping my flashlight beam on the ground. You know what this means, don't you? Noah said in heavy breaths, his fingers wrapped around my arm. Maisie was innocent. There was no motive. She was just a distraction. Noah let out a hiss. Or even a lure. I did, but I didn't want to say it out loud because then my mom would be right, and I was admitting that there were multiple people trying to kill us. Luckily, we saved Maisie. Her kidnapper, Danny Budge, turned himself in with no word or explanation. Later, we would find out he was related to our elementary school janitor. The little girl was taken back to her mother, and the four of us stayed behind, peering up at the murderous contraption specifically made to butcher us. Eris nudged me, and I almost jumped out of my skin. You should probably keep this quiet, he said in a breath, his gaze glued to the long rope expertly tied to the ceiling. From your mother, May added. She squeezed my hand. Your mom will kill us before they do. We're going to die, Noah said in a sing-song, and I'm not even sixteen. He was right. One year later, our most gruesome and horrific case hit us like a wave of ice water, and I admitted we were just poor kids, completely out of our depth. Three townspeople had been found murdered in piles of bloody string. The photos from the scene made me sick, and I was still recovering from our old janitor's measly attempt at punishing us for ruining his life. We were stupidly blindsided by the string murders, and thought we were following a clue. The next thing I knew, I was tied up, back to back with Eris in my old janitor's basement, while he caressed my cheek with a knife. Am I supposed to be here? Eris whispered, struggling in his restraints. Did he just call me Noah? I knocked my head against his. Don't tell him that, idiot. What if he kills you? Funnily enough, Eris was right. Old man Critter had mistaken Eris for Noah. The two of them were sandy blonde and reddish brown. One built like a brick wall while the other more wiry. However, to an old man with debilitating sight, I guess I could see it. Maybe if I squinted. So after an hour or two of empty threats and knife play, Noah and May came to our rescue, tailed by the police and... my mother. I think I would have rather been tied up with old man Critter than face her wrath. I was supposed to be at the library studying. I shot Noah a death glare, and he offered a pitiful, almost puppy-like frown. Sorry, he mouthed. She made us tell her. Mom had gone as far as taping up my windows to make sure I didn't sneak out. I think me being kind of kidnapped, but not really, by old man Critter, really sent her into panic mode. I did tell her that he didn't hurt us at all and just wanted to scare us, but Mom was past angry. She was impossible to talk to. May texted me halfway into a horror movie I was forcing myself to watch that another body had been found. Turning on the local news, she was right. This time it was a kid. May told me to get my ass out of the house. I knew where my mom hid the door keys, so at midnight, when I knew she was sleeping, I snuck out and rode my bike to the rendezvous we had agreed to meet at. May was already there, a flashlight in her mouth, fingers wrapped around her handlebars. The boys? I whispered, joining her. They're already there, she said through a mouthful of flashlight. Let's go. Eris was 99.9% .9 sure we would find a clue inside the old string factory. So that's where we headed. Noah and Eris were already waiting outside, armed with flashlights. The two of them quieter than normal. They didn't greet me or tease my absence from the gang. Okay, so here's what we're going to do, Noah announced. His voice swam in and out of my mind when I tipped my head back, drinking in the foreboding building in front of us. A shiver crept its way down my spine, and suddenly, I felt sick to my stomach, like something had come apart in my mind. I stumbled back, but something pulled me forwards, my mouth filling with phantom bugs skittering on my tongue. I really didn't want to go in there. I could sense my body moving, but I wasn't the one in control. Looking up, there was something there at the corner of my eye. It was above me and around me, everywhere, sliced in between everything. 
I couldn't look. I wasn't allowed to look. Marin? Noah twisted around to me in his face, caught in the dull light of the moon. Hey, are you coming? Blinking rapidly, I nodded, despite seeing it with Noah too. I couldn't look. I wasn't allowed. Dude, are you good? My vision was blurring, and a scream was clawing its way up my throat. I took a step back, my eyes following his every movement. Noah? I didn't realize his name was slipping from my lips. A rooted fear I didn't understand setting my body into fight or flight. Why? I choked back tears. Wow, why do you look like that? I held out my own hands, hot tears filling my eyes. I looked up into the sky at crisscrosses that didn't make sense. Yeah, I'm coming. My mouth moved for me, and I joined the others, pushing open the large wooden door. I didn't remember anything past the old wooden door we pushed through. Going back to that memory over and over again, all I remembered was pushing the door. I was found three hours later, inconsolable screaming at the side of the road, my fingers entangled with string. It was everywhere. Mom said I blocked out a lot, but I strictly remember blood slicked string covering me, damp in my hands and tangled in my hair. There was no sign of the others. Mom put me in the back seat of her car and I slept for a while. My mother drove us far away from Middleview. I asked about my friends, but Mom told me they weren't real. That Middleview was a fantasy I had dreamed up as a child. She told me I was in a traumatizing incident as a child and mixed up reality and fiction. Cartoons in my own life. But they were real. No amount of private therapists spewing the same crap could ease my whole life. I was strictly told that I had a head injury that I imagined the middle view for like my own personal fantasy. I didn't start believing it until I grew into an adult and was prescribed some pretty strong meds. So I began to wonder if they were in fact delusions. Mom's job was a mystery I couldn't solve, even as a 23 year old. So I followed her one night, hopping into my car when she left our driveway. Her job was behind a 10 foot wall surrounded by barriers. Security guards were checking a car in, so I took my chance, and slipped through on foot. What I saw behind the barrier was Middleview, the town I thought I hallucinated. I was immediately blinded by floodlights, illuminating the diner from my childhood. Middleview. I took a shaky step forward, my stomach twisting. It was a TV set. No, more of a stage. Inside, bathed in the pretty colors I remembered from my childhood, were my friends sitting in our usual booth, frozen at 15 years old. The middle view four, minus me, were exactly the same as when I left them. They were even wearing the same clothes. May, her orange pigtails bobbed along with her head. Eris was hunched over like usual, picking at his fries and dipping them in his shake. Except how could I take any of this seriously when they were surrounded by cameras? Noah slammed his hands down on the table with a triumphant grin. We are so close to cracking this case. I noticed his lips weren't moving with his voice. I started toward them slowly, even when the truth dangled above me, below me, everywhere. I stepped over it, blew it out of my face, reaching shaky hands forward to pull them aside. Eris laughed, and something moved above him. We were kidnapped last week. We are not close. You're just painfully optimistic. May nudged him, giggling. Let him have this. He thinks he's our leader. Noah punched the air, and there it was again. Movement. I am our leader. Closer. I found myself inches away from my best friend, and my blood ran so cold, so painful, poison in my veins. Noah stood up, and I could see the reality of him in front of me. The reality of what I wasn't allowed to see. His head wobbled slightly when he smiled, mouth opening and closing in jerking motions. If I looked closer, his lips had been split apart to perfectly replicate a smile. I forced myself to take all of him in, all of Eris and May. The back of Noah had been hollowed out, a startling red cavern where his spine was supposed to be, where flesh and bone was supposed to be. Now I just saw strings. Looking closer, I could finally see them. Strings tangled around his arms, his legs, 
puppeteering his every move as he danced from string to string. I grabbed Noah's hand, and it was ice cold, slimy flesh that was long dead. He didn't move, but his eyes somehow found me. Noah's expression flickered with recognition before his strings were tugged violently, and he screamed, his eyes going wide, lips twisting. Marin? His artificial eyes blinked, and he slowly moved his head. You left us. Noah's lips curled, a deep-throated whine escaping his throat. You left us. He twisted around, his lip wobbling. Why? His frightened eyes flickered from me to his own hands. All those inside jokes our teachers had, I thought dizzily. Was this what it was for? Was Noah Presley nothing but comedic relief? Why am I cold? Noah mumbled. Cut! Someone yelled. I staggered back. Words tangled in my throat. Noah opened his mouth, but he was pulled back, this time violently, his strings above jerking, tangling together. Allison! A man shouted from behind me. Why is your daughter on the stage? Get her out of here! I was paralyzed, still staring at the hollowed-out puppet who had been my best friend. When my mother's arms wrapped around me so tight, I lost the ability to breathe. I was still staring at the strings crisscrossed above me, Noah's strings pulling him back, Eris's strings forcing him to laugh, May's strings bobbing her head in a nodding gesture. Marin? Mom whispered into my back. You cannot be here. They're here was all I managed to whisper. Her sobs shook me. I didn't realize my mother was crying until I felt her tears wet on my shoulder. The words were entangled on my tongue, but just like the string above me, they were knotted and contorted. They were here. All this time? And you made me think I was crazy? What did you do to them? What did you do? No, sweetie. They're, no, they're not. Mom's voice was breaking, her grip tightening around me. The world was spinning and I was barely aware of myself kicking and screaming while my mom struggled to shout over me. I was going to expose them to the world, she hissed out, dragging me away from Noah, away from his jerking, puppet-like mouth. I couldn't comprehend that he existed as that, as a conscious thing that had been carved out of its insides. You were the property of an evil and very powerful little girl who owns this town and everyone in it. My mom spat in my ear. They made me keep my mouth shut, so I begged them to save one of you. Just one. I had to cut one of you down before I went crazy. I was still screaming when she calmly dragged me to my car, slipping a shot into the flesh of my neck. I remembered the rain pounding against the window, my mother's pale face shining with tears or stifled sobs into the wheel. And I chose you. I woke up the next morning with what was supposed to be a wiped memory. But I wasn't lucky enough to forget. I am terrified of her finding out I remember her exact words from the car ride home. I'm scared she, or her work, will make me forget them for real. Mom told me that I once had strings too. Strings that cut through me cruelly entangling around me, suffocating my mind and controlling my every move. Strings that would soon pierce through me and turn me into a little girl's doll. But she saved me, cutting me down, when I was still human. And now I guess, I am a real girl. I always knew, deep down, that my life wasn't real. Middleview was always an enigma to me. Ever since I was a kid, my life has been a broken puzzle that didn't fit together or make sense. Looking back, I chose to blissfully ignore the splintered pieces of my existence, despite the truth dangling right in front of me the whole time. I could pretend it wasn't real as a kid, sure. And sitting in the sandpit in the first grade with Noah Presley, I looked at the sky instead of the camera in my face and the curtain that suffocated me when the lights went out. I used to question why everything felt both fake and yet painfully real. The sand I was sitting in was soft, and the sun's glare peeking through those scary vertical lines in front of me. 
scratched at my retinas. But growing up, it became harder not to notice the eyes surrounding me. Cameras that hurt my eyes and invisible strings entangling around me, making me dance. I wasn't allowed to look. If I took notice of the invisible lines cutting through the sky, I would start to hurt. I never wanted to solve crimes. I didn't want to catch milk thieves or spy on my janitor. But opening my mouth to say that, however, would get me in trouble. So I decided that, actually, maybe solving crimes would be fun. After all, catching Jessica S. was. I had two important orders I had to follow. The words in my mouth that weren't mine, that tangled like a tongue twister and left me out of breath. I couldn't fight them. Nor could I look up or down, left or right. I couldn't touch the springy lines cutting into the air. And if I did, I was punished with an uncomfortable feeling of being yanked, pulled backwards, my arms and legs jerking, moving for me. Sometimes my mother would look me dead in the eye and tell me to turn my head, to relax my fists, to breathe slowly and ignore the dancing lines. So I continued tracing swirls and seas in the sandpit, ignoring them. The mayor's son was far less cooperative, with the eyes that were not allowed to look at. Unlike me, he took notice of the invisible creases that entangled with us. Noah Presley brushed them out of the way, poking and prodding them blinking at them like he could see them, and reminding me they, in fact, were not a figment of our imagination. Initially, the boy was like me. He reluctantly went along with the murmurs in his head, and the orders from the eye surrounding us. We were spying on the janitor, the two of us hiding behind a wall when he tapped my shoulder. I thought he was alerting me that someone was coming, but instead, Noah leaned close. Look! The mayor's son was supposed to wear serious faces and shove me around. This Noah had playful eyes and a mischievous smile that would rather play in the ball court or go digging for buried treasure. The real Noah wanted to be a pirate, not a detective. He grabbed my hand and I felt that tightness again, that stinging pain in my fingers and arms. I wasn't allowed to look at the lines twined around my arms and wrapped around my legs, but Noah Presley made it hard. Instead of focusing on the janitor, he prodded at them and proved my mom wrong. I watched in amazement as he played a tune, strumming them like a guitar. The eyes strictly told him to stop and he stuck out his tongue defiantly. The lines went boing and we both giggled. Shading his eyes from the lights in our eyes, Noah pointed right at what we were not allowed to look at. His smile was wide, baffled full of childish amazement that stifled a gnawing fear creeping up his spine. A fear I knew was real when his expression crumpled. He was feeling that exact slicing pain through his fingers and toes, his lips curling. As little kids, the lines were less cruel to us, acting as a warning in case we acted out. When we grew older, becoming more perceptive of our surroundings, awake and aware of cameras and flashing lights, and eyes telling us what to do, the mayor's son grew less mystified by the lines. He wasn't fascinated anymore, a frustration sparking in his eyes. Instead of playing with them, he called them bad words. Noah started to ask questions that were less curious and more demanding. In the third grade, we were in the middle of a missing cat case. Our class was doing a spelling bee in class when he jumped up from his chair. I did notice he was practically vibrating in his seat all day but I figured he was just itching to get out of school so he could find Mrs. Kara's missing Persian. At nine years of age, the mayor's son wanted answers. This is stupid, he yelled. The lines are driving me crazy. The boy jumped up on his desk and waved his arms, prodding the lines we were not allowed to see, pulling them so they jerked and danced. I twisted around to tell him to shush, but something was already violently yanking me to face the front of the class this time a stinging around my neck. I tried to reach up and touch what was wrapped around my throat, which was mechanically jerking my head from side to side. But my hands were no longer mine. Dropping to my desk, when I tried to jump up, my feet were pinned to the floor. Risking a glance down, I saw them, crisscrossing lines tying my ankles down. Noah Presley, Mrs. Jacobs yelled. In the corner of my eye, May was leaning forward in her own desk, head inclined, her fingers lightly touching the lines crisscrossing around her. The girl's eyes were wide, 
I think that was the first time she saw them. The first time Mei Li blinked back at the eyes staring at her. I wasn't allowed to look, but it was so tempting. They were right next to me. I could reach out and touch a different world I wasn't supposed to notice. You were disrupting my class. Sit down. I don't care. Noah curled his lip. I want to know what they are. His eyes softened and I detected vulnerability in his tone. They're there. And there. And there. And there. He pointed manically, almost toppling off of his desk. Don't be ridiculous, she said. Sit down. No. Noah spat back. He was putting on a brave face, but the boy was hiding the tremble in his voice. His arms wrapped around himself. Not until you tell me what the lines are, Mr. Jacobs. In the fourth grade, we were investigating the disappearance of a beloved town monument. Our fourth member had just joined us, and we were once again being reprimanded inside Principal Main's office. Apparently, we weren't allowed to break into the science lab to see if chemicals had been stolen by a student. We found traces of a certain chemical at the scene of the crime, and newcomer Eris was convinced our suspect was in fact a kid. That day, I remember it was too hot. We were standing in a line, and our heads bowed, awaiting an inevitable scolding. Blinking dazedly, my gaze wandered from our glaring principal to my own legs that moved on their own. Magic? You four, stand up! We did, and next to me, Noah tipped his head back and blew a raspberry. Principal Main's twitching eye snapped to a grinning heiress, who at that point was completely blind to the cutting lines. His unblinking eyes failed to see what entangled him, what was supposed to hurt him. Eris Kane, Main leaned forward on his chair, brushing away the avalanche of paper and empty coffee mugs. His stress lines were funny to look at. You're a smart kid. Your father tells me you are a gifted student. I heard you voluntarily transfer to this school. Eris nodded with a proud smile, while the rest of us held our breaths. If Maine happened to compliment you, yeah, you were pretty much dead. So why, pray tell? He steepled his fingers, his tone hardening. Eris's smile faded. Do you insist on aligning yourself with these troublemakers? That's rich, Noah scoffed. For someone who isn't even real. May nudged him, but the boy didn't back down. You, Noah said loudly, like he was talking directly to the eyes. You're not real, Mr. Maine. Maine cocked his head, and I saw his movement jolted. I'm sorry. What? Noah sighed and stepped forward, grabbing a coffee mug and tipping it over the principal's head. Reality splintered again, and I took the time to notice things that I wasn't supposed to. Maine had lines too. But his lines made him up, a being of cotton and string and patchwork flesh, than our principal. It was just a single movement when my breath caught in my throat, and I could feel them tugging at me, forcing me to keep my head down. But Principal Main's face was too scary, a mound of dead flesh, glassy eyes that stared straight through me, and a mouth that opened and closed, jerking left to right. Sharp intakes of breath next to me and Eris was stumbling back, his lips twisted into a silent scream, while May was paralyzed to the spot. I think they could see it too, not just the contorting lines making up our principal, but the gnawing hollow nothing where his back was supposed to be, the cruel stand-in-place of a spine. I forced myself to ignore the whispers in my ear that it wasn't real, that it was all in my head, the cavern in the back of his skull where scarlet-colored strings replaced a human brain. I saw his strings hanging above him, moving his mouth. Noah turned to us, and for the first time in my life, I saw Noah Presley's real eyes. He was terrified, his expression desperate. See? Noah pleaded with us, grasping hold of the lines in a tight fist. He ignored the shouts from the eyes around us, his lips carved into a scream his mouth wouldn't allow. Noah's voice shook with sobs, and already we were being pulled back our bodies flailing and our minds going blank. It's not! Cut! A voice yelled. Real. They made me stop thinking after. Noah's voice faded into white noise, and before I knew what was happening, a blanket of darkness was falling in front of my eyes. It was like I could make time jump forward if I blinked, though it only happened when Noah started screaming about lines that were getting closer to him. 
Initially, they dangled in front of us as kids, sometimes coiled around our fingers, grazing the backs of our necks as if a silent warning. Now, they were actually wrapped around us, making us dance, so close to severing us, just like our principal. The eyes managed to keep us on a leash for the most part, going to extreme lengths to keep us inside the lines, but that wasn't the last time I was awake and aware of them. It was always the mayor's son hissing in our ears when he thought the eyes were gone, squeezing my hand tight and heiresses tighter, entangling our fingers. He brought the fake world crumbling down, and in those moments of clarity, I was grateful for him fighting back. Presently, my thoughts were on the car ride that wouldn't leave my mind. I was half aware of the others around me, delusions I was slowly growing used to. May, sitting cross-legged on the floor with her usual pursed lips, and the boys play-fighting. I had found myself in my mother's office, which was usually out of bounds. I was slumped in a beanbag, flicking through every paper document I could find, but it was all invoices. I watched the guys instead bathed in late afternoon sunlight through the curtains on the windows. The two of them resembled two bright balls of light, which was ironic. The boys' fighting skills were exactly the same, after the four of us were forced to take part in self-defense classes. According to the sheriff, he wasn't letting us anywhere near a middle-view criminal, unless we knew how to fight. Watching Eris easily put Noah into a headlock, the brunette wrestling him to the ground, laughing, I guess they learned well. Something sour crept up my throat, and the streaks of sunlight faded, shadows taking over the office, threatening to swallow my imaginary friends completely, not well enough to escape their fate. I wondered what would happen if my memories returned. Would this image of them disappear, or twist to suit my memory? Still, I enjoyed their company. I don't think my brain wanted to register the agonizing reality of what they really were, hollowed out dolls dancing on strings for an audience behind a curtain of darkness. These versions were easier for my mind to register and understand. These versions, despite being memories carved into real faces, imaginary friends I couldn't let go of, were warm and familiar. I lost them at the age of 15, dragged from my town by my mother, and told they weren't real, only to find them again years later nothing more than flesh puppets on scarlet strings, dancing and parading to a tune I could not hear. The three of them resembled our middle school principal. I couldn't see the back of Noah's head, only strings. Eris's torso hung like a wooden toy, carved of blood, bone, and flesh, everything he ever was. In its place, his spine that had been molded into a perfect puppet stand, the three of them had become exactly what a younger Noah had feared. There was more to my memories, after my mother and the people behind Middleview had fought to keep me in the dark. There were still parts of my mind I was searching for. The night the Middleview Four stepped inside the string factory on the tail of the infamous string murderer, my memory cut off like a curtain had fallen, but I didn't remember one. I didn't remember anything after pushing the factory door open, time jumping to four hours later. What happened to us? Why was I found inconsolable, covered in bloody strings? Mom saved me, but what happened to the others? I had splinters, a uh, scarlet horror lurking in the back of my mind. Blurry memories of sitting in warm red that flowed around us. A table made of steel and a stained blade hanging above us. Shaking my head, I buried that memory in particular. I would only go back to shining rubies glittering on every surface and dripping into the floor when I knew how we had gotten inside that room. There was one memory in particular that was running through my head. The car ride on the night Mom dragged me away from what I discovered. She drugged me so that I could barely remember it. However, over the last few days, what was supposed to be a blank slate was unraveling. I remembered heavy rain pounding against the black window, my cheek pressed to the glass, my body twisted like a pretzel in the back seat. Mom had stopped crying, her fingers clenched around the wheel. Outside, the glow of passing streetlights kept me aware, my flickering eyes following the long winding road ahead of us. I was surrendering to the dark, hopped up on the drugs forced into my bloodstream, when the sound of a click came from the passenger seat. 
I opened my eyes, my thoughts swimming. I tried to sit up, but my bones were made of lead. There was a figure in the passenger seat. I could see the shadow of their head pressed against the pane. When their head jerked, my spongy mind realized the figure was moving. Everything about them wasn't human, instead blanketed in darkness, in silhouettes from passing streetlights and signs transforming them into a being of oblivion. I tried to look for a face, except my drugged up brain only found a cavern of nothing in its place. Don't. My cheek gently bobbed against the window. Though Mom didn't turn to look at me, she was talking to them. My mother's voice was a low murmur, reassuring. I know you're scared, but just like I said earlier, I'm going to take you somewhere safe, she whispered. She's not going to find you. We're about to hit the highway so her influence won't stretch this far. I don't know if the figure believed my mother. Still, I think her voice was comforting enough for them to want to try. Once their hands slowly retracted from the lock on the door, I dazedly watched the figure sit back with a quiet huff. Mom exhaled a breath of relief, her fingers tightening around the wheel. Keep your head down. Her tone immediately turned motherly. If you want to lie down in the back seat, you might be more comfortable. Mom started to hum again. Her voice a lullaby as the figure ducked their head in the blinding haze of a passing streetlight. I finally saw their reflection. Huh? The shadow person was human after all. Mom's singing followed me into the dark, the drugs finally catching up to my mind. I remembered her hand leaving the wheel and squeezing the figure's fingers, her voice a hypnotizing lull. In a town where I was born lived a man who sailed the sea, and he told us of his life in the land of submarines. Hey! Noah snapped me out of it. I had to blink rapidly. Drinking in the boy's head of vicious curls, he refused to trim. They looked brighter in the sunlight. Strands set a light dancing across his forehead. Fifteen-year-old Noah Presley loomed over me. Half of his face drowned in shadow. He was a snapshot, a memory I wanted to keep close with me. I stood up from my place slumped in the beanbag. Eris was perched on my mother's desk, and May was flicking through a book she had found comfortably cross-legged on the sheepskin rug. Yep, I was still hallucinating my dead friends. I didn't question them earlier that morning before Mom left for work, but now that I was really looking at the three, I realized they were noticeably younger. When they came to see me inside the facility, Eris's hair was long, while Noah's was a more mature style, slicked back. I strictly remembered May's pigtails being loose, longer, a fringe hanging in her eyes. Looking at them presently, they had reverted to their 15-year-old selves, wearing the exact same clothes from where I found them in the diner. Noah was in his usual jeans and hoodie, heiress, casual white shirt and pants, and May in shorts and t-shirt, her pigtails dancing on her shoulders. The middle view for in our summer before sophomore year, who I remembered and held on to the most. You're daydreaming again, Noah sang, poking me in the face. The boy cocked his head. How many times are you going to dwell on that car ride? Instead of answering him, I checked over my mom's desk for the thousandth time. There's nothing here, Ara said, swinging his legs. Unless we count the list of subjects you've been holding for a while now. I tightened my grip on the paper scrunched between my fists. I thought it was a clue to who we were, but apparently it was just my mother involved in unethical experiments on kids. Eris met my gaze, his lips pursing. You think those kids are us? They were all born in 2011. Which makes them 10 years old, May hummed, her gaze flicked to me. Wait, didn't you see a playroom inside that place? I nodded slowly, frowning at the paper on my knee. Ten subjects, numbered 0 0.1 to 0 0.10. Only first names, and all born in 2011. Eris jumped up with an exaggerated sigh. Eris Kane was theater kid energy, and I refused to elaborate. Okay, so cast your minds back to case number seven, when we were 13 years old and Mary Cassidy's prized doll collection had gone missing. Eris turned to me, his arms folded. Where did we find them? I shrugged with a scoff. We didn't find them, the cops did. 
Not our proudest moment. Eris's grin didn't waver. He was slowly moving back towards the bookcase, and I was following him, already running my fingers down each book. We didn't, I continued in a hiss. The cops found the dolls, but we were determined to find the culprit. I was talking out loud, but it felt good to be investigating again. So, I said in a breath, we broke into Nina Jarrett's house, and inside her mother's office were a series of tunnels, hidden behind. I started to pull out books by the spine, throwing them on the floor. The bookcase, Eris finished, leaning against the wood with a smirk. He ignored Noah's rolled eyes. So, let's take into account the fact that your mother works on this stage play and is clearly being controlled by strings. However, she saved you and definitely has skeletons in her closet, but secretly works against her own colleagues. Eris clucked his tongue. Think about it. You just saved a valuable asset from a dangerous organization. He prodded the bookcase. Where's the first place you're going to hide them? The Arctic? Noah was comfortably perched on the edge of Mom's desk. Switzerland? May threw a book at him. Take this seriously. Ow! He volleyed one back. You can't hit me with a hard back. Nope, Eris said, ignoring the other's sibling back and forth. In plain sight. The boy's latter words were only emphasized when I yanked away the final book, only for the bookcase to slide aside revealing a large metal door. Dude! Noah laughed, sidestepping an ancient copy of Metamorphosis, tumbling from the top shelf. I stepped in front of the metal door, my heart in my throat. There was no handle, a freaky-looking scanner attached to the lock. Biometric, Eris hummed, appearing next to me. Unless you have a spare copy of your mom's thumb, we ain't getting in there. I opened my mouth to speak, before a rough hand found my shoulder. Eris's eyes widened. Noah stumbled back. Oh no, Noah hissed. Did you not hear the door opening? I had to back the urge to snap back. Neither did you, on account of him being a figment of my imagination. It took me a disorienting moment to drink in the black-clad soldier, standing in the doorway. His eyes were gray and cruel, raking me up and down. He ignored me. The kid will be in here somewhere, the man grunted shoving past me. Search Alice into Bet's office. His head snapped toward the doorway when another figure appeared. It was the man in the mask from the facility, the one who wiped, or pretended to wipe, my memories. Delaney, scan the daughter, he barked. Do a full dig. Get your hands dirty if you must. Dr. Delaney nodded. He took slow strides towards me, and with every step, the real world was bleeding into my illusion bright sunlight filling the room and eating away at my friends. The three of them faded, swallowed by the shadow. I was alone again, when the masked man dumped something into my hands. I was trying to bring them back. Where is he? His voice cut out into the bubble I had built around myself. Blinking rapidly, my mind was already trying to retreat, trying to retrace the middle view four back into existence, except my mother's office was empty. The bookcase Eris had helped me throw aside, still revealed the door my mother had hidden in plain sight. There were books on the floor, but no sign of May sitting amongst them, or Eris and Noah swapping theories. The two of them leaned against the wall. There was something damp in my hands. I could feel it, stingy and wet, slipping through my fingers. Strings. My breath caught in my throat. The severed strings from the person Mum saved slimy and warm in my hand. I don't know if it was the memory slamming into me like a wave of ice water, or the force of the masked man's figures pressing pressure to my temples. I fell again, plunging down, 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 into what had been stripped away. I was running. The sky was a blanket of inky oblivion above me, and I was sprinting down a quiet suburban street, swinging my arms to drive me faster. I knew exactly what case it was. It was the case that ripped us apart. Immediately, I knew what was coming. I tried to retract from the masked man's control, but he forced me deeper. I was back in Middleview. It was a Saturday night and we were missing our third member. Noah called an emergency meeting in our local coffee shop, dumping my strawberry milkshake down, 
Strawberry for me and chocolate for him and Eris. I took the window seat, always squeezed next to May, while the boys sat opposite us. Glancing next to me, the plush blue of May's seat made me feel kind of sick. May is missing, Noah announced. Eris, who was absently stirring his shake into a mush, went pale. Damn, he lowered his voice, leaning over the table. Because of the note? Noah shot Eris the side eye, lips curved around his straw. Why else, genius? I pulled the note from my pocket, smoothing it across the table. There were four severed fingers attached to the top. Eris confirmed the fingers were from already dead corpses, which didn't make it any better, but at least this psycho wasn't on a killing spree. The words, Can we play a game? were spelled out in individual letters. From the weirdo fan who's obsessed with us? Eris hissed. Noah nodded grimly. No parents, if we tell the adults, the guy will kill her. An hour later, after searching the town, May finally contacted us on her talkie. She had been kidnapped by the person behind the note. Marin, are you there? Noah's voice crackled through the talkie gripped between my clammy fingers. I'm almost at the rendezvous, he sounded out of breath, pausing to let out a sharp hiss. I may have lied to my dad about the note, but the guy said no cops, Noah paused. How much trouble do you think we're all in? I laughed. Almost definitely grounded until college. Um, hello? I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm still kidnapped. May's grumble crackled through. The psycho left me hanging by my foot, so all the blood is rushing to my head. Hurry up. Noah responded with a scoff. Geez, you're going to annoy him into letting you go. Says the boy who never shuts up, May shot back. Where are you guys? I stopped running, dragging myself into a slower pace. I'm just outside the place, I said, swallowing sharp breaths. How about you guys? Someone tapped me on the shoulder, and I bit back a shriek. Eris, somehow not out of breath. I figured his time on the basketball team helped. As usual, he was overdressed for a rescue. I was frowning at his white fitted shirt and sandy curls pinned back by a pair of Ray-Bans, wondering where the hell had our middle view four nerd gone. Yo, he saluted me with a smirk. Am I really that frightening? I nodded at his getup. What the hell are you wearing? His smile didn't waver. I was at an interview. Interview? Noah finally caught up to us, flashlight in one hand, talkie in the other. He paused to rest his hands on his knees. The mayor's son's voice was muffled. What interview? My dad wants to send me back to private school. Eris rolled his eyes. In his words, I'm going to get myself killed. What? Noah hissed, spitting out his flashlight. You can't leave. That doesn't matter right now, Eris murmured. We can talk about my dad being a total dick after May is safe. Noah shot me a look, and I could only respond with a shrug. Approaching the barn where May was held, we took it slow. May? Noah led us, Eris at his side. I brought up the rear, shining my flashlight beam on anything that moved. Still there, May? Noah hissed into his talkie. He tripped over a rock and Eris dragged him back, playfully hitting him. Yes, I'm still here, dying of boredom. Eris hopped ahead, striding over to the door. He twisted around, shining his flashlight. You know, for someone who's hanging upside down in a barn of death, you sure seem to be super chill. Oh, I'm not chill. I'm going to kill all three of you for getting me into this. Eris pulled one of the doors open, motioning for me to help him. I did, pushing all of my weight into it. Noah, you grab and free May, he ordered. I'll check if the psycho is still hanging around. Marin, you guard the doors. Noah scoffed, shining the flashlight in the boy's face. Oh yeah? What are you going to do if someone jumps out? Kick his ass? Harris said through a mouthful of flashlight. Or run. Probably run. Deeper. The masked man's voice cut through the memory. Look for key moments, key memories. Noah stepped inside the barn first. I heard his shuffled footsteps. One step. Two steps. Three steps. He halted suddenly. Noah? Eris, who was checking for tripwires, twisted around. 
You good, man? When there was no response, Eris motioned me to go in as backup. Leaving our fourth member at the door, I ventured inside the barn. It was pitch black, the kind of darkness that somehow dimmed my flickering light. Following Noah's footsteps, my slimy fingers clicked the button down on my talkie. May? A voice came out in a shaky whisper as my flashlight flickered on and off. Uh, May, can you tell me where you are? The sound of a talkie coming to life filled my mouth with wriggling insects. I'm here. Can you guys untie me? I could hear May, but I couldn't see her. My dying flashlight beam illuminated her talkie, lying in a batch of hay. Next to it, a figure standing perfectly still. Noah. The boy was standing, his head tipped back, arms limp by his sides. He had dropped his talkie too. Noah? His name came out in a hiss and I was afraid to speak, afraid to follow his gaze, until something cold trickled down my face, like raindrops. Guys? May's voice cracked. Where are you? Pressing two fingers to my face, my fingertips were drenched in red. Something dripped again, sliding down my cheek. It was so cold. Noah wasn't moving because the lines holding him hostage were not letting him. His mouth was opening and closing, but no sound was coming out. My strings only allowed me to tip my head back, but my body was still straining, my legs giving way, my thoughts spiraling. I didn't want to look, and yet the eyes strictly told me to. There was something hanging from the ceiling. May, like a pig, she had been gutted from the neck to torso, her insides already carved out as if by a surgeon's hand. What was left of May was a shell in her place. Cut! A shriek lulled me back to the real world. Anna! Anna, explain yourself! The man's voice was suddenly booming, blinding lights in my eyes. Cut! I said cut! Anna, stop laughing! No, no, it's not funny. You can't kill them. The ground rumbled suddenly, but I was still paralyzed, suspended on strings. What's going on? Eris said in a whimper. The man's voice turned stern, frightened. Okay, have it your way, Anna. Eris was already screaming, a guttural cry that sent him to the ground. But he wasn't allowed to drop to his knees, strings jerking him into place. He was yanked back up, forced to dance, his mouth snapping open and closed and saying words that weren't his. We were forced to bow in front of a curtain, a cacophony of children's laughter deafening my ears. Noah didn't fight his strings tugging him from left to right. His eyes never left May. I don't think he was really seeing her. Instead, he was seeing her strings, that, with a simple snip, were cut, and she flopped to the ground and was scooped into a stranger's arms. I couldn't even mourn her death, or feel real emotion. Instead, I was stuck on the strings with no thoughts. I followed what the eyes told me to do. Pendleview turned against us after May's death. The citizens were convinced that we didn't solve crimes. We created them, and we were bad omens. We were hunted down by a group of kids, a cult dedicated to ridding the town of the Middleview Four. Noah was gutted by a group of twelve-year-olds and Eris tied to a conveyor belt, dragged through a meat grinder. I thought I could save them both. Marin, don't! Eris's yell caught me off guard when I burst into the sawmill where he was being held. Tripwire! He muffled through duct tape over his mouth. I looked up and sure enough, a metal contraption hung over me. The conveyor belt moved slowly, and I was frozen, watching his struggling body draw closer to the revolving blades. I had a choice. I could free him and sacrifice myself, or let my friend be dragged through a meat grinder. In the end, it was a trick. They knew I would be paralyzed. I was barely conscious when my best friend's blood was painting my face. Blood slicked strings held me in the cheek. Their deaths were announced via the same voice that had been taunting us. I remembered finding them, barely anything left. Shards of flesh and bone. Noah still tied to a chair, his chest impaled by a single tree branch. 
There was a single crown of flowers nestled on his head. I was greeted with the voice when all three of their bodies were presented to me. What are you now? Hmm? The voice taunted me. Who exactly are you without them? I screamed and I was allowed to scream, my mouth widening, stretching across my face. The curtain fell in front of me and my strings finally gave way. Cut. All right. Uh, nice job, everybody. I want to go again. The voice was a little girl, but I barely noticed. I barely noticed my mother's hands smoothing down my hair and cradling my cheeks. Soon, she whispered in my ear, I'm going to take you home. I wasn't looking at my mother. I was still waiting for my friends to come back to life. Their bodies dropped to the ground to the sound of heavy applause behind the curtain. And I was left, suspended in the air, all too aware of the strings still holding me together. I wanted to die like them, but they didn't let me. I saw my mom in flashes of light. She took me off stage, carrying me like I was her own daughter. I was lying on my back, and she was pulling strings from me, her shaking fingers slipping a needle into my skin and stitching me back together, a seam of a blood-red thread pooling down around my chest. My mom pulled the painful stitches stifling my screams. I had harmless cuts and bruises. The others were dead, ripped apart, gone, but not in middle view. They came back to life because she demanded it. I blinked and I was back in class talking to Noah. His smiles weren't the same anymore. Eris never blinked, and May's grin was too big for me not to notice. Unlike my strings, theirs held them together, binding dead flesh and bone. It's not like I could ask questions. My mouth was sealed and all I could do was choke out the words I was supposed to say. And remember the one rule. We were not allowed to look. The string murderer's case came out of nowhere. Multiple people had been found dead in piles of string. I was grounded, so I snuck out to meet May at a rendezvous and meet the guys at the old string factory. We arrived on our bikes and Noah started unveiling his plan. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. His voice was drowned out by white noise in my ears, a twisting nausea twisting its way through my gut. I looked at him. Shining my light over his face with un shining my light over his face with unlinking eyes and too wide smile. There were lines cutting through him, sliced and twined through his flesh. Noah? I spoke through a whisper. He didn't turn around, bobbing along on his strings. Why do you look like that? Marin? His voice bled into my mind. Are you good? I wanted to stumble back but my strings pulled me forward. I helped push the door open and the four of us stepped into the dark, our flashlight beams following us. I was examining the floor when Eris grabbed my hand, his slimy fingers entangling with mine. I could sense that they had been dead for a long time, but somehow, his touch still that... His touch still felt comforting. Look, he whispered, illuminated in pale light, were three more bodies lying in pooling red. String. Not blood. Eris hit the ground. Suddenly. Face first. May screamed, stumbled back, and Noah turned to me, his manic glass eyes flitting left to right. Noah slowly produced a pair of scissors from his pocket. Slamming his hand over my mouth, his gaze wasn't on me. He was staring at the eyes, his artificial laughing mouth stretching into a grin. His strings were loose, freeing his hands. Noah's voice was an agonizing wail combined with a hysterical giggle, and I could finally see the hollowed cavern where his head was supposed to be. Don't you want to stop living for ever? Deeper, Dr. Delaney's presence and voice was looking for something specific, tearing me from the memory. He's in here somewhere. So, the further I fell. I could already feel the effects of the man's vice grip around my mind, blood trickling down my chin, tainting my lips. This memory felt recent. I was hunched over in what felt like a metal chair, my hands pinned behind my back. Opening my eyes, I was in a large room awash with red light. Yo, Earth to Marin! Noah's voice faded in and out. 
Hey, come on. We kind of need you, like, now. Don't say it like that. May's murmur was enough to relax my body. Well, how else should I say it? Blinking through sharp red light, scratching at my eyes. Noah Presley was noticeably older. Reddish hair overgrown and mousy. There were things stuck out. He was taller. Odd markings on his arms that drew my attention. He was wearing blue scrubs. Scissors tucked into the pocket. May was hanging over his shoulder. A blood-stained hospital gown hanging off of her. Marin. Eris shoved Noah out of the way. And I could feel my strings. Concrete floor. You trust us, right? It was hard to trust him when he too was older. His sandy hair, like Noah's, was an overgrown mess. Eris was wearing an odd combination. A scuffed pair of jeans, hospital scrubs tucked into them. Stay calm. His eyes had a hollowness to them I didn't recognize. It's okay. It's us. Just look at me. Eris's voice was oddly commanding, and I found my gaze snapping to him. His hands were covered in blood, a silver blade sticking from his pocket. Eris noticed me staring at his hands. Right at me, Marin. Focus on his butt-ugly face, Noah said from behind him. Not helping, moron. You're covered in blood, I managed. That doesn't matter. You remember what happened, right? Remember what? What happened in the string factory, Eris said. We opened the door and it was dark. I followed his words. You were cold and... His expression crumpled. What happened to us? Something wrenched in my chest when he took a step back. You're leaving me? The boy's face was bathed in red light. His smile sickly. It's hard to explain. You look... Older. Eris! That noise. It was an alarm. Please, he whispered. What happened that night? His hands felt wet and real, clinging to me. Noah grabbed him, dragging the guy back. No! No, wait! Come on, idiot! The memory was cut off when Dr. Delaney's fingers left my temples. I was back in my mom's office, rivulets of red dripping down my face. He's not here, the man announced, and the soldier stopped tearing my mother's office apart, swiftly leaving. The look Delaney shot me before he left is still bothering me. Was he relieved? Still, I'm scared he's going to come back. I don't think he'll spare me this time. As soon as the door slammed, Noah was standing in front of me. Fifteen years old again. Before I lost him, everything went wrong. You're not real, I told him shakily. His eyes were a lot darker than before, and yet his smile still remained, innocent and mocking. The mayor's son strode in front of me, just like he did as a child, stepping on my shoes. Why don't you ask me what you really want to say? The words came out before I could stop them. Why did you kill all those townspeople? Noah blew a raspberry. No, not that one. You know why I killed them. Try again. You're dead. I whispered. He raised a brow. Congratulations. That we are. I nodded slowly, my stomach twisting. So, why do you keep getting older? Middleview, the town I grew up in, is not real. Neither were the first 15 years of my life as a teen detective. I know what Middleview is, and the people behind it. I know who murdered my friends, and to an extent, I know who I am. So now, I'm asking one more simple question. I still have so many, and those will be answered in due course. The third passenger in my mother's car, the identity of the person she saved along with me, cutting them from their strings, not to mention the truth behind Middleview's puppeteer. But one question still remains haunting the back of my mind since I started to take notice of my own delusions, figments of my imagination carved into my friends' faces. I imagined them because I didn't want to come to terms with the reality of who and what I discovered the night I found them again. The mayor's son, Noah Presley, no longer existed as a human being, a thing made up of patchwork skin and muscle and bone molded into a puppet. Eris Kane's head was completely hollowed out, his spine twisted and modeled into a stand for his puppeteer. 
Mei Li's lips had been split apart, a permanent grin jerking left to right with her strings. But even as my imaginary friends, something is far too real about them. Through fragments inside my memory, I saw older versions of them. I saw them inside the facility when I was hopped up on wacky gas, and then again, deep inside the memories my mother had attempted to wipe away. So I ask myself this. Who exactly are the Middle View 4, really? Presently, my mind is being tugged left and right, like I was still stuck on strings. Ever since Dr. Delaney dived inside my skull to find the identity of the kid my mother saved, my mind was no longer part of me. Instead, what felt like a detached videotape stuck in rewind. My memories were not in chronological order, instead a non-linear mess. They hit me when they wanted to hit me. So it was less like going down memory lane, and more like being forcibly drowned inside my own mind, plunged into the darkness, memories that had been suppressed and wiped away. It's like throwing up, completely out of my control. This particular memory was like poison being poured inside my brain, but I couldn't keep a grip on reality. Instead, I was plunging deeper. My memories were like waves crashing onto a seafront. One comes in while the others are thrown back. I couldn't stop it, fighting it like a virus striking through my blood. I was clinging on to the real world, which was fading fast, my vision blurring. I held on to where I was. I was inside my mom's office. The sun was bleeding away into early twilight, and I was desperately holding on to every streak of light filtering through the curtains. I was aware I was still hallucinating Noah Presley, but even he was blurring in and out of view. Noah did not make sense. The more I was getting to know this version of him, this snapshot I had imagined into existence, I was slowly coming to realize it wasn't just his memory of him that didn't make sense. I didn't know his past self either. I didn't know the reason behind him seemingly getting older, despite dying at 15. Drenched in shadows that were threatening to engulf him completely, the mayor's son was standing in front of me, arms folded, head inclined. He felt right, comfortable, like he was my home. Noah was still stepping on my toes, just like he did when we were kids, rocking back and forth on his heels. Marin? Noah's features were slowly bleeding away. Reddish dark hair becoming inky nothing, those last fragments of him fading into shadows dancing around the room. His sing-song voice sounded real, drifting in and out of my ears like a whisper in the wind. But as reality and memory began to blur, his voice was growing louder, a muffled yell plunging me inside a memory. I existed in two places at once, reality standing in my mom's office, and middle view tied back to back with the mayor's son. Marin, oh hell, wake up, where are we? It was pitch dark and my head was hurting. Concussion? No, but I had definitely hit my head. I could feel a news of warmth, blood, trickling down my temple. My wrists were expertly bound together and tangled with Noah's. There was something sticky over my mouth, duct tape. I was used to being kidnapped, so being gagged wasn't usually a problem for me. I just licked the inside until it was pasty enough to spit out. When we were kids, the people we hunted down were more tame and cartoon-like. Eris called them Scooby-Doo villains. They were cat burglars and vegetable thieves. But the older we got, the more dangerous these people became. We started to come face to face with crime bosses and child killers. By the age of 13, I was aware I wasn't invincible, and Middleview psychos would kill us if they had the chance. However, what I wasn't counting on was being betrayed by one of our own. I'm going to kill him. Noah was our usual damsel in distress, the Middle View 4 member who was always getting himself knocked out and dragged to second locations, despite being the brawn in our group. He had even mastered the ability to speak through a gag. According to him, it just took practice, and being tied up for long periods of time with nothing to do but scream into the masses of tapes slapped over his mouth have been the perfect opportunity. In this case, he was screaming, struggling violently in his chair. I wouldn't call it communicating. I was still trying to figure out where we were. It looked like an old barn. Tipping my head back, I could see a half-crescent moon drowned in eerie white light poking through a hole in the roof. 
With another yelp, Noah almost sent the two of us toppling over when he violently threw himself forwards. I could understand why he was so upset, but he was going to attract attention. Twisting in my chair, the barn was empty for now. If Noah kept muffles screaming and rocking back and forth in his chair, that would change. Noah, I spoke calmly through the uncomfortable stickiness over my mouth, grasping for his clammy hands. He's dead! The mayor's son muffle wailed, throwing his head into mine. The impact was painful, but I don't even think he felt it. I had to push down the overwhelming urge to slam my skull into his in retaliation. How could he do this to us? Noah's voice choked into a sob. I always knew there was something shady about him joining us, and I even questioned it when we were kids. Yet somehow I was the crazy one for suggesting the weird British kid who inserted himself into our gang was going to betray us. Except that's not what you said, I hit back. You didn't like him because you wanted to be the only boy in the gang. Noah spluttered. I was ten, and that doesn't even matter. You're changing the subject because I'm right this time. Damn, he was so annoyingly, infuriatingly right. I had come to realize my best friend was a lot more sensitive than I thought. Noah valued the four of us less like a group of friends, more akin to a family. Let him explain himself, I whispered. He's clearly in some kind of trance. That fast? Noah spat the tape off of his mouth, his voice more of a slur. I could still hear the effects of him being thwacked. You seriously believe someone screwed with his head within the space of five minutes? I'm not an expert on brainwashing, but that's not how it works. It takes time, moron, which means he's been playing us this whole damn time. The bastard knocked me out with a golf club, Marin. He struggled again, and this time I was out of patience, letting my intrusive thoughts win. I should have asked my own questions, but I wanted to believe that our fourth member was always with us, just like he promised at the age of ten years old when we officiated him joining us with a rainbow cupcake and playfully shoving the boy into the town lake. Noah was rightfully pissed. How could he do this to us? Frustrated, I knocked my head back into Noah's. Shut up! Impact this time was more satisfying than painful. I could practically hear the boy's drug, drunk brain bouncing around in his skull. Ow! Oh, he whisper shrieked, twisting around. What was that for? Jumping to conclusions, I gritted out, half aware of a flashlight hitting me in the face. The beam danced across the wall in a tease, and I had to squeeze my eyes shut to avoid the scratching glare. Hey! Noah squirmed in his chair. His head fell on my shoulder, arms wriggling against mine. I know you're there! What the hell is this? Shh! I shoved him this time. I highly doubt he's been conspiring against us since the fourth grade, I hissed. It's not him, Noah. I told you he's clearly under the influence. And what if it is him? He gritted back. Easy, I said, my lips curving into a smile I didn't understand. Poison in my mouth and bubbling in my throat. This feeling was foreign and new. It felt like my mouth was being stretched together and apart. Suddenly my bound wrists felt stronger, like I could twine my fingers around our fourth member's neck, snapping it in two. We kill him. The words were not mine, and yet slipped from my lips so effortlessly, I almost lost my breath. Words were suddenly so hard, soup on my tongue and choking my brain. Noah's sharp intake of breath jolted something inside my mind. I could sense the boy's reply in his top muscles, goosebumps prickling up and down his bare arms, his stiffening back, but he didn't say it. Even then, Something was being pulled inside the two of us, contorting our limbs, our thoughts, and speech. I couldn't see his face, but just from the tone of his voice, I knew Noah was smiling. Right, he whispered, his voice more of a breath. We kill him. Despite his words, Noah's body was struggling to act complacent. He knew something was wrong, but I don't think he could speak. If I squinted my eyes through the blinding flashlight in my face... I could see them. Lines. Lines that were above me and below me, crisscrossing and entangling. 
I already knew they existed. In every instance I saw them, I was told to forget them. I was told I wasn't allowed to look at them, but not this time. We were awake. You can see them, right? Noah breathed. Yeah. This time there were no voices in my head to look away and avert my gaze. No piercing eyes to tell me to forget. It was just me and Noah and the suffocating control both of us were now fully aware of. I opened my mouth to correct myself. To demand answers from the shadow looming closer to us. When my mind retracted again, detaching itself from the memory and plunging further down. I had no time to breathe. No time to anchor myself to reality. Where I was kneeling on my mother's sheepskin rug. Warm red pooling down my face with my imaginary friend standing over me. It was going to kill me, I thought dizzily. My words felt distant and wrong, disconnected from my body. Whatever this thing was, what Dr. Delaney had planted inside my mind was going to kill me. If I could liken this feeling to anything, it would be drowning, suffocating in oblivion, dragging me down, down, down. The memory was agony, already sending my brain into a spasm. I remember waking up, my throat filled with blood. I was lying on my back, a halo of fake hair spread around me. I opened my mouth to scream when agonizing pain ripped through me, a cutting blade just missing my face. Except I didn't have a mouth, I didn't yet have arms or legs. I just had eyes that were wide and wrong and misplaced, drinking in the world around me that felt far too big. Blinking my new eyes wide, while the start of my lips stretched wider, I could feel my throat muscles twitching, but I didn't have a voice yet. The room was made up of four concrete walls, and each one had its own pattern. The first wall was covered in old entrails, while the second and third were spattered with old and new crimson, like someone's idea of a twisted canvas. There were figures wearing pale blue masks. They talked about my body parts like me. Above me hung a monster made of metal, a humming beast that ran up and down a body I could not feel yet. I could see red string bleeding from parts of me that were not yet attached. Glittering red, pretty ruby red, seeping over the edge of my bed. It was so beautiful, real and red. I felt my not mouth choking with sobs. The figures ignored me when I struggled. They left after a while and the machine stopped, slimy red string still clinging to its blade. They were part of me, all the way down my torso, and threaded through my arms and legs like artificial veins. Strings. Strings that I could feel, entangled with my flesh and bone. Every organ, even my breath, attached to my new mouth. The figures came back to play with my lips and prod up my eyes, and then left me again, lying in my own blood, my gaze flickering across ceiling tiles. When the machine started up again, I finally had a mouth to scream, forcing my tongue through the stitches cruelly holding my lips together, until a silhouette appeared looming over me. Time had passed. I wasn't sure how much time, but it was enough for me to notice bright red light bathing him in a hellish glow. Dressed in blue hospital scrubs, a mask over his face, this boy looked a little too young to be a nurse. There were things about him that stuck out to me, familiarity bleeding into my foggy mind. I recognized his eyes already pinched with irritation, thick sandy blonde hair that had grown out into mousy curls. When he grasped for my strings, pinning me to the table, I blurted out a cry. Eris Kane pulled his mask down with one hand, slamming his palm over my mouth with the other. It's me. He manically gestured to his face. Shh, if you keep screaming like that, you're going to get us caught. Now fully aware, I drank all of him in. His hospital scrubs were definitely stolen, belonging to Dr. Layworth. Tucked into the pocket was a scalpel and a pair of scissors. Eris lifted his own arm, which, like mine, was bleeding strings entangled with his veins. He sliced them away easily, before untying my left wrist. The boy leaned close, shuddering breath tickling my cheeks. Do you remember his senior year? He whispered, his fingers working to untangle my strings. You had a panic attack, and walked out of your exam, so he sat in my car with Chipotle and did breathing exercises. Eris inhaled 
coaxing me to do the same while he cut my strings and like severing an umbilical cord. It hurt. When they were sliced and cut into, it felt like I was being ripped apart. Eris puffed out his chest. You breathe in for four seconds, hold it for seven, and then exhale for eight seconds. I did exactly what he said, forcing myself to drag in air and hold it. Wait, I said in my mind, fuzzy. Who are you? Eris's smile dampened. It's... It's complicated. When I gave him a quick nod to signal I was okay, he gently pulled me off of the table. Immediately, my legs gave way, but Eris was already wrapping his arm around my shoulder. He led me toward the exit, and I glimpsed half of a torso pinned to another table, a limp arm hanging off the edge. Everything I was seeing was unfinished. Severed parts and heads, abandoned saws stained dripping scarlet. In the eerie white glare of the emergency lights, Eris Kane's fingers were slick scarlet. His scrubs were stained, painted, like he was its canvas. Eris led us onto a white hallway, warning lights flashing in his face. There were bodies everywhere. Can you run? I managed a shaky nod. We made it halfway down the hallway before a woman appeared with a gun. Eris stumbled to a stop, and she pointed the gun between his eyes, her fingers expertly wrapped around the handheld. Look, Eris nudged me, and I followed his gaze. Strings. I could see them dangling from the woman, making her dance. She opened her mouth to speak, only for her throat to open up, sliced straight across by an invisible hand. I blinked. No, not an invisible hand. Noah Presley, who was standing behind her, his fingers wrapped around the scalpel protruding from her throat. His clothes confused me. A paper-thin hospital gown hanging off of a much thinner frame tucked into a pair of jeans. His cheeks were gaunt and malnourished, those same teasing eyes a lot more hollow than I remembered. Like Eris, Noah's reddish curls had grown out, tousled and uneven. When the woman dropped to the ground, he stepped forward, a tall brunette standing by his side. May. Somehow, she was even more beautiful. Her pigtails were longer, a thick fringe glued to her forehead. May was paler than I remembered. Her skin complexion had been played with, transforming her into a more of a porcelain doll, the white hospital gown hanging off of her almost bleated with her skin. I took notice of the curve in her jawline, brand new green eyes instead of the steel pipe stained scarlet clutched in her fist. May caught my gaze, doing her best to hide the pipe. Noah ducked to pull the scalpel from the dead woman's throat, wiping it on his pants, and then jumped to his feet, flashing me a grin. Yo! His gaze flicked to Eris like a disapproving dad. He scowled. What the hell, dude? We leave you for five minutes and you go on a killing spree? Eris folded his arms. It was necessary, he said, pulling us into a run. As usual, Eris led, Noah at his side. I stumbled alongside them. We reached a door and he held up the ID tag he'd stolen. Thankfully, the light flashed green. We've got to get out of here before they bring out their secret weapon. The roof is ten floors up, and I only took out the guards on this level. May swung the pipe, bringing up the rear. How many? Too many, Noah said. The three's synergy took me off guard. May acted as a guard. She walked slowly, scanning every corner for pursuers. When I stepped in front of a camera, she grabbed my shoulders gently and shoved me forwards, urging me to run. Eris tossed the ID tag to Noah, and he caught it, throwing it over his neck. Another door opened, and we slid through. Eris was already ahead, out of breath. So are you ever going to tell us about what happened in the factory? May kept to his side, throwing open a fire door. You really want to do this now? Well, yeah, if she's the only one who remembers. Noah scoffed. I think it's pretty obvious she has no idea who we are. Stop. The small voice crackling through overhead speakers brought us to a standstill, jerking back in our strings. I thought they were gone, but sure enough, there they were, bleeding from my arms and legs, holding us in place. We did stop, our bodies freezing, bobbing along on scarlet strings. The little girl's breathing was labored, her sobs pulling me left to right. I want you to stop, she gritted out, and Noah dropped to the floor. I want you to stop moving, to stop breathing, to stop, stop, stop. A tantrum filled my skull, 
severing control over my body. I felt my knees hit hard marble. All of the breath sucked from my lungs. The sound of heavy footsteps flooded my ears and I was limp, my head hanging, my body more of a marionette in a stranger's arms. Speak, the girl mumbled, and my mouth opened, my lips painfully coming apart to mimic her exact words. In the corner of my eye, the others were doing the same. I belong to Marin, the creator of Middleview, the girl cried and so did my mouth. I belong to Marin, the creator of Middleview. I will not try to escape again. My teeth clashed together, mimicking hers. I will not try to escape again. If I do, I will become a real doll. If I do, I will become a real doll. She paused. Look at me. I want you to look at me. My head snapped up, my gaze trained on the camera blinking down at us. You're too old, our puppeteer grumbled. I liked you at first because you are like the, my older brothers and, and sisters and bit inside my puppet show. But there's one teensy problem. I was pulled forward, my head snapping back. The middle view four are always teenagers. Eris dropped to his knees. They never grow up. May was tossed to the side. They stay in middle view and solve mysteries forever and ever and stay best friends until the end of time. She let out a giggle that chilled me to the bone. So you're not going to grow up. I'm going to make you into real puppets, and you're going to stay in middle view forever. Doesn't that sound like fun? One of us tried to escape, tried to tear from their strings. I had no idea who it was, but if I could guess by the sharp hiss next to me, it was the mayor's son. Noah was yanked back, and so were the rest of us. She screamed in frustration, her fingers tightening around our strings. Don't leave me. The little girl started to cry and something warm hit my cheek. Rain. It ran down my brand new face, trickling into my mouth. The rain tasted like salt. Why do you always try to leave me? She sobbed. I don't want you to leave. Rain. Rain took me back to a car ride down a seemingly endless road. Streetlights dancing in my eyes and a starless sky. The memory was familiar by now. I was curled up watching raindrops thunder against the glass of my window when my mother stopped singing, her fingers retracting from the third passenger's hand. In flashes of consciousness, the figure in the front seat fell limp, their head hanging forward. Mom gently coaxed their shoulder against the pane. I half wondered if she had drugged them too. I slept for a while my body heavy from the drugs turning my brain to mush. In intervals, loud noises woke me up, only for the gentle lull of the car to send me falling. Mom continued to sing to the two of us, her soft voice swaying me into slumber. The slam of a car door woke me up, my eyes flying open. I was drooling on the window, a thin line of saliva sliding down my chin. Twisting my head to the left, it was my door that had slammed shut. Mom was back in her seat, bone to her ear. Blinking rapidly through a thick layer of fog, I noticed the passenger seat was empty. I have Peter Young, Mom said, glancing at the rearview mirror. I dropped my head to pretend I was sleeping, but Mom wasn't checking on me. It took me a disorienting moment for my heavy thoughts to untangle. There was something pressed against me, a heavy weight lying over my legs. The third passenger was a guy. In the corner of my eye, the figure was twisted like a pretzel, their head uncomfortably pressed against the right window, while I took the left. Yes, he's still attached, Mom said, but my gaze found slimy strings still clinging to him, wrapped around his arms and legs. With him so close, I could almost pretend he was still human. But then I saw the back of his head, a shallow mess of strings bound around his spine and Something acidic slithered up my throat. I turned away from him. I didn't want to know who it was. Whoever it was. They were no longer who I remembered them as. I felt sick. My stomach twisting. The hollowed out shell of one of the middle view four was lying lifeless over my legs. And I couldn't move to squirm away from them. Mom sighed. I just want your promise that my daughter will stay out of whatever game you're playing. Her tone hardened. I cut him down earlier. Yes, Marin figured it out. Mom snorted out a laugh. 
How am I supposed to track her movements? She's 23. Mom was seemingly cut off, letting out a frustrated hiss. No, I, I told you my daughter is no longer a part of it. If I have to, I will move her across the country. Her fingers tightened around the wheel. Yes, I'm serious. I have Peter Young. Take him or leave him. Mom swerved right, avoiding an oncoming truck, its headlights searing my eyes. Mm, well, that's your problem. No, I'm, I'm not negotiating. If you want Peter, I'm about ten minutes away. I gave him enough R95 so he's not going to be any trouble. Yes, I can confirm he's just a doll. I don't think he's fully conscious. Mom was cut off again, her fingers growing white around the wheel. Delaney wants inside her head. He's in charge of finding the missing kid, and Marin will be the first person on his list. Block my number after this meeting. When she ended the call, Mom slammed her fists into the wheel and the third passenger jolted, their legs stretching out. It was a lot more human than I'd realized. I didn't think puppets had leg cramps. I don't know how much time passed before I roused again. This time the car had stopped. Rain was slamming against the window, but this time I could feel it soaking my hair and cheek. I was curled into the seat, my head pressed into rich smelling leather. The car door was open, an icy breeze lashing against my cheeks and blowing my hair back. Mom was leaning over me, wrapping her arms around the third passenger scooping the shell of a boy into her embrace. Cold. The soft croak dragged me out of slumber. I knew who it was, but I couldn't move. His voice was a hollowed out cry. I couldn't call it human his mouth jerking left to right, still on strings. Why am I... cold? Mom didn't react, squeezing the boy to her chest. I'm so... cold. His voice whipped around in the wind, but I still heard it loud and clear, a human cry clinging onto long, dead flesh. Kill... me. She turned and strode directly into the downpour, the lifeless shell of my best friend hanging limp in her arms. Everything that had been him, illuminated and passing headlights whizzing past us. There was something wet in my lap. Strings. I held them up, dangling them between my fingers. My body was moving before I consciously knew what I was doing. Slipping out of the car, I fell directly onto my knees. I was still made of lead, my limbs heavy. I could see Mom's figure through half-lidded eyes, Lashes of rain gluing my hair to my face. She came to an abrupt stop suddenly, as if someone was pulling her strings. Followed by the crack of a gunshot piercing the night. I remembered blindly crawling until my hands were damp, palms pressed into warm scarlet seeping across the road. Mom's eyes found me in the dark, wide and slightly manic. She had already wiped her hands on the front of her shirt, red smears decorating the seam. Her mouth formed a smile, and I was already stumbling back. See, Marin? Mom's voice rattled in my skull. She started forwards, wrapping her around me. Everything is going to be okay, she hummed. I got rid of the bad people. You're safe now. Back in the present, I was choking up bloody strings, my imaginary version of the mayor's son still hovering over me. It took me a moment to anchor myself, grabbing toilet paper and pressing it to my nose and mouth. Wow. Noah was back, less shadowy and more himself. He inclined his head, a swath of reddish curls slipping over his eyes. You don't look so good. What I knew for sure was Dr. Delaney was after the memory of the car ride, and I had no doubt he would be pursuing me again. There was no point in telling Noah. He was my subconscious. He'd seen it too. The mayor's son had seen everything, from our attempted escape to the car ride revealing the identity of the puppet cut from their strings. Still, though, I couldn't get it out of my head that something was off about them. So I asked him again, applying pressure to my nose. Why do you keep getting older? Noah's lips curled into a smirk. He folded his arms. You're a member of the Middle View Four, he teased. You've brought down first grade milk thieves, druggy janitors, and evil teacher cults who brought the world crashing down. When it caught his eye, he pressed a finger to his lips. That's a spoiler, Noah chuckled. Anyway, you've been solving mysteries since we were little kids and you still haven't figured it out yet? 
Before I could open my mouth, he continued, bouncing on his heels. He was enjoying this. You still can't solve the mystery of who we are. I felt something comfortable again, reveling in the warm light around my mother's lamp. Comfortable enough to hit him in the chest, which felt real. Noah settled me with a pitiful smile. You just technically hit yourself. I ignored him. You say it like it's easy. It is easy, he rolled his eyes. You're not much of a detective, are you? You sound pissed. I am pissed. You call yourself a detective and yet you ignore clues literally right in front of you. It's screaming at you right in the face and you turn your head and pretend to be oblivious. Noah's eyes drank me in, enveloped in darkness I was yet to know and understand. Are you scared? Noah stepped closer. Is that why you're choosing to be ignorant? Things are falling into place, but something tells me you don't want them to fall into place. For the first time in your life, you would rather the mystery of yourself and us remain unsolved. You killed those townspeople, I said. Why? I don't know, Marin. I'm not real. I tried again. Who is Peter Young? How am I supposed to know? It's your memory. Harsh. Eris was leaning against the door, his arms folded. These guys had a habit of appearing out of nowhere, bleeding into my line of vision. Eris blew hair out of his eyes. Can't you go a little easier on her? You're acting like memory diving and casually hallucinating your dead friends who don't make any sense is an everyday thing. It's the truth. She's scared. Leave her alone, May mumbled from her place on the floor. She was sorting through the avalanche of papers knocked onto the carpet. She looked up shooting them both death glares. She has a lot of crap to process, idiots. Noah blew a raspberry. Uh, yeah, such as the ever-growing question of who we are. There's one in particular that's driving her mad, but she's ignoring it. He was taking the words right out of my mouth. Noah Presley was fluctuating the more I got to know the memories of him, his eyes growing increasingly more void. Ever since the broken jigsaw pieces in my head started to fit together, I'd been growing more anxious of my own identity, and who the four of us really were. They were dead, puppets on strings in a stage play. Over the last few days, more and more details were sliding into place, puzzle pieces I wish wouldn't fit, closer to the truth, closer to the identity of the boy in my mother's car who she saved, closer to the questions behind them, being dead at fifteen, and yet I had seen them a lot older covered in blood and armed with scissors. My imaginary friends couldn't decide on what age they were. There! Noah's voice surprised me. He was watching me, head cocked to the side. The mayor's son was thinking ahead as usual. He was already joining the dots. He leaned forward and blew in my face, that infuriating smile growing. That's what's driving you mad, Marin. And it's scaring you too, because realistically... How possible is it for three 15-year-olds to be killed, turned into mindless dolls, and then appear in your memories grown up? Noah followed my gaze. Oh, you have questions. You don't want to ask them. The boy jutted his chin. You know what I'm talking about, right? I did. Eris. Inside the room, drenched in red, he said something that stuck inside my head. May held up a crumpled piece of paper. It was the list of subjects. Zip it, Presley. Do you want to screw with her head even more? She jumped to her feet. So we're all agreeing that these are the kids responsible for all of this. Eris nodded slowly. Makes sense. These little brats wanted dolls and we were all they had. May perched herself on Mom's desk. Okay, so we start there. She nodded to me. The girl in your memory. May inclined her head. What did she do? Noah folded his arms when I choked on my response. See? She doesn't want to talk about the elephant in the room. Elephant? May frowned. I knew what he was talking about, but getting to that can of worms could wait. I've got this, Eris announced, standing over me. It's just a matter of asking her questions that ignite memories. I read about it in a book. The boy turned back to me, cracking his knuckles. His smile was reassuring, but Eris Kane was just my subconscious, and my subconscious was demanding answers. 
Okay, so tell me about what we did in our last semester of high school. Noah's head snapped up. Seriously? Seriously. Eris ignored his glare. We want to know who we are, right? The mayor's son looked comfortable leaning his head against the wall. Well, yeah. He did the scrunchy nose thing he did when he was trying to be pedantic. But isn't that too pushy? Says the guy who was grilling her to take another deep dive. May chuckled, flicking through one of Mom's books. Eris sighed. Like I said, I've got this. He twisted to me like I was his test subject. Senior year, what did we do? I had to swallow sour paste. Is that a trick question? Nope. I was aware of May and Noah's gazes burning into my back. Nothing, I said, my gut twisting into knots. Mom took me away this summer before sophomore year. You died and they brought you back as those things. Thinking back, I was hounded by the memory of being paralyzed in my mom's car. Bloody strings slipping through my fingers. A heavy weight across my legs. Eris held my gaze, his expression crumpling. It looked like he might say something before he snorted, dancing back. Jeez, when you put it like that, it sounds super depressing. Yes, but she's not answering your question. Noah was suddenly directly in front of me. In overexposed light, his hair resembled fire licking across his forehead. Yeah, yeah, we were brought back and turned into dolls. We've been through all of that a thousand times. He held up his index. But you're missing one vital detail. You, I said. What you did the night we searched the string factory. Noah's lips pricked. He raised a brow, lowering his voice. Oh, now you're blaming me? You really don't want to talk about the elephant, huh? Stepping back, he winked at me. Suit yourself. You remembered most of the car rides, so you just need to think and stop dwelling on the past, right? In the corner of my eye, a shadow hung from the ceiling. Blood seeped across the floor, pooling on my mom's desk. Eris let out a sharp hiss, May squeaking, lifting her feet up on the desk. Tipping his head back, Noah blinked through sharp red dripping onto his face trickling down his cheek, just like when we found May. When the light caught his face, bringing his eyes to life, he was wearing his crown again. This crown was different from what I remembered, when he was gutted by the cult of kids. Noah's corpse wore a crown of entwined daisies as a way of declaring him no longer an omen. This one was made of blood-stained roses, a crown of glass and thorns. The boy whipped it off his head with a scowl, straightening up. That's what I mean by dwelling on the past. Nice crown, Eris chuckled. Meanwhile, I was turned into hamburger helper. It's all yours. Noah threw it at the boy who caught it, placing it on his head. No offense, but I would rather be dragged through a meat grinder than be the so-called king of a cult run by our psychotic superfan. You're just saying that. No, I'm serious. I would rather be torn apart than be a midsummer knockoff. I was dragged through spinning blades. You got impaled by a tree branch. Turning my attention away from their argument, I noticed the panel on the hidden door had changed. May appeared next to me with a smile. A keypad. She poked it. What are the chances of the code being 1234? Eris joined us, examining the keypad for himself. Huh. This thing seems to be both manual and biometric. If we go in there, there's a chance of it automatically locking us in. He shot me a grin. We did get locked inside the freezer in Lady Croft's mansion when we stupidly thought it was a good hiding place. But it's worth a try, right? Noah threw a screwed up piece of paper at him. There's a 100% chance that door is armed. Also, we got hypothermia and almost died, genius. Eris tipped his head back. So what do you propose we do? You heard Marin's mom. Delaney is coming back for her. Yeah, that was at the back of my mind. I'm still scared he's going to come back. Noah grinned. We meditate. What? Relax. I read about it in a book. He mocked Eris's accent. Eris threw a book at him and he easily dodged it. Noah situated himself in front of me, pressing his fingers to my temples, his eyes flickering shut. Just relax, okay? We can try going through your memories at your own pace and not whatever the hell Delaney did to you. That's your idea of meditating? May raised a brow. Noah cracked one eye open. 
It's all I got. His touch was familiar, strong enough to pull me back. Back to being tied, back to back with Noah, inside a ticking time bomb. The case that twisted both boys out of shape and brought our painful reality crashing down on us. What I am guessing led Noah to become the infamous Middle View Strings murderer, something I really do not want to see. I'm terrified of seeing who he really is. Case 11. The Disappearance and Subsequent Brainwashing of Eris Kane. However, before I allowed myself to plunge, the question that had been haunting my mind finally slammed into me. Eris? The boy inclined his head. Yeah. I was already speaking before I could help it, my tongue tangling. You've been inside my memories asking me the same question. What happened in the strings factory? You guys keep asking me the same questions, creeping into my head to try and get answers. But you want answers of your own that have nothing to do with my subconscious. You asked me about senior year, but we never had one. You told me I had a panic attack during my exam, but you died at 15 years old. Eris rolled his eyes. Thank you for once again reminding me of my ultimate demise. Noah groaned, tipping his head back. Let her talk. No, I said. Well, yes, you're dead. I saw you carved into a child's puppet. Thanks. I swallowed. It felt like the penultimate part of the mystery when I was piecing things together. Noah was usually the one who said the speech, joining all the dots and ripping off the metaphorical mask. I could sense the boy watching me closely, mouth curled. I swore every time I looked away from the mayor's son, his eyes were growing darker, more hollow, like he was waiting for something. But you remember a senior year when I had that panic attack. You remember being 17 years old. Which means... May slowly got to her feet, her eyes widening. We know what it means. It's obvious. What we need to figure out is how it's possible. Leaning against the wall, Noah wasn't smiling. I could almost mistake his expression for pain. Somehow, our fourth member grew up. I was never called Marin. Marin was the name given to me by my creator. Long before I was put on my strings, I was nothing but an empty shell lying on a slab of metal under a stark white light. I began my second life with foggy thoughts and no real memory. I had no name, nothing to cling on to. Did I have family? Friends? I reached out for anything that would answer who I was. That part of me no longer existed. What did exist, half cast in shadows, was my creator. A small figure looming over me, admiring her creation. I had no mouth to scream with. I still existed in pieces. Each part of me scattered across the metal slab like a conveyor belt. I envied my creator's ability to laugh while my body was detached from me. I hated that she could move while I was paralyzed, a shell without thought and memory. The little girl was rosy cheeks and blonde curls, a mask hiding her smile. I knew it was there. I could see it pinched between the folds, a triumphant grin while I struggled to move my limbs. I didn't have any. I didn't have limbs I could sense. Limbs that were mine. Only limbs that were phantom, that weren't supposed to belong to me. I knew I had them at some point. I was brought into the concrete room whole and was hollowed out, body and mind. The little girl had two glass eyes pinched between her fingers. One was green, the other blue. Which one do you like? She asked. I like blue, but I think green would suit you more. I want your eyes to sparkle. Damn little brat, was my mind's response to her words. Though I wasn't sure of who this body used to belong to, whose words burned on my new lips, twisted into alphabet soup in my throat. My thoughts were hers to play with, and my body was hers to mold. My real eyes weren't pretty enough, according to the swimming figures in blue appearing and disappearing in my vision. They were like ghosts, bleeding in and out of reality, their voices low mumbles working under my creator's instructions. When she pointed to my head, they stabbed into my eyelid with a marker pen. I want her eyes wider. I was conscious enough to feel the cruel prick of their scalpel delving into my flesh. They took away my arms and stitched on new ones, 
marking and penciling what was to be ripped apart and stitched back together, this time with pretty legs and arms and a pretty face. When I screamed, or tried to, the masked figures ignored me, dragging their silver blades down my body, picking and choosing which parts of me they would keep, and which parts they would cut away. The eyes that I was born with were not beautiful enough. Like the rest of me, they had been marked to be scooped out, circled as flaws with bright red pen, the same shade of what seeps out of me, slithering red strings that entangle inside me, and pool across cold metal, as if replacing my blood. I knew my blood still existed. It was all around me, a sharp red halo gluing my not-body to the table. Consciousness existed in flashes. I blinked, and I had a new mouth, raw stitches still stinging when I parted perfected lips and cried out. My creator was still there, a blur of blonde curls hanging over me. Her eyes raked up and down my new body. Marin, she whispered in a hysterical giggle, while I blinked my new eyes. They didn't feel any different. Was I beautiful now? Is that why my creator was smiling behind her mask? I'm going to call you Marin, and you're going to solve mysteries with the middle view four. I couldn't move to struggle or part my lips to protest. When she wrenched my head up, narrow fingers grabbing hold of my scalp, my body was limp like a doll, being forced to sit up while the rest of me, my arms and legs, were still strapped down. Through tunnel vision, I was aware I was inside a large concrete room, almost like a workshop. There were four separate metal slabs, including mine. In the corner of my eye, sharp red splattered across the walls and floor, severed body parts and dripping red. The room was full of doll pieces, heads and arms and legs, eyes filling plastic jars and bloody red strings hanging from monsters made of metal. But my creator didn't want me to see any of that. She didn't want me to feel fear yet. Though my mind was still mine, even if it had been wiped clean of any personality I had, she couldn't cut out fear completely, because even with a new body, even with a transformed brain choked and filled with strings, I was still scared. When I tried to peer further into the shadow, my head was forcibly snapped to the left. No, Marin, you're not allowed to look over there, she chastised me. I want you to look over here. Again, she twisted my head the sound of my spine snapping in place. I followed her gaze. The middle of you four? The little girl squeaked. Marin, look, I've made you friends. Friends. Noah Presley, she said in a sing-song. He's the funny one. He's been your bestest friend since the first grade. He also gives you butterflies, but you don't like him until you're grown up. Illuminated in hellish scarlet light, a male torso was strapped to a metal table, straining against Velcro straps pinning him down. There was so much red, so much tangled string pouring from him. Unlike the others, he was conscious, lips cruelly stitched together. All I could hear was an agonizing moan begging for death. With a twist of her wrist, my creator jerked my head away from him. I blinked, something in my head shattering, coming apart. The second metal bed was filled with mismatched body parts. Eris Kane, she giggled. The smart one. Eris is the fourth and last member. I could see a headless torso bleeding red strings, almost like it was piecing the body back together, but this time in a whole new light, in his creator's favor. And May Lee. She's the pretty one, and she's the strongest. May proves herself to be the bestest. She's always saving Noah when he gets kidnapped. This time, I could move my own body, finding the last bed of metal. All I could see was a halo of red seeping around a motionless figure, pooling onto the floor. I blinked slowly, and my creator was in my face again. May is not finished yet, she said in a sigh. But when she is, she's going to be the prettiest doll in the whole wide world. Finally, she turned to me. Marin? My creator's shriek was muffled under her mask. She pulled it down in what was underneath. What she'd been hiding behind sent me retching back, control bleeding back into my grasp. My creator didn't have a mouth. 
The laugh that escaped her came from somewhere else. A deep, dark cavern where this little girl became something else entirely. She was half of a little girl, while the rest of her face was nothing, inky black oblivion staring back at me. Her mask snapped back into place, eyes narrowing. She grabbed me by my hair, her fingers curling into my scalp, wrenching my head back. You get to be the leader of the middle of you four, and the prettiest and smartest of them all. My creator with no mouth leaned forward, whispering in my ear. Me. The little girl's words jolted me back to reality. That was new. I hadn't seen that before. The memory was sharp and new. A whole other part of me I didn't know or understand. Slamming into me like a wave of ice water, it was enough to pull me back, enough to bring back my senses. I could taste blood in my mouth and feel tough rope wrapped around my wrists. I didn't remember being captured by Delaney, but I was half aware of words creeping into my mind, clammy fingers pressing pressure to my temples. There was no sign of the others. The figments of my imagination bearing my best friend's faces were gone. Go deeper. The voice pierced through me, reality bleeding through. I was aware I was sitting on a chair, my head bowed, my arms pinned behind me. When my head fell limp, blood pouring from my nose, he forced me to look up, but I couldn't see anything. I was blind, plunging and tangled in memories being forcibly brought to the surface. I want you to explore every crevice, the voice ordered. Kill her if you have to. I have orders to locate the boy inside her memories. Alice in Tibet has him. Delaney pressed harder, and I resisted a shriek. How was I captured? The thought itself was painful, warm red seeping from my nose. The pressure on my brain was making it increasingly harder to think straight. My memories were tangled and wrong like they had been intentionally placed out of order. I remembered being inside my mother's office, slumped on a beanbag, the others standing around me. Maybe it was just my eyes, but my imaginary friends were blurring in and out of view. Eris leaned against the bookcase, his arms folded, while May perched on my mother's desk, flicking through paperwork. Noah was sitting cross-legged on the floor, tracing the sheepskin rug with his finger. I had to squint to see May swinging legs, her pigtails shrouded in darkness. I was losing them. That was my first thought. The more I discovered about them, these footprints of them I had had created were slowly fading away. It was dark outside, and that nothingness, that creeping oblivion, was enveloping itself around them. Relax, Eris finally spoke up, lips curving into a smile. He caught my eye. We're not fading away, moron. You're not talking to us. I frowned. Talking to you? Yeah, he rolled his eyes. You need to actually talk to us, Marin. When you're lost in thought, we get lost too. I lifted my head, surprised when his face lit up in bright light once again, color seeping back into his hair. He was right. Ever since I brought up the question of who he was and why he remembered being 17 years old despite dying at 15, I had lost myself in my own mind, and just like my plunging thoughts, the middle view four were fading too. It was like I was carving him back into reality, my mind picking and choosing which heiress I wanted. I chose what I had been holding on to, our summer before sophomore year, when his hair was a clumsy mess, he had to keep blowing out of his eyes, the summer I lost him. May nodded, her eyes glued to a blue file resting on her knee. She was wearing her usual shorts and t-shirt, her pigtails sitting loose on her shoulders. If you're not talking to us, we'll disappear. She shot me a smile, tucking a strand of hair behind her ear. Think of us like fairy tales, but hey, it's not like you can't imagine us back into existence. Fairy tales? Eris raised a brow, his gaze glued to the ceiling. We're not Santa Claus, May. He frowned, his expression twisting. Ha. Huh. There's a, a ceiling tile that's slightly out of place. May cocked her head. Meaning? Eris grabbed a chair and jumped on it, his arms windmilling. I don't know yet. Uh, May, can you hold my legs? The girl slid off the table, shooting him a disapproving look. You're going to fall. Not if you hold my legs. 
Eris said, standing on his tiptoes. Okay, so what were we talking about before Marin had a brain blank? You? Noah mumbled, still tracing lines into the floor, chin resting on his fist. You don't make any sense. Eris blew a raspberry. Well, neither do you. He shot back, almost toppling off the chair. May wrapped her arms around his legs. I need to remind you that it was all of us with fluctuating ages. We saw you as a grown-up, too. Eris's words snapped something inside of my mind. He was right. I did see all of them when I was hopped up on wacky gas. The mayor's son stood up. That still doesn't explain why you remember being 17 years old, he said, running a hand through his hair. Noah turned to Eris. You specifically remember Marin having a panic attack in your car. You did breathing exercises. He trailed off, twisting to the other boy. What are you doing? I said, I'm checking the ceiling, Eris said, swinging on the chair. Noah stepped in front of me, his eyes pinched around the edges. I have been enveloped in mysteries for the first 15 years of my life, and yet the mayor's son was an enigma I couldn't solve. I noticed his face was cast in shadow too, his hair swallowed by shadows fighting to envelop him completely. I reveled in his reddish curls still catching the light. He was still real, still standing in front of me, the shadow of the boy I was clinging on to. You're running away from that question again, Marin. Noah sounded bored. His expression was hard, paralyzing me to the spot. He cocked his head, feigning confusion. I could sense him delving inside my mind, searching for those missing puzzle pieces I didn't want to find. Why are you refusing to acknowledge it? Before I could speak, he took a step closer, his breath in my face. It felt real. Noah Presley was still stepping on my toes, just like he did when we were kids. I missed the mischief in his eyes, the Noah I had imagined before my memories were pillaged. This Noah was different. Hollow eyes and, and twisted lips that knew something I didn't, which didn't make sense because he was my subconscious. My subconscious wasn't supposed to know more than me. Do you trust me? He murmured. No, I didn't trust the boy who was supposed to be a memory. A footprint left in sand. He wasn't supposed to have his own questions that I was avoiding. Yes? Noah smirked. The old him slowly bleeding back into his expression. He knew I didn't trust him, and I think he was enjoying it. I think you did this, he said softly. Another step and he was directly in my face. You're the one who did this to all of us, and you're running away from your own guilt. Something sickly crept up in my throat. His words were my own silent accusation, what I was trying to suppress. When we tried to escape, I heard my own name over the intercom. The memory was vivid and clear. I couldn't have imagined it. Noah was standing on my toes, rocking back and forth on his heels. He was following my every thought, and just like his younger self, the mayor's son was picking at every detail. Noah Presley was a good detective. He raised his voice, his eyes never leaving mine, like he was waiting for a reaction. I think you're our puppeteer, he hummed. They took away your memories because you did this to us. Wait, what? Eris jumped off of the chair. You think Marin did this to herself? Noah shrugged. She shares the same name as the brat behind this. You saw the memory. That doesn't mean she kidnapped herself and put herself on strings. Both of you shut up, May hissed out excitedly, waving a scrap of paper. I think I found something. The boys exchanged glances before joining her, peering over May's shoulder. Eris tried to snatch it to read it himself, Noah elbowing him out of the way. I was already staring down at the scrunched up letter in her hand. Dear Allie, May read out loud, following my gaze, skimming the letter. Allie, that's her mom, right? Eris whispered, leaning closer. Congratulations, idiot. You stated the obvious. Noah grumbled, shoving him. Ow! Eris shoved him back. Your elbows are pointy, moron. Anyway, May let out a hiss of exasperation, her gaze on the note. It says, the middle view four must continue. If not, people will be at risk. Good people, Allie. They will not survive a tantrum. I know you don't want to hurt them at the 
detriment of keeping your daughter safe. You know what Marin gets like when she does not get what she wants. Caravel is on my back too, about payment. Your daughter will be safe. Marin has zero intention to hurt her. I can promise that. May's sharp intake of breath sent shivers down my spine. I hope this is the last time I will be contacting you. Yikes, Eris murmured. That sounds like a polite threat. Who the hell is Caraval? All the best, I read. A. May glanced at me. Do you know of an A? I opened my mouth to respond when something tickled the back of my nose and throat. It was... sweet. Eris's head snapped up, his nose flaring. Ah. He slammed his sleeve over his nose, his gaze flicking to the ceiling. The words were already slamming into me, but my mind was growing foggy, my thoughts disjointed. In a way, it was comforting to feel like we were back in Middleview solving mysteries. The boys' voice was fading in and out. I knew there was something wrong with the ceiling, he hissed. This place is extra security. Noah stepped back, covering his own nose and mouth. Set by your mother? May was grabbing my shoulders and shoving me backwards, her eyes wide. The drug won't affect us, she said in a breath, but it will knock you out. You need to get out of here, okay? Run! I managed two heavy strides towards the door, before my imaginary friends were bleeding away, and I was on my knees, my thoughts dancing. Time fluctuated. I was lying on my stomach, giggling to myself imagining the mayor's son hanging upside down above me when heavy footsteps strode into the room. Noah Presley looked funny upside down. When the man accompanying Dr. Delaney stamped on my hand, reality lurched to fruition and Noah disappeared, bursting into twinkling stars with each one going supernova. I was violently pulled to unsteady feet, a voice clanging around in my skull. Tie her up. Presently, I was still reeling from the memory. Dr. Delaney showed me the start of me. The creation lying under bright light, a little girl's fantasy brought to life. He showed me who I was before Marin's pretty doll. I didn't realize I was desperate for him to continue digging into those splinters of me until I stopped fighting his mental grip, allowing him to slip effortlessly inside my mind, cracking his way into my skull and dragging me into oblivion. Down, down down. The physical pull jolted my brain, rivulets of warmth running from my nose. Noah was gone with the others, but if he was standing there, he would be thinking the exact same thing. The mayor's son wanted answers, and I had seen the start of them, the start of us. Go deeper. I imagined his voice in my ear, ice-cold breath tickling my face. Show me who I was. Kill her if you have to, the man ordered Dr. Delaney, pricking me back to consciousness. I was still tied to the chair, my head lolling, my mouth filled with blood. I want you to go deeper, look into everything, every crevice. Delaney cleared his throat, releasing pressure slightly. Sir, the girl is needed for this stage show. We can't kill her. Well, make her bleed, the voice ordered. Alice in Tibet breached contract and took more than one kid. I want you to make her understand that there is no way out and no home to go back to. Make her wish she was dead. No. The words slipped from my lips in a sob. I waited for May's hand to find mine, for Eris to tell me everything was going to be okay, and Noah to grumble something along the lines of, chill out but they were gone. Dr. Delaney's presence had swallowed them up, bringing me back to reality, where I was alone. The pressure intensified. I could feel the buildup in my skull, a sharp pain rattling my head. Delaney seemed to know exactly how to pick through my mind carefully, ignoring insignificant memories, delving deeper into what had been suppressed. I was screaming, hunched over in the chair, when a memory hit me. This one, though, it was like warm water washing over me. It was raining. I could feel raindrops splashing down on my face, a sharp gust of wind blowing my ponytail back. 
It was pitch black and I was scaling a clock tower, attached to a harness, my hands gripping the wire for dear life. Digging my shoes into rough brick, I swallowed a shriek and tipped my head back, drinking in our little town. Nothing but speckled lights and towering buildings. Whoa. Straightening up, I yanked the wire. Long way down. Hey! I looked up, rain sliding down my cheeks. I could just about see a figure leaning over the edge, dark brown hair spiraling into the wind. He cupped his mouth, though I knew he was grinning. Didn't I tell you not to look down? Pull me up, I squeaked, swinging back and forth, testing my foothold. What? Tipping my head back, three figures stood on the edge, peering down at me. I said, pull me up. Drop you? Oh, okay then, have fun. I was falling then, plunging down, my breath catching in my throat. I managed to swing back, slamming my feet into brick. The world jolted and I let out a shuddery breath, throwing my head back. Moron, I gritted out. You love me, babe. Irrelevant. Dr. Delaney's voice pulled me from the memory, dragging me further down, straight into light. I blinked. No. Camera flashes. I was on stage facing a swath of students wearing graduation gowns. The others stood by my side, their heads bowed. To my right, a much older Noah wearing a suit. A graduation cap, sitting on overgrown reddish curls. Eris and May were next to him. May's hair was tied into a ponytail, enveloped in a silky white gown. Her beauty was already turning heads. Eris's curls were darker, a shorter and maturer style hiding under his cap. May reached for my hand, squeezing for dear life. I can't believe this is happening, she breathed. We were graduating. Stop smiling, heads down. There was a woman standing in front of us, pinched eyes, a scowl curled on her lips. Principal Clay. In her hands were our diplomas. She was holding them a little too tight. I didn't realize I was laughing until Eris nudged me, May placing a manicured hand over her mouth. The principal paced up and down our line, her heels click-clacking. What do you have to say for yourselves? I bowed my head, squeezing my fingers between the folds of my dress. When none of us responded, she made a scoffing noise. If it were up to me, none of your little gang would be graduating this year. Clay spat into her microphone. You kids have made a mockery of our school. She ignored the eruption of cheers from the crowd, her cheeks smoldering red. I don't think the four of you deserve to walk with the Chesterwick High Class of 2019. Noah stepped forward, a smile dancing on his mouth. But, he chuckled, and the three of us had to drag him back. She cleared her throat. Mr. Carrington, you may laugh now, but where exactly do you see yourself in five years' time? I knew it, May muttered in my ear. This isn't a celebration, she gestured to the rest of our confused class sitting in front of us. This is a humiliation. Noah shrugged, another camera flash blinding me. He flung his arms around us. I don't know, man. Probably still screwing around with these idiots. His smile widened when she shot him a death glare. Or maybe I'll be dead. Clay nodded. Interesting, she told the audience. No career aspects? The crowd went silent. You are an embarrassment to our school and town she spat, continuing to pace up and down our line. I could feel my cheeks heating up. When exactly do you plan on growing up? Noah's eyes darkened, his lips curling. He scoffed and took the mic, wrenching it from the woman's grasp when she tried to pull it back. He turned toward the senior class, flashing them a grin. Hey there, you all know me as... Mr. Carrington, the principal attempted to snatch the mic from him. If you do not give me that microphone... Relax, I just want to say something. He pulled it from her, dancing back. Please, he mocked into the mic, the crowd giggling. Principal Clay took a step back. Be quick. Aw, oh, hell, Eris said. He's going to screw us. Hey, with all due respect, Mrs. C, Noah said into the microphone, the sheriff department are corrupt pieces of garbage, and the majority of them are in our psycho elder's pocket. Noah winked, gesturing to the mayor himself sitting at the front. This one's for you, Mayor Caravelle. He spun to the red-faced teacher, his dark eyes challenging her to argue. 
Maybe if the police department actually did their jobs, a group of children wouldn't have to help them. Eris poked me with his diploma, his eyes wide. What did he drink? May pulled her graduation cap over her face. He told me he was nervous. That's nerves? Eris whisper shrieked. But what would I know, huh? Noah boomed into the mic. He turned back to the murmuring audience. Mayor Caravelle had disappeared from his seat. I'm just a stupid kid, he laughed. I don't know anything. Like, for example, how would I know that our... Eris yanked the boy back into line, violently this time. Shut up, he said under his breath. Do you want to get us killed? We all knew exactly what he was going to say. Principal Clay somehow kept a neutral expression. With her being among the corrupt, her cheeks had gone deathly pale. She took the mic back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carrington, for that wonderfully imaginative speech, she said through a sharp breath. I do not know how you managed to stay in classes while turning our town into your own personal playground, but you did. She handed me my diploma. Her smile gritted. Congratulations. The applause didn't last long. When I was admiring my diploma, the crowd of students parted down the middle, the town sheriff stepping onto the stage. Eris stumbled back and was quickly grabbed, his arms wrenched behind his back. Noah didn't even try to get away, holding out his wrists to be cuffed. I'm not even going to say it, kids. Sheriff Hammond was definitely enjoying his little speech. He cuffed me easily, his meaty hands wrapping around mine. His fingernails digging into my flesh told me he knew we were aware of his little side hustle. When he grabbed May, his fingers exploring her lower back, I had to bite back my shriek. You're all 18 now, which means you're responsible for the multiple misdemeanors over the years. As he cuffed each of us, Sheriff Hammond left his mark. His gritty fingernails stuck into my skin, lingering on May's back, prodding into Eris's spine, and wrenching Noah by his hair. He was sending a message, and we were receiving it loud and clear. To the audience, the man was being gentle, maybe even kind. But I could hear the satisfaction in his voice when May let out a squeak. You may think it's cute, stealing from town elders and calling yourselves detectives. However, breaking and entering is still a crime and I have no choice but to arrest you for as adults. The air seemed to still, the silence so thick I thought I was going to suffocate. I will pay their bail in advance, a woman's voice spoke up. When the four of us twisted around, a figure stood among the crowd. I couldn't see her face, only a silk blue dress and heels. She stayed in the shadows, her voice a hypnotic murmur. I will also pay for anything they have stolen or broken. Deeper, Delaney's voice pulled the memory forward, like rewinding a tape. We were sitting in our local coffee shop. The place was empty, except an old couple sitting behind us. It was two weeks after we were bailed out, and the night after our senior graduation party. I was nervously sipping on iced tea, still wearing my dress from the night before. The coffee shop had an 80s theme, and I was still tipsy from the night before, dazedly staring at the lights above us. I was squeezed next to May while the boys sat across from us. Noah was eagerly slurping the dregs of his coke, bouncing in his chair. I remember being mesmerized by the contrast of his white shirt clashing with the neon lights bathing him. I liked how ethereal he looked, strands of dark red hair catching fire under neon scarlet lights. May stopped picking at her fries, shooting the boy a look. She was still wearing another girl's sweater her hair hanging in her face. That's your third coke, May rolled her eyes. You're going to blow chunks everywhere. Noah lifted his lips from a straw. I can't help it, he whispered, leaning over the table and lowering his voice. Some little rich brat wants to hire us as entertainers, and you guys aren't excited? Or prisoners, Eris muttered into his coffee. Leaning across the table, I poked that blue paint still splattering his cheek. Killjoy? I teased. Eris waved my hand away. I'm deadly serious. Noah leaned back with a sigh. Oh, here we go. Mr. Pessimistic strikes again. 
Does being British automatically suck all the fun out of you? Yes, Eris grumbled. Or maybe I have brains that are telling me that this is a bad idea and we should run? Like, now? He shot Noah a glare. How can you not be paranoid after your speech? Noah's smile crumpled. I was high? You were high? Eris hissed. You put a target on our heads, you damn idiot. I didn't mean... You never mean it. Eris choked. I thought we were going to run. He lifted his head, meeting my gaze. We said after graduation, all the way back in sophomore year, that we were going to start our own business away from this messed up crap. He leaned forward, lips curled. So why are we still here? Run? The new voice startled me, slicing through my dizzy, tipsy thoughts. The woman who bailed us out politely took a seat, introducing herself as Auntie. The woman's smile widened. Why would you run from such an opportunity? May cocked her head, confused. Auntie? Just Auntie. The woman steepled her fingers. I trust you've already severed connections with your family and friends. Your deaths will have to be public to the town, so that means you will no longer be able to visit your family. Marin expects a permanent position, and to start straight away. Something ice cold pricked down my spine. Behind me, the old woman sipping her coffee went still suddenly. Above us, the lights flickered. No, Eris stood up, the rest of us petrified to the spot. I don't know what game you're playing, but faking our deaths is messed up. Whatever this is, we're out. I caught Noah's mouth curving into a proud smile, despite his ashy cheeks. He's right, he added shakily. We're not interested. Auntie didn't lose her smile, inclining her head. In the corner of my eye, the old lady still wasn't moving, narrow fingers wrapped around her cup. Marin has already named you, she said. You have been named after her own creation based on the childhood fantasy she could not live. The Middle View 4. Noah curled his lip. She can call us the Middle View pricks, I don't care. He jumped up, grabbing his drink. We're going. You clearly drive the loopy train to what the hellville, so we're done here. He gestured for the rest of us to get up, and I tried, but I couldn't take my eyes off of the light. When it flickered suddenly, the old woman's head dropped behind me. Then so did the old man's. Behind the counter, the waitress flopped to the ground. Auntie stood up, grabbing hold of Noah's arm. She was strangely gentle, pulling up his sleeve. See? It's already happening. Marin has a special ability. She can puppeteer anything, living or dead. She can get into your skin, tangle herself inside you, and take control. Noah yanked away, but I noticed his eyes were drooping. His attempt at pulling his arm from her grasp failing, causing him to drop back into his seat. You're a psychopath. Auntie only smiled. Of course. Marin's strings are only just implanting themselves inside you. They won't be working yet. A creak behind me and the old woman's head lifted slowly. I could see something in the air, lines forcing her back into a sitting position. So, I had to go with the easier option. May's head dropped first, like a puppet severed from her strings. Noah followed, his eyes rolling into the back of his skull. Eris tipped into the window. Something chittered behind me, my vision blurring. The old woman was laughing, her removable mouth clashing together. I could see the back of her head, a hollow cavern tangled with blood-slicked strings. A hollow cavern tangled with blood-slicked strings. And I fell back, my head tipping, my thoughts dancing. I expected the memory to fade, but I stayed enveloped inside it, suffocating in darkness. When I jolted awake, I was strapped inside a moving car, choking on cotton candy colored smoke. How could it be pink? I was in the front seat, my hands tied to the steering wheel. In front of me was the town lake and the car was picking up speed, rolling down rough gravel. We were deep inside the woods, trees smacking into the windows. When I twisted in my seat, struggling to lurch from my restraints, I glimpsed two figures through tunnel vision. May and Eris, their heads bowed. There was a shadow next to me, Noah, his face uncomfortably pressed against the window. With my hands tied to the wheel, I swung sideways in my seat, pressing myself against his limp body. 
He was so cold, but he had a normal pulse. Knocked out. Aeris and May, their heads bowed, jerking in their seats. Blinking rapidly, I thought I was seeing things. But there was something crisscrossed in the air, covering the seats, wrapped around every inch of us, like a spider's web. I screamed, my cry raw and painful in my throat, wrenching against blood-red lines entangling me. The car was picking up momentum, Noah's head slamming violently into the window. There was something holding me in place, already wrapped around my stomach. Strings. Turning my head to Noah, they were already knotted around his wrists, coiled around his throat, spider webbing across his face, creeping across Eris's legs and twining around his ankles, slipping inside May's mouth. Strings. As if these strings were already inside my head, my body jerked forwards on its own, my restrained feet slamming down on the brake. When the car came to a sudden halt, I forced my head up. My eyes were flickering, the world collapsing around me into a pinprick. There was a face at my door, a little girl wearing a mask. She pressed her hand against my window, lips moving under the mask. Mine. Her words jerked me back to the bed of a cold metal inside the workshop I was created, wall splattered with gore. I was no longer a real girl. I was Marin's doll. Deeper, Delaney, a voice cut through. Sinking deeper, I was aware of my physical body trembling in the chair. I could sense the man's fingers alleviate pressure slightly. Another memory. Bizarrely, this one was recent. I was inside the facility, hopped up on whatever funky drugs mom had forced into my bloodstream. In a town where I was born lived a man who sailed the sea, and he told us of his life in the land of submarines. Opening my eyes, an older heiress came seeing yellow submarine in my face. When I was high, my brain had cut out a lot. I didn't see the ugly stitches running across the top of his head, his right eye stitched shut. I never saw patchwork skin or the bandage wrapped around his head, because my mind wanted to see what I was holding on to. Sorry, Harris Kane laughed. He was my age, early twenties, dressed in light blue hospital scrubs. Eris had grown up, a mature curve to his face, thick sandy hair hanging in darker eyes. Uh, I don't know the rest of the lyrics, but hey, at least you're awake now. How much time do we have? I twisted toward the door. 22-year-old Noah Presley. His shadow was in the doorway, reddish-brown hair slicked back. He wasn't smiling, lips set into a thin line, marks covering his arms. When he caught my gaze, his right eye was fake. Glass. I could see where Marin had scooped his eyes out, replacing them with glass. Behind him, I could make out flashing. Alarms. Next to Noah, another figure, a man wearing a mask who I didn't see before, who cut himself from my memory. You've got two minutes, Dr. Delaney said. There's a fire door down the hallway. If you can get out of there, cut down the parking lot and go straight into the woods. I'll have someone waiting for you. She'll keep you safe. May nodded from her place next to me. She reached out to grab my hand. Like the boys, a pair of scissors was poking from her hospital scrub's pocket. I wanted to question the marks on her arms, the bloody stitches across her mouth but I squeezed her hand tighter. Do you remember our sixth mystery? I nodded dizzily. We had to stay quiet to avoid being caught by, uh, uh, old lady Carlisle in the missing piano case. Exactly, she said. You need to stay quiet, okay? Just like back then. Eris pressed a finger to his lips. Don't say a word. Mouth shut, weirdo, Noah said, leaning against the door. Eris, Noah grumbled from the hallway. Little help? The guy nodded, joining Noah, the two of them speaking in low murmurs with Dr. Delaney. May squeezed my hand, tight enough for me to feel her biting nails. Do you remember? I knew what she was going to say. She was going to ask me about the string factory and what happened that night. Instead, her words were different, because what I heard had been altered. Eve, she whispered, shaking me. Do you remember who we are? Hey, we've got to go. Noah pulled a scalpel from his pocket. May helped me out of bed, my legs giving way. She pulled me into the hallway, and we were running for our lives. 
until... Marin! I was pulled back, not by strings, but by arms that wrapped around me. Mom. The others kept going, disappearing into blinding red light, their voices reverberating back down the hallway. Eve! My mouth opened, but a needle was slipping into the flesh of my neck. Eve! Oh! Where are you? Their voices swam in and out, shouting a name I didn't understand. It wasn't me who retracted from the memory this time. It was Delaney. His fingers slipped, a sharp intake of breath pulling me back to the present. I was aware blood was filling my mouth and staining my lips and chin. I couldn't move my head. My eyes glued shut. I've... I've got it. Delaney's voice was shaking. He was lying. I never saw the rest of the car ride memory. Allison! Allison, Tibet took the kid! The response was robotic. Very well. Leave her. The two left and I let my head hang, my thoughts pulling me back into slumber. The others were gone. When I tried to force my mind to bring them back, there was nothing. I talked to them out loud, just like they said. Still nothing. I was alone. Marin? Sweetie, are you okay? The shrill squeak was not my mother. When I pried my eyes open, a woman in her late thirties was standing over me. She untied me and tended to my nose, forcing bottled water down my throat, but I could barely understand her. There were only two things on my mind. The woman claimed she was helping my mother, and I nodded along dizzily, climbing into the front of her car. I trusted the woman until I saw the gun in her glove compartment. I know you're not supposed to jump out of a moving car, but somehow I managed it. I landed on concrete, probably giving myself a concussion, but I didn't care. I don't care that I was almost kidnapped. I don't care that my mother is unsurprisingly also a piece of garbage. I'm terrified of every passing car, every stranger I pass. I don't even care that I'm homeless, and I'm most definitely being tracked down. My name is not Marin, it's Eve. And I think my friends are still alive. But if they are, why can't I see them anymore? They are still alive. Right? That's what the ad said. I found it in a library book, sandwiched inside a dog-eared copy of Percy Jackson. There it was. Have you ever wanted to be a superhero? Well, now you can become one. I can give you any superpower you want. 250 bucks each, 100 extra for anything ending in kinesis. I'm open 9 a.m. to midnight every day. Find me between the old Pizza Hut and the library. Don't look for me. I'll find you. Please note, these abilities are non-refundable and may cause side effects. I had so many questions. Keeping hold of this scrap of paper, I pulled it out during class to show my friend. It's a dud, Ty said with an eye roll. I mentioned it to him once, and the guy had not stopped talking about it all day. This thing was clearly on his mind. The guy couldn't sit still for most of class, his gaze flicking to the scrap poking from my notebook. At lunch, Ty ripped the paper out of my hand when we were trashing our leftovers. I was still considering it. I did have 250 bucks in my savings, and superpowers sounded fun. Ty, however, didn't share my excitement. I can guarantee someone out there is not giving you superpowers for 200 bucks. He screwed the paper up in his fist and threw it in the trash. Ty was a skeptical person anyway, though his reaction was unlike him. His eyes were dark, a hollowness to them like I was staring into nothing. It took me a moment to snap him out of it. Hey, I nudged him, and he blinked, his expression souring. Ty rarely scowled, so this was a first. I don't think I had ever seen that look on his face, clearly panicked but trying to hide it. He feigned a smile, though I could see the whites in his fingers, where he was squeezing his tray a little too hard. Come on. His mouth was filled with mashed potatoes from lunch. I thought you were smart. Do you seriously believe in superpowers? Ty laughed. In this world? No. I couldn't take my eyes off of the paper, now covered in someone's potato salad. I found myself reaching toward it, before Ty gently slapped my hand away. Well, don't believe in an obvious scam. He dumped his tray, his tone hardening. There was a girl behind me trying to get past, but I was paralyzed, staring at the advert. 
Ty's fingers wrapped around my arm. I felt the weight of each one cinching into my skin, pressing pressure. B. I am being completely serious when I say you will get your organs harvested. Ty's voice bounced around my skull. I nodded, though my actions weren't mine. A dreamy smile splitting across my lips I couldn't control. Yeah, I said, my words tangled. The sound of the cafeteria faded into white noise, and for a moment, I felt like I was floating. I kept nodding, all of my senses starting to seep into one. Ty's touch was gentle and firm around my elbow. I could still hear the sound of chatter, but I could taste it too. Smell gossip and small talk. It tasted like ice cream cake and lemon frosting on my tongue. Chocolate lava and tomato ketchup tickling the back of my throat. The guy in front of me had hair the color of fire, a deep orange glow igniting each strand of light. I shook my head of entangled smells and taste. Don't bother. Ty's voice was louder in my head. I had the sudden overwhelming urge to slam my hands over my ears, except my hands wouldn't move. I was frozen, my fingers still clutching my tray. It's a scam, Fee. Explosions of color expanded in my vision, trailing the sound of a girl's scream. Pink. Someone dropped their tray. Purple. Laughter looked like yellow paint being spread across the floor and tasted like cherries. Yeah. You're, uh... You're, you're probably right, I heard myself say in a daze. Yeah, it's a scam. Good, he hummed. Let's go. Ty's grip slipped from my arm, and reality slammed back into me. The loud laughter and chatter from students bustling around me. I was still holding my tray. I shook my head of mind fog, my thoughts seeping back to fruition. My earlier words already felt foreign and wrong. This wasn't a new thing. I had been suffering from brain blanks for a while. Before I could stop myself, I pulled the scrap of paper from the trash, scraped away pieces of pasta, and followed Ty out of the cafeteria. Ty and I had been friends since junior year. I didn't think I'd befriend a guy twice the size of me, but here we were, a year later, practically glued to the hip. Ty was marginally attractive, dark brown hair and built like a brick wall. If I didn't swing the other way, I would definitely be swayed by Asian American features and dimpled smiles. Catching up to him, I waved the paper in his face. For someone who doesn't really care about this so-called dud, you seem to care a lot. Ty's lip curled. I noticed his grip tighten around his phone. You seriously dug it out of the trash? Why wouldn't I? I shot him a grin. Don't you want superpowers? His lip twitched. I'm good. His response confused me. Seriously, you don't want any superpower? No. Ty's voice was startlingly cold, his tone holding weight. The light fixture above us flickered erratically, the bulbs exploding popping one by one. For a moment, I was entranced by shattered glass raining from the ceiling. I held out my hand, catching shards in my palm. Ty kept walking, unfazed. His gaze didn't leave his phone. Don't go looking for fantasy, he grumbled. You won't find it. I shuffled the ad into my pocket, following his figure down the hallway. And how can you be so sure? I was teasing him at this point. But Ty wasn't getting the memo. As usual, he was taking things a little too seriously. Ty shrugged, bowing his head. It's basic common sense. Don't be stupid. Okay, I said, half joking. I'll drop it. Ty was unusually quiet for the rest of the day. I told him I was going to the convenience store after class, which wasn't exactly a lie. I needed to grab food, but I wasn't going to tell him about my pit stop. Per what the ad said, I ventured down the alleyway between the library and the old pizza hut. There was a dead end and a rat with its innards spilling out onto a piece of cardboard. I'm not an avid believer of bad luck, but it looked like the stars were aligning to personally tell me I was going to die. According to the ad, I was supposed to wait for them to find me. Twenty minutes passed, then half an hour. The sky was starting to darken, streaks of red and orange illuminating the horizon indicating twilight. An hour passed, and I was sitting on the wall, my legs dangling, my butt already half asleep. I checked my phone. 8% and zero service. I had five missed calls from an hour ago. Ty. He was on to me. I hated convenience store food. Uber Eats was my go-to. 
I really thought I could fool the guy with some half-assed text. Hey, I'll be back late tonight. I'm grabbing sushi from the sea store. I would rather die than eat convenience store sushi, and my friend knew that. Another 20 minutes passed and streetlights were flickering to life, illuminating the dark in an orange glow. I could see the streak of red, which had been the rat in perfect detail. The head was gone while the torso had been ripped open, lumps of pulpy red spilling onto the ground. Something sour filled the back of my mouth. I jumped off of the wall, my stomach twisting into knots. I could have sworn that thing had been splattered across a piece of cardboard. It was pitch black. With the help of my phone flashlight, I found the cardboard exactly where I saw it before. So, how did the rat move? Taking a step back, my hand moved in jerking movements, my flashlight illuminating the hollow oblivion of the alleyway, which felt like it was closing in on me, a slowly collapsing pinprick in my vision. Hell, I could already feel my body catapulting into fight or flight. I couldn't resist looking at the ground and following the beam of my flashlight, searching for mutant rats. I took another slow step back, phantom bugs filling my mouth and skittering across the bare flesh of my arms. Run. My body was telling me to run. The air around me, thick and sour smelling, was telling me to run. But I couldn't. I was paralyzed, my gaze glued to the streaks of scarlet that had been the rat. The blood was still there, thick and congealing into the concrete, but the pulpy mass of flesh, which were its grim remains, were gone. Following the splatters of blood with my flashlight, I was right. It was... moving. I expected an attack. Furry masses diving onto me, razor-sharp teeth tearing into my flesh. What I got instead was a clammy hand slamming over my mouth. My body reacted, a scream erupting from my throat, muffling into the stranger's palm. I could sense their breath tickling the back of my neck. Cash, please. The voice was younger than I expected. A kid, maybe a few years younger than me. His voice was a low murmur, almost a sing-song. Blinking stars out of my eyes, it took me a disorienting second to understand what he meant. And I remembered why I was there in the first place. I don't have it. I muffled into the pressure over my mouth and nose. His hands smelled of disinfectant mixed with something metallic. A pungent taste that stuck to the back of my throat and lips. I was lying. I did have 250 bucks in my pocket. However, I wasn't expecting my seller to be a damn kid. I said the first thing that came to my mind. I, I, I could pay you in installments. I tried to pull his hand away, but he tightened his grip. Installments? The kid surprised me with a giggle. For superpowers? Dude. I did my best to nod, tears stinging my eyes. He let me go with a sigh and I stumbled back, swiping my mouth. Fine. I scrambled for my flashlight, and the shadow in front of me grew a face. I found myself staring into bright eyes, twisted and wrong, a smile with too many teeth. I was right. It was a kid, maybe two years younger than me. Rich, judging from his private school blazer, thick sandy hair poking from a knitted beanie. The kid shot me a grin. I'll let you pay in installments, but if you miss one, I'm adding interest. I may be a kid, but that doesn't mean you can take advantage. He twisted around with a chuckle, jumping over a puddle. I'm only doing this business because I like the look of you. I was expecting a college kid. And yeah, you hit the nail on the head. His head jerked almost inhumanely, a predator tracking its prey. You're... interesting. He inclined his head. I didn't think my ad would work. And yet, here you are. I forced a smile. Here I am, I said through gritted teeth. He was standing on the remnants of the rat, and when I looked closer, I realized he was barefoot. This kid went to a prestigious school and was wearing no shoes. The slithering remains of the rat squashed between his toes. I swore I caught the shadows enveloping his face, like he belonged in the dark, his lips curling into that of a monster, narrowed eyes drinking me in. This kid was scarier than mutant rats. He reminded me of an unhinged Percy Jackson, which was ironic. Well, he cocked his head, mocking a frown. Are you coming? I was already mentally mapping a getaway if this kid tried anything. You're the one selling. 
I drifted off and he nodded with a grin. Yeah? What? Why? Did you expect someone else? Before I could speak, he sighed. Ah, follow me. I have several left. I have some new ones. Though I haven't advertised them yet. Pyrokinesis is a popular one, but I won't have another pyro until at least January. My supplier is running short, which is... So annoying. He turned back to me when I didn't move. The kid ushered me towards him, and something compelled me forward. Maybe I really did want to believe in his fantasy. Continuing to talk, he didn't seem phased by my hesitance. I took my place behind him. I expect installments to pay me back if you can't pay now. You can give me your payment details after. Payment details? I whispered. The kid snorted his expression darkening. I'm not giving you superpowers for free? He raised a brow. His eyes were darker, more hollow in the flashlight beam, aging this kid way beyond a teenager. I know some people who do, but you don't want to mess around with them. Uh, I can give you high quality abilities without the, uh, you know, super soldier programming. I swallowed. The what? The kid didn't reply only waving his hand with a sigh. Ah, you wouldn't understand. But trust me, they're bad news. The patronizing little brat. Stumbling over my feet, I struggled through the dark. Are you being serious? I managed to choke out. He surprised me with a laugh. You thought I was lying? What were you expecting? I ignored his question. I'm sorry, how old are you? Uh, 16? He shouted back. And a half? I nodded, dizzily, jumping over a puddle. The alleyway felt like it was going on forever. You're a 16-year-old that sells superpowers to people? His shadow was getting further away, and I struggled to keep up. Yep, yeah, the kid's voice bounced off of the walls, while his figure weaved in and out of existence, creeping further and further away from my flashlight. Hey, it's better than getting a job, and I'm earning my tuition, so it's a win-win. Uh-huh. I cleared my throat. I was fully expecting drugs. This kid was talking like a drug dealer, so maybe high schoolers had code names for drugs. Superpower names were less likely to cause alarm bells. Pyrokinesis was ice, and telekinesis was cocaine. Maybe the anything ending in kinesis line meant class A drugs. The ones in high demand. It made sense. This kid thought he was selling me cocaine, and I had taken his code names literally. Oh, I was I was being led into a 16-year-old's drunk debt. Ty was never going to let me live this one down. When we reached the end of the alleyway, the kid turned to me, pulling a piece of cloth from his pocket. Immediately, I stumbled back, and he rolled his eyes. Relax, the boy held up the cloth. It's just a blindfold to protect my business. I don't want my customers to know where we're going. I didn't move, my mind going into panic mode. The kid sighed. Dude, uh, it's fine, he said, tying the cloth around my eyes. My fingers moved to tear it away, but he stopped me. I'll even tell you my name. I could sense his face inches from mine. I'm Wen. Nice to meet you. Now, I'm going to lead you inside, all right? I felt his hands press down on my shoulders. Do you mind? I nodded, swallowing hard. Ophelia, I whispered letting him guide me forwards. Hmm? My name, I said. It's Ophelia. Wen chuckled. Ophelia? I don't think I've ever known anyone with that name. I tripped over something and he pulled me further into the void. I had no idea where I was going, dragging my hands across a brick to stabilize myself. When I was sure he was leading me to my doom, Wen pulled off the blindfold. Blinking rapidly, I drank an eerie yellow light, sparking from a dying bulb. I was in a small apartment kitchen. There was a faucet, a dining table, and a refrigerator. I opened it up, jumping back when a critter crept across the handle. For a rich private school kid, Wen's living conditions were interesting. I was frowning at peeled paint on the walls and used coffee mugs. Bug-infested flooring under my feet when the kid filled up a glass of water and handed it to me. I noticed smears of dirt on the rim and politely declined. Wen must have seen my expression. He sighed, placing the glass down. This is all I could get at short notice. 
He gestured around, and I took notice of the windows being blacked out. I'm planning on upgrading next year, especially if I'm going to have competition. He stood on his tiptoes to grab a pack of cookies from a cupboard. Want one? Wen's smile caught the light, and something rancid filled my mouth. He was waiting for me to try and run. When I made my way toward the door, he casually stepped in front of me, arms folded. Wen knew he was in control, and I think that exhilarated him. My flashlight and phone had died, and I was alone inside his drug den. He was practically bouncing up and down. Are you sure you don't want a cookie? I managed to nod. I'm okay. Wen shrugged, demolishing the cookies himself. Suit yourself. I thought he was going to continue playing mind games, but he just sent me a smile. You should eat. All of my customers eat before a sale. I said I'm okay. I gritted out. With a shrug, Wen led me down a set of concrete steps, jumping down each one like he was playing a game. Every time I turned back, something forced me further down the steps, like I wasn't in control of my legs. Wen talked casually, knowing just opening his mouth was terrifying me. His movements, the way he spoke, everything was manufactured to unnerve me. It's, uh, it's telekinesis you're looking for, right? We reached the bottom, and he led us through a door of plastic sheets, straight into darkness. I could smell it already disinfectant mixed with mold. Telekinesis is a great ability, Wen laughed. It took me a while to catch him, but I managed it in the end. Wen's words played with my mind, phantom bugs creeping down my spine. Him? Light slammed into me, almost knocking me off of my feet. Shading my eyes, I blinked rapidly. I expected a drug lab. I expected mountains of powdered white and old science equipment. What I saw instead was plastic. A room full of plastic, hanging from the ceiling. I couldn't see anything else. I started to back away, but Wen was already grabbing me and pulling me with him. In the flickering glow from the light fixture above us, I could see old and new red streaks staining the floor in each plastic door we stumbled through. Blood. It was everywhere, covering every surface. It was dried into the floor, caked into the clear sheets being whipped in my face, shining brighter the further I was pulled through a labyrinth of plastic. A whole different world hidden inside. I glimpsed shadows at first. Metal beds lining the walls. Body-sized lumps lying in each one. The place reminded me of an emergency room. We passed a girl with a halo hair lying face down on blood-stained blankets. I couldn't see her torso. The lower part of her body covered with soaked blankets. Stained revealing crimson. There were dozens of plastic tubes, forced into her pale, limp arms hanging off of the edge. Ignore the siren, Wen groaned, tightening his grip. There was something pooling on the floor, thick and red seeping across pristine marble. She's a drama queen. Ariosa plays dead all the time. She's not for sale, by the way. Ariosa's just for display. I kept walking, as if in a trance. Even when behind me, the girl let out a deafening shriek that clawed its way into my skull. Follow me! Wen commanded me closer with his voice, and I moved like I was in a dream. My gaze glued to blood-stained steel and body parts without heads cruelly chained down to each gurney. I saw them at their most vulnerable. People, with the majority of them being in their twenties, college kids and older, put on a horrific display. These kids were malnourished anorexic, their haunted eyes piercing right through me. Some of them screamed at me, straining in cruel chains, pinning them down. One guy was brutally restrained. His arms had been chopped off. His agonizing wail followed me, begging Wen to kill him. Pyro, Wen said. He's my only one, and he's already been bought. I'm just waiting for the seller to come by him. A ponytailed brunette looked to be in deep sleep. A plastic mask pressed over her mouth and nose. The girl looked drained, sickly pale skin and bruises covering her arms, no doubt from needles and tubes being forced into her veins. Looking closer, her face started to morph into a younger girl, and then a guy, their features changing sporadically, while their body, slightly delayed, followed. This person did not have one singular face, they had multiple. Jordan, 09. If we're talking about their ability... Anything starting with zero is the crap people really want, 
like mind control and anything with kinesis, Wen muttered in my ear. They're my first shifter. I'm selling them for 150, but nobody's interested. Somehow I found my voice. I've changed my mind. I managed to choke out. Wen cocked his head, a smirk curling on his lips. The guy was waiting for this. His eyes were alive, glittering with insanity. He was subtle in the way he positioned himself. You can't take back agreement for a superpower, he murmured. I use your voice as a form of consent. You followed me in here, expecting superpowers and wasted precious time I could have had with a paying customer. So you're buying. A cry clawed its way up my throat, and I pried his fingers from my arm. But he grabbed it again, this time squeezing hard enough to incite a screech. Wen pulled me close to him, his breath in my ear. His words were like poison, and I could sense his satisfied grin. Like I said, we can talk about the legalities and payment details when you're all done, alright? He shoved me forward. At first, I didn't move. Walk, Ophelia. His voice was whimsical at first. Hearing Ariosa's whimpering behind me, I couldn't. Uh, walk, dude! I I is it that hard? Jeez, you're acting like I've asked you to climb a mountain. Wen's tone hardened, his playful attitude souring. I obeyed, forcing my legs into motion. Something smooth and metallic prodded into my spine. A gun. I should have known a teenage drug lord who dealt in supernatural abilities would have a gun. Wen prodded me again. I don't screw with people who refuse to buy, lady. I feed them to 102. I was still registering his words when he stopped in front of a particularly filthy sheet and swept it aside. Here we are. Telekinesis. He was originally 250, but since you've been a great customer, I can give you him for half. I don't know what I expected. After already witnessing multiple people tied down and forcefully drugged, wires and tubes sticking from them, I thought it would be the same. But this was a whole other level of brutality. One that sent me staggering back. Wen easily caught me, stabbing the barrel of his gun into my back. I barely felt it. I sunk to my knees, my mind already trying and failing to drink in what I was seeing. Wen wasn't just selling superpowers. I vomited all over myself, and the boy scoffed. Oh, come on, that's disgusting. Swiping barf from my lips, I struggled to my feet. He was farming them. Get up, drama queen. Honestly, you're as bad as Ariosa. Wen dragged me to my feet, but my legs weren't working. My head felt thick, my thoughts dizzy and distant. I wanted to lie to myself, tell myself I wasn't seeing this, but the blood on the floor was real, the splatters of scarlet staining skin and steel. In front of me was a man, my age, strapped to a chair, closed eyes flickering, his lips parted in a silent scream. It looked like he used to be a college student, splinters of who he was still lingering. I could see where his hair used to be, Tufts of dark blonde still attached to what was left of his scalp. His skin was paper thin, malnourished, like it would splinter apart at any given moment. I think he used to be handsome, he used to have laugh lines and lips that smiled. But now, I was looking at a shell. The man's body had been forced upright, trembling hands pinned to metal armrests. I looked for hair, for facial features that made sense and were human. But all of that had been stripped away. There was just agony. It was agony I didn't know or understand. That twisted body, contorting him back and forth like a puppet on strings. The back of his head was gone. The startling white bone of his skull and pinkish mush of brain exposed. Needles and wires stuck into the meat. The man's eyes flickered open. Suddenly, wide and frantic. Terrified. Staring directly at me, the whites of his eyes were blood red. He jolted on the chair, his arms moving, fingers twisting around the armrest. Ta-da! Wen danced over to the man, playfully prodding the bare meat of the guy's brain. The man screamed, contorting in his chair, the lights above flickering. The ground shook under my feet, stray instruments flying into the air. I watched, baffled, as swirling silver danced around my head. Needles and scalpels in a manic dance, before faltering, like he was losing control. 
The guy's head dropped, and so did the whirlwind of metal hitting the ground. Behave, Wen rolled his eyes. Stop showing off. Slowly, the man's head snapped up. His lips moved, a thin line of red oozing from his nose. His gaze stuck to me, and with every jerk of his wrist, every blink of his eye, I knew he was trying to rip me apart from the inside. My skin prickled. I could feel his presence brushing over me, prodding at my skull. Wen flung out his arms, like he was introducing a friend. This is telekinesis. Well, I call him Zero Two. Also, Ryan, he's my most powerful. I can drug this guy into a damn coma and he still manages to rip a customer's head off. Wen chuckled. The trick was finding the right mix. Horse tranquilizer works miracles with telekinesis. It knocks him straight out with no mess. The kid's smile widened. Which is why your brains aren't splattering the walls right now, he said in a sing-song. You're welcome, by the way. Zero Two let out an animalistic howl, struggling in the chair, and he laughed. You can shut up. Don't give me that look. Wen turned his attention to me. All right, let's get you set up for the procedure. Zero Two's gaze snapped to me, his lips moving. Once. Twice. Run, he mouthed and I glimpsed lingering humanity. Wen jumped in front of me, dark eyes twisted with insanity. Well, do you like him? You like him, right? He isn't, isn't he like, he's insane. Another step and he was closing the distance between us. Your assimilation should take maybe an hour, two if your body rejects it, which is a pain, but I've got the time. My Netflix subscription expired, so I have all night to work. Wen's lips curled. I want to make you perfect. You're sick. I managed to get out. Wen shrugged. It's business. You have empathy, and I don't. Ouch. Do you want telekinesis or not? No. Panic erupted inside of me, but I couldn't move. There was no way to run, and a psychotic kid held me at gunpoint. I didn't have a choice. My freedom to choose had dissipated the second I made the decision to follow him inside his superpower farm. Wen was surprisingly strong, his arms wrapping around my neck in a chokehold. Something cold pricked the back of my neck, and my body went limp. I hit the ground, half aware of Wen's shadow looming over me. My vision was blurring, but I could just make out the curl of his cruel smile. After all, Wen's voice swam in and out of reality, while my body plunged. My eyes flickered, finding intense splatters of red staining the ceiling. I don't think I told you about my ability, did I? Oh, man. It's the best part. He picked me up and I was light as a feather, my head banging. Wen's laugh sounded like thunderclaps. And there it was again. Just like in the cafeteria with Ty, my senses were twisting. The blood in my mouth was shaped like diamonds. I could see every bead, every cutting corner slipping from my lips. Through tunnel vision, the boy's laughter had color pitch black darkness bleeding around him like he was engulfed in ink oh dude wait until i tell you about my father his voice faded and i stopped thinking for a while i don't know how long time seemed to flow in a separate singularity consciousness hit me slowly wen's voice grazed the back of my mind pulling me back to a reality i didn't want to be in i could already sense my numb body my wrists pinned to metal armrests. There are certain things your mind chooses to block out in favor of panicking your body. I was already aware that the back of my head had been ripped open, and my mind was raw and naked to the rest of the world. It hit me in tiny electroshocks, not prominent enough to be pain. I don't think pain existed in that disorienting moment between half-consciousness and awake. It was something else entirely, an uncomfortable agony that wasn't quite agony because I couldn't feel it. Once upon a time, the kid's voice was mocking and I could feel his fingers. I could feel the tips of his fingernails digging into me, skittering right across the bare flesh of my brain. There was no scream in my throat, no panic in my chest. I think my body was in a state of paralysis. I remember opening my eyes to brutal light blinding me, rivulets of thick red beating down my arms, tiny rivers seeping down my skin. I closed my eyes again, a sharp, 
heavy pants escaping my lips. There was a boy with a father who was very intelligent. I was pushing out words, my mouth filled with blood. Why are you doing this? My lips moved, but the words failed to hit the sound barrier. Shh. Wen hummed. Listen to the story. He cleared his throat, and his fingers continued to dig down, deep into the meat of my brain, pulverizing tissue. I felt nothing, and yet my body still reacted, jerking side to side. My eyes rolled back, darkness momentarily swallowing me up, only to spit me back out. Anyway, Wen continued, through flickering eyes like a glimpse steel protruding into my wrist. So, the boy had a super smart father who was obsessed with the supernatural, Wen hummed. Can you guess what the boy's father did? I didn't respond, my gaze lazily skating over ceiling tiles. He experimented. Wen dug his fingernails in, and this time I screamed. No pain, but my body was sure there was. Sweat trickled down the back of my neck and face, bile gathering in my mouth. The boy's father was obsessed with unlocking a certain part of the mind. The boy didn't know this. One day he was just exploring. His mother had been gone for a few days, but hey, his dad said it was cool. His mom was just visiting the family and she'd be back. Another prod. Nope. The kid found his mother. Or, more appropriately, what was left of his mother. Daddy carved her brain out. Mommy was right there on the bed. The blood was still warm. He hugged her and still remembers the blood on his face. He tried to wake her up, but Mommy was long dead. Dad had already cut up her brain for testing. He giggled, another explosion of color seeping into my vision. When his mother failed, his father used him. Deeper and deeper his fingers were going. It hurt him, Ophelia. Wen mocked a childish sob. Oh god, it hurt enough for the boy to want to die over and over again. He spent a long time on a table made of stone while his father cut him apart and stitched him back together. He stopped feeling pain. Hell, he stopped feeling completely. Because the guy had cut all of it away. All the bad emotions and all the good to make way for his greatest gift. No wonder Wen was a psychopath. His childhood was a never-ending experiment. I think you know where I'm going with this story, Wen chuckled. My father wanted to turn me into a superhero, just like the other kids he played around with, but he did the exact opposite. I held my breath when his fingers stopped moving, straying in cerebral tissue. Dad didn't give me the powers I wanted. His tone twisted and his fingers curled. That time I did feel pain, my lips parting in a silent scream. He gave me this. Wen twisted his fingers again, and my white-hot pain filled me, bleeding into my blood and bones. I screamed that time, my raw screech reminding my body I was still real. The power to extract abilities I, that I can't take for myself. Wen continued in a spiteful hiss and kept them to others. It was like being filled with electricity, my brain being boiled alive. My eyes clouded, the lights above flickering. I screamed again, my head lolling to the side. Sorry, Wen muttered. I'm trying to reach your cerebral cortex. I think that's what it's called, but it's hard. His voice faded in and out. I should be better at this by now, but there's so much I have to dig through. And that's on top of keeping the customer alive with Zero Five's ability. Ugh. I've got brain juices all over me. I counted ceiling tiles to distract myself. Almost. I lost count around the 400 mark. My body unsure whether to shut down or stay awake. There. Colors and stars spotted my eyes. I remember curling my fingers and feeling a pull from somewhere, like a magnet repelling. Darkness found me once more, but even asleep I could still sense that pull entangling around me. Wakey wakey! Drifting back to fruition, I was sitting, my legs dangling off of a bed. 
When my hand instantly went to the back of my head, my fingers only grazed my own thick brown hair. I delved two fingers into my scalp, and there it was, thick, rugged stitches sewing me back together. My first thought was zero, too. I tried to move my body to get up, but my limbs weren't working. Dropping onto my hands and knees, I barely felt the impact. Zero Two was gone. The chair where he'd been restrained was empty. Here, let me help you. Wen was standing over me. He ducked to my height. I thought he was going to hit me, but he just pulled a stray needle out of my arm. All right, try now. I did, jumping to unsteady feet. Already I was looking for a way out, and that strange magnetic-like pull was still there. It moved with me, attaching itself to everything in my vicinity. I was sure with a simple jerk of my hand or finger, I could cause damage. Already my mouth was moving, my heightened senses overwhelming me. Ariosa, the siren in the bed a few meters away, was easy to latch onto. Where is he? I demanded, already scanning for Zero Two. Wen folded his arms. Zero Two? Oh, I, I incinerate the original host after extraction, he said. Think of your ability like a virus. In rare cases, the power itself tries to find the original host, which can result in problems, he tutted. Luckily, it was just one person, but I've been told to be careful. He shook his head. Anyway, enough about the shell. I want payment by Monday. If you can't pay, you can come work for me. You're telekinetic, and I need some extra weight to play catch. Boss. A girl's voice made me jump. We've got another one. Wen's eyes lit up. Watch this. He grabbed my arm and pulled me back through the room, passing beds filled with supernaturals. I was lighter on my feet, already clumsy with my ability. I was knocking things onto the floor and sending beds crashing into the wall. Wen was already ahead of me, so I had one chance to do it. I found Zero Two on a pile of bodies, each marked for incineration. His hands were tied, so Wen was lying about him being brain dead. The man wasn't moving, his head clumsily stitched back on. But I still pulled apart his restraints. If he was strong enough, he would rip one apart. Superpowers or no superpowers. Wen was greeted by two figures at the door. When I got closer, the shadows were even younger than him. The girl, 12 or 13, with blonde pigtails, and a boy, a little older than her. They looked like twins, the two of them wearing the same private school uniform as Wen. I was so busy staring at the little girl's red slicked hands, I didn't see their catch. There was a man curled up on the ground, bound and gagged, a bag over his head. Psychokinetic! Pigtails shot when a grin. This stupid head came right to us! She was hesitant to go near him, dancing back and forth like she was playing a game. Careful! I had to gag him with three layers of duct tape to stop him messing with my mind. He connects through touch and speech, and he's strong. Like, so strong. Seriously? Wen whistled. Damn. He knelt next to the fresh catch. I have pre-orders for a psychokinetic, but I don't think I've ever met one since Dad's collection. The boy straightened up and kicked a lump, forcefully rolling the man onto his side. I caught a flash of familiar dark brown curls slipping from the bag over his head. Ty. I could see the beaded bracelet I got him for Christmas and his engagement ring. He had just gotten engaged his girlfriend proposing to him two weeks earlier. But Ty didn't have an ability. He couldn't have. I would have known. One smile made me feel sick. A triumphant grin. I can harvest him tonight and greenlight those orders. Yay! Pigtails jumped up and down while their brother's smile wavered. I had an ability, and I had no idea how to use it. It felt like a magnet, like I could pull things apart and rip into solid objects. But I had no idea how. For example, I tried to tear into Wen's mind, but he was already nodding at his child soldiers to take me down. I hit the ground and the last thing I saw was the little guy scooping Ty into his arms. I woke up inside my apartment, lying on my bedroom floor, but I couldn't move. I blinked and I was standing in front of the subway, my feet teetering on the edge. Jumping back, I had no memory of getting there. I blinked again, and this time I was standing in the middle of traffic. Die. There was a voice in my head, a snarl creeping into the back of my skull. It was persistent, trying to shove me 
into the path of a truck. I could sense the voice trying to use the ability now inside me. This time he could use it. I managed to wrangle back control before he sent the subway derailing. Die. I've only known this world for a few days. I've lost my best friend, and I've been illegally messed with by a teenage psychopath and his army of children. I don't know about the origin of these powers, and I don't know how Ty is a psychokinetic. I don't know how to get him back, and even if he's alive. But there is something I'm 100% sure of. Zero Two is inside my damn head. Back when I was in the fourth grade, I was friends with this super clean-cut kid who always tucked in his collared shirt into his khakis. He was brought up religious while my family wasn't, and we had this running game where we both tried to come up with questions to trip the other up. I remember one time sitting on my couch playing video games when I told him everything could be measured, and his counter was to ask how I could measure the distance between heaven and hell. I was completely stumped, but I knew my dad would know because he knew everything. We ran to ask him in our dreadfully white kitchen, where he spent most of his time because it was the room with the best light. He put down the book he was reading real slow, looked at me over his glasses, then at my friend, then back at me before finally saying, A second is more than enough time to get there, if that second is bad enough. That answer always stuck with me. I came back years later when I was a sophomore in high school, and the vice principal peeked into my English class to call my name in a low, hushed voice. I thought I was getting in trouble for something, until I got into the hall and she handed me a cell phone, from which an excessively calm voice told me that my father had suffered a massive heart attack and had passed away, even before he got to the hospital. I remember thanking the faceless voice for telling me and hanging up. After the call, I looked down at the phone screen and noticed that the call lasted 10 minutes and 23 seconds from the time the vice principal first picked up, and I wondered which of those was the one where I made the journey. The best man I've ever known died when he was only 42 years old, and anyone who has lost the one they admire most knows how it feels for part of themselves to die with them. It didn't occur to me that my second between heaven and hell hadn't happened yet though, and that it wouldn't happen until a night in college when I discovered the secret door in my house. It was an old Victorian style house that looked more like a bunch of smaller houses had randomly smashed together than any deliberate construction. There was a group of eight of us who pooled together to rent the place, which ended up being way cheaper than individual dorm rooms. Even after we'd been there for a few months, we kept discovering new things about the place, like a fireplace that had been boarded up, or the dumbwaiter chute hidden in what we thought was an electrical box. Well, one night, five of us were hanging out in the living room, when Derek, engineering major with a mouth that never seemed to fully close, showed us this trick he learned. He put a layer of clear tape over the phone's flashlight and colored it in blue with a marker, then another layer colored purple, and a few more going back and forth like that. When he was done, he turned on the light, which was now filtered into UVA and worked like a black light. We had all been drinking a bit by this point and laughed enormously at all the gross, glowing splotches on the couch. We turned out the rest of the lights to make the colors pop, and took turns shining the light on our teeth to make them glow. Then we chased around Chrissy, the only girl in our group, whose makeup reacted to make her look like some sort of demonic clown. She was less amused and probably less drunk than the rest of us, so she took off up the stairs while we all followed. Gregory had a perfect Australian accent, and he made the Steve Irwin voice like we were stalking some exotic beast that we didn't want to frighten off. It was all in good fun, but Chrissy was in no mood and she locked herself in her room. The slamming of her door cut through our buzz a bit, and we all felt like idiots, and the game didn't seem so fun anymore. It was during this moment of sudden quiet that the light fell on a blank patch of wall, and the outline of a door suddenly glowed from nowhere. Derek Gregory, a third guy named Preston, and me, all staring at it in silence like we'd just been visited by a UFO. Dude, Preston said. Dude, the rest of us replied in a solemn chorus, the only appropriate response in such circumstances. 
Derek ran his hands over the outline. It quickly became apparent that the light was shining through the wallpaper. As you can imagine with four buzzed college boys, we respected the property and wouldn't dream of tearing off the wallpaper on a rental just to satisfy our idle curiosity. At least for a few seconds anyway. Derek had a pocket knife on his keychain, and he slid it into the wall to trace the outline of the door, which was positioned almost exactly between his room and Chrissy's room on the other side. It didn't seem like there was enough space for a third hidden room between them, and consensus said it couldn't have been larger than a closet that had been sealed up. We peeled back the wallpaper to reveal a solid wooden door that matched the design of the rest of the house. But it wasn't the door that was glowing. There was a thin gap around the edges, and whatever the UV light was reacting with was coming from behind. What if it opens into Chrissy's room? Gregory asked. She would literally kill us if we all just tumbled through. Hey, don't worry about it, Preston said. We'll just tell her it was your ID and we were trying to stop you. He pushed against the door and it gave a little, seeming more stuck than locked. Chrissy, you'll want to come see this, Gregory called through the wall. We promise not to shine the light on you. The language in her reply would have been sufficient to embarrass a career criminal and doesn't need to be replicated here. It was too late anyway because Derek had put his shoulder to the door and had already forced it open. Whoa, it's bigger than here than I thought, he said. Damn, brighter too. The harsh light was reflecting from a room painted entirely in white. From the cabinets to the white counter to the white tiles on the floor. Even the furniture, a familiar set of white wooden table and chairs. Why would they need an extra kitchen upstairs? Preston asked, wandering inside. Duh. For the servants, Gregory said, moving down the line of cabinets to open and close each one. Hey, there's food in here. Cereal and rice and stuff. Cheerios and frosted flakes. I already knew that without looking. Servants don't need their own kitchen, idiot, Derek replied. Rich people with servants don't even go in the kitchen. You're going to suck at being rich as much as you suck at being poor now. Damn, dude, that cuts deep, Gregory said. The fridge is working too, and this food looks really fresh. I reached through the darkness on my right and flipped on the light switch, exactly where I knew it would be. How could I fail to recognize the exact kitchen in the house I grew up in? Everything from the design of the room to the same brand of microwave and same blue curtains with white clouds hanging on the opposite end of the room. The only difference was that the windows were all walled up now. Every detail was the same. Family pictures hanging on the wall. Fresh tomatoes on the counter from my mother's garden. And yes, as hesitant as I am to say aloud for the pure absurdity it sounds, even to me, there was my father sitting at the kitchen table with a closed book in his hands. My friends all flinched from the light of my flipped switch, their sudden unease apparent. How could the food be fresh? Derek asked quietly. We've been here for months, and it must have been sealed up for longer than that. You don't think someone has been living here, do you? Preston asked, taking a hesitant shuffle back toward the door. No way, Derek said. I don't even know how there's there's space for a room here. There definitely couldn't be anywhere else for them to hide. I don't know what bothered me more, that I was seeing my father again for the first time since his death, or that my friends obviously couldn't see what I sensed directly before me. My dad was staring right at me looking at me the way I remember him in my most nostalgic childhood memories. Strong and healthy with straight brown hair without a hint of gray. Keen stern eyes over the rim of his glasses were locked on my own. There had to have been someone, Gregory said, agreeing with Preston and backing toward the door. There's still dishes in the damn sink, and they aren't even moldy or anything. Let's get out of here. Yeah, I bet the landlord lives here. Hell, I bet he's still been living in the house to keep an eye on us, and we hadn't noticed. This place is big enough, and he could have just been using the back door not leaving his room. I know he seems suspicious, even after we paid the security deposit, Derek said. We're probably in his kitchen right now. By this point, all three of them had crowded back out the door. I still hadn't broken eye contact with my father, who was now smirking softly. I felt helpless to blink, let alone follow my friends. Hurry up, man, Gregory called to me. If he catches us here, he's going to be pissed. 
We can just use Derek's clear tape to put the wallpaper back up and he will never know. You should go with them, my father said in his voice, as thoughtful and measured as it always had been. You wouldn't want to be caught somewhere you don't belong. I'm going to stay, I said to my friends, my back still to them. You guys go ahead, I'll catch up. Seriously, man, the landlord is going to kick us out if he catches us, Derek said. Please hurry up. The second that you've been thinking about your whole life, my father was saying. He pushed his chair back roughly across the floor and stood to face me. Did you hear that? Preston asked, clearly reacting to the sound of the chair. Oh, he's coming. Screw it, let's leave him. If he gets caught, it's his own fault. I'm not going down with him. Is almost here. My father finished. I didn't move. I think I'd forgotten how to. I was in such a state of shock that I didn't know what to do. And all I could think was that if I left now, then I was sure I would never see him again. A few frozen seconds passed together in one big clump of time. And before I could react, I heard the sound of the door closing behind me. The slam snapped me to my senses enough for me to turn and look at the place my friends had stood a moment before. I jerked back to face my father once more. He had taken a step closer. A brain makes sense of scaling and distance, so naturally that we hardly ever notice the process until it stops working. That's the effect I felt when my father had grown several inches in apparent height from the single forward step he'd taken. The effect was replicated with his second step, which brought him towering over me in a way that I hadn't seen since early childhood memories. And as he moved, he seemed to be aging, putting on weight, as his skin creased and wrinkled before my eyes, his stature shrinking backward toward a more moderate perspective, so much less powerful and sure than he had a moment before. This process didn't slow as he reached and then passed the age he appeared when I saw him last. Second by excruciating second, I watched him growing old as he never did in life. He appeared more wise than ever, as the gray blossomed into thick white hair, his eyes sparkling all the more for their piercing insight. All too quickly this, too, had passed, making way for the shriveling and decrepit decay of old age. He was still moving towards me, only a few paces away, but he trembled every time he lifted his leg to move. One step away, but he never made it any closer. His tremulous leg collapsed suddenly under his own weight, and he pitched toward the floor at my feet. I dove to catch him, and together we both tumbled, although I at least managed to cushion his fall. I held him against my chest for several seconds, afraid to pull back and look at his face for fear of what withered shell of a human being which would remain at the very end of these prophetic years. I felt his fingers clutching feebly against my shirt, then they stopped. His last breath rattled free, and all the heat fled from his corpse against me. And in that breathless second, I think my own heart must have stopped as well, because never in my life have I felt such a profound stillness, broken only by the probing fingers which began to stir once more. The fingers weren't soft and warm anymore, rigid and bony, pushing into my chest like I had fallen against sharp rocks. Harder and faster with every moment, pawing at me like an animal desperate to dig into the ground. I tried to wrestle free from the cold form, wrapping itself around me. It heaved upwards and pushed me into the floor, its rigid legs pinning me painfully while its hands tore into my chest. I managed to get my arms out from under me and tried to cross them over my body to shield myself. I might as well have been trying to stop a crowbar with my hands. The force of the flashing bone pummeled through my defenses and tore my chest open, but I didn't feel any pain. The skin parted as cleanly as the knife through wallpaper had. The skeletal hand inserted a finger into the crack and slid it down toward my stomach, and my whole torso began to open up in the same clean fashion. I couldn't breathe or call for help, and I was helpless but to lie and watch as the skeleton inserted its second hand to widen the cavity in my body. I willed myself to watch and not look away. I couldn't see the leering. I couldn't not see the leering skull above me, grinning in blasphemy against my father's gentle smirk. 
The skeleton kept at its work until it had split me from head to groin, cleanly separating me into two equal halves. I distinctly wondered which half of me was doing the wondering, but that thought quickly gave way to a fixated awareness on the empty darkness which existed in place of blood and bone and internal systems. No, not darkness at all. There was a single light in there too, perhaps a single soul for us both to share, and like a single star in the night sky, it was made all the brighter for the vast emptiness around it. Gently, slowly, with reverence as though stooping at an altar, the skeleton lay down inside me. Its arms were my arms, its legs were my legs, its skull sliding into the black emptiness of my head to fit snugly into place. Then those arms, which were not my arms, curved around my body, hugging myself and pulling the two halves together to form a single whole. I didn't go in that room again after the wallpaper was put back up. That must have been the first night since he died that I didn't miss him anymore. I don't know how long this process took, maybe ten minutes or more, but whenever I remember it, I like to think of it all happening in a single second. After all, if that's all it takes to get from heaven to hell, then why wouldn't someone who is made whole again make it back just as fast? There are walls in this world that cannot be crossed. There is no force so great, nor light so harsh, nor sound so loud as to penetrate them. These walls are hidden from us, and we may go our entire life not realizing what secret places we are forbidden to enter. How can one know about such walls that cannot be seen or felt? There are secret places where the walls are stretched thin, where it's no longer clear which side is which. Places where things that do not belong to our world slip in without notice. Places where one of us can disappear and never find our way back again. I know, because I found such a place two nights ago. Like most things, it began with a girl. I would have killed for her, and I wish that she knew it. She was my classmate during my senior year at university. I didn't know what love was supposed to feel like, but she burned a hole in my awareness that left little room for anything beside. Her slightest murmur drowned out the surrounding noise, the barest turn of her head in my direction, causing all other motion to cease. I remember how the half-dozen words we shared played on repeat for the rest of the day, and by the time I laid down to sleep that night, burning from the flush of my own thoughts, I knew that I was lost. As the semester progressed, we grew even closer than I dared hope possible, but I was a fool to think I was the only one to notice her grace. Of course, she was already engaged to marry, and I accepted that it was my role to only admire her from a distance. The wedding was fast approaching, though, and I couldn't bear the thought of us going our separate ways in life without her ever knowing how much better my world was with her in it. I began to fantasize about situations where her fiancé humiliated himself in some impossible competition between us. I dreamt about making some grand romantic gesture, but I lacked the courage to even whisper aloud. Each dream grew more vivid and elaborate, distracting me from the ache of jealous desperation that I could never bury deep enough to forget. Then came the night before her wedding. The night she kissed me on the cheek and thanked me for being her friend. I couldn't sleep after that. Couldn't sit still. Couldn't hear myself think over the pulse of my own frustrated desire. Sweating, miserable, anxious without relief. I forced myself to go for a walk to clear my head of her. Past unfamiliar streets. Down unknown roads. I walked so far that I left the city lights behind and found myself amidst the slouching ruin of long abandoned houses. I'd been walking for hours, but I hadn't succeeded in leaving her behind. I sat down beside an old, boarded-up well to rest. I noticed a small hole between the planks large enough to fit a coin through. Fishing around in my pocket, I found some loose change to drop through the opening, wishing myself happiness and a life without her, and wishing her the best even if that meant a life without me. I didn't expect there to still be water in the well, but it wasn't the plopping of my coins that surprised me. It was the rattle of something underneath the boards, and the quarter which slipped out from the hole to roll at my side. I thought it must have hit a rock and bounced back up at me somehow for a moment, but that moment ended when I heard a voice echoing from below. Hello? Is there someone down there? 
Do you mean up here? I called back. Are you stuck in the well? What are you talking about? You're the one in the well. The only thing that made sense to me was that someone was trapped in there all the same. I worked at one of the planks until I could get it loose, flinging it aside to get a proper look below. There wasn't anyone there, though. Nothing but the dark water and my reflection peering into it. Then I watched as my reflection dropped another coin. The spinning metal hit the water on his side, then continued falling upward until it rattled on the bottom of one of the remaining boards. The two of us were identical, right down to the clothes we were wearing and the smudge of lipstick on our cheeks. That stood out to me the most, and on impulse I asked him if he was here because of her. He said yes, and I knew the two of us were living exactly the same life, only we were living it in very different worlds, not knowing the other existed until that very moment. There are a million things we might have said to the other in such a circumstance, but the two of us knew without words that she was the only thing on our mind, and felt so good to finally admit my feelings openly to the only person who could completely understand. We both shared the same hopes and fears and sullen depression as we accepted our fate, but I was the one who figured out what had to be done. If we don't tell her, we'll always wonder what could have been, I said. But if we do, we might ruin her own shot at being happy and lose her forever as a friend. The only way we won't always wonder is for the two of us to each do something different. We'll flip a coin, he said. Because of course he must have liked the idea for me to think it. Heads, you tell her, and I don't. Tails, you tell her, and we'll meet back here tomorrow night to tell the other how it went. He flipped the coin down to the water, and it kept flipping all the way until it got to me. I snatched it out of the air and slapped it against my wrist, and the other me and I locked eyes. I'm scared, he said, but he was smiling. Heads, I'm going to tell her, I said, showing him the coin. His smile broadened, and I could easily imagine how relieved he must have felt. I was terrified, and he knew it, and somehow that made it all okay. Do it in person, he told me. Don't hold anything back. Make it count. I really hope it works out for you. I hope it works out for us. So I told her that I loved her. It was after two in the morning by the time I got back home, and almost three by the time I got to her place. I didn't text or call. I just knocked on the door. I was so occupied rehearsing everything I might say that I didn't even realize how freaked out she must be to hear someone knocking at that time. I almost ran away right then but I held my ground until she opened the door. She leaned against the frame with a smug curiosity, wearing nothing but her underwear and a baggy t-shirt. All the words I had prepared dissolved like mist, so before she asked me a question I couldn't answer, I just blurted it out. I told her I loved her, and that it was the will of the universe that she should hear it from me tonight. For the second time that night she kissed me, and the universe rejoiced with me. We stayed up all night talking, and she didn't get married the next day. She said she'd suspected the truth, but hadn't trusted the feeling enough until I'd had the courage to come to her door. She told me she was so happy that I told her in time. I asked her what she would have done if I'd waited until uh, after she was married to tell her. She shook her head and wouldn't say, and I knew the answer hurt too much to try and pry. She was going to have a hard time explaining her change of heart, and I promised to be respectful and not rush her in any way. We spent all the next day together, and I was so deliriously happy that discovering a parallel dimension only seemed like the second most magical thing to happen. That night I drove out past where the city lights dried up, to the boarded up well. I couldn't wait to tell the other me the good news. He started laughing when I told him, and then both of us were laughing without quite knowing why. It made me tell him every detail of what I said and did and how she reacted, and I told him everything. Everything except when I asked her what would have happened if I waited one more day. I wanted the other me to be as happy as I was, and I couldn't bear to steal the joy from our eyes. We made a promise to return the next night, and I did. The next time I looked into the dark water, he wasn't there yet, though, and I saw nothing where my reflection should have been peering over the lip of the well. I sat with my back against the stone and waited for him a long time before I finally heard his voice. I kissed her, he said. I jumped up and peered over the rim of the well. I was sure I heard him, 
but I still couldn't see any reflection on the other side. She didn't kiss me back, he said. I didn't catch up with her until she was in the train station. They were going on their honeymoon, upstate, and I managed to get her alone and I kissed her. She said we would have to talk about this when she got back. I told her I loved her and she pushed me away. The voice sounded different than I remembered it. There wasn't as much of an echo to it, and it took me longer than it should have to figure out why. I didn't realize what had happened, until a heavy blow beat against the underside of the old boards. He'd gone through the water, and climbed up my side of the well. Why should you get her and I don't? It isn't right, he said. We flipped a coin, we had a deal. You cheated. Part of the old wood ripped away in his hand. He was bracing with his back and legs against the side of the well, to stay in place while his hands were free to widen the opening. How did I cheat? I didn't stop you from telling her. You did. I might have told her myself if you hadn't stopped me. This is your fault. Beating. Beating on the decaying barrier. The pounding sound frightened a flock of settled birds nearby, and they all went up in a frightened rush. My heart was running wild with panic. I couldn't fully process what was going on. All I knew is that I couldn't let him get above the rim of the well. That if we were both here on one side, then I wouldn't need to be physically attacked to suffer for it. I wouldn't be myself. My life wouldn't be my own. And she wouldn't be mine so long as he and I stood on equal ground. That's why I grabbed a piece of the broken wood and brought it down on his head. I didn't know I was going to do it before it happened, and he looked just as surprised as I was. The blow was enough to make him slip and tumble back toward the water. He fell straight through, but he caught himself on the other side. Through the water, he stared up at me, blood from the gash across his hairline dribbling down his face. What could I do? I couldn't stand there forever and wait for him to try and crawl back up again. I couldn't go down into his world and let him live in mine, not without losing her. All I know is that I shouldn't have done what I did. I shouldn't have turned and ran to my car. I shouldn't have given him the chance to escape into my world, because I know that's what I would have done. I would have killed for her, and so can he. He knows where I work, he knows where I sleep, he knows everything about me, and if I were to disappear, he could take my place and no one would ever know. Lauren Daniels, you need to know, that's why I'm writing this down. If you read this, you'll know to ask me about the well, I'll tell you the truth if you do. But if you ask him and he pretends that he doesn't know, then love him all the same. This is proof that neither of us could live in a world without you. There are only two things worth knowing about hell. You wouldn't be there if you didn't deserve it, and you can't get out unless someone offers you a ticket. You're probably imagining all sorts of other things worth knowing, such as what the demons look like, and how you'll be punished, and what exactly the thermostat is set to. There's no point speculating though, because all the unpleasant sights and feelings you're imagining are the sensations of a living body that you've left far behind. There's no torture worse than the knowledge you're right where you belong, and if you don't believe me, I politely suggest you go to hell and see for yourself. When I was alive, I would have done anything in the name of love. The lengths I would go through just to see her, to hold her, to lose myself in her until I didn't know myself when I was alone. Until inevitably came the day when I became a stranger to myself, and she became a stranger to me. The two of us turned to poison in the other's veins. Then I would leave her to pursue a fresh intoxication, to make me feel whole again happy so long as I didn't remember those I left behind. I had a child, more than one, perhaps many more. I know there was a little girl who suffered for me, shuffled from home to home until she was swallowed by the streets. I know there was a boy who wished his father would come back again, although perhaps he wouldn't have if he knew his father was someone like me. I would tell you their names if I could. I would have recited them to myself every moment I was in hell, wishing the best for them, though I know they didn't get the best from me. But I was dead, and they were lost, and that's how it would always be if I hadn't received a ticket out. It wasn't something I earned, 
or found or stole, though the devil knows what I would have done to get it. I don't know how long I was mired in misery, but I do know there was no shortage of others who have languished far longer. All that matters is that it was into my hands she pressed folded paper and my ears that were blessed with her sweet words. Be free to leave. No one will try to stop you anymore. And don't worry. If you ever change your mind, it's a two-way ticket and you can come back whenever you want. I wish I could describe her, my savior, but what word does justice to those who dwell beyond living senses? I could call her Grace, but you would only see slender feet dancing through the glass without capturing the light of her soul. I could call her Hope, but you would only feel the flush of excitement beneath your skin and miss the infinite in her cloudless eyes. No, I shall not sully her with any of our impoverished words. It is enough that you know she had a ticket and that she was giving it to me. Why would anyone ever come back? I asked. You might as well ask why anyone would ever come at all, is all she would reply. And so I passed beneath the shadows that were cast without light, and each time the horrors of the shade loomed over me, I would close my eyes and present the paper in my hand, only to feel the pressure of their presence melt back into the dark. I did not slow to listen to the anguish of those left behind, nor was I hindered as I rose into the endless light. All I could think of was getting out, starting over, not sparing a thought for what lay waiting on the other side. The light I entered was more than something to be seen. It was something to be felt, to be heard, to be smelled, all rushing back to me in a crushing wave. I'd persisted in the emptiness beyond life for so long that I'd forgotten what it was like to be again. It was all too loud, too hot, too bright, all intermingled so I couldn't tell which was which, nor up from down, nor good from bad. Too much, too fast, too hard. I did the only thing I could. I began to cry, and then sob, and then wail, and that was exactly what I was supposed to do. I had been born again, but it was different this time. Staring up at my mother's face as she cradled me in her arms, I remembered everything that I had endured thus far. I even remembered that this woman was my mother, and that the man with his arm around her was my father, and that they were going to take me home to the same blue carpeted room I always remembered growing up in. I hadn't just to been born. I had been born into my own body. But if that were true, then why couldn't I stop crying once I realized what was going on? Why would my arm move without command? Why would I grab hold of the end of the fork even though I knew it would be sharp? Why did I think these thoughts, yet be locked inside a child that couldn't speak aloud? I hadn't just been born into my body. I had been born into my old life, and I was trapped inside without being able to change a thing. A prisoner to my every mistake. A helpless victim to rise and fall with the iron whims of fate. I could see and hear and feel everything that the body experienced. But my thoughts were cut off from those of the boy that would grow up to be me. I couldn't warn him of what was to come, or change my inevitable actions or so much as whisper to let him know that I was there. The newborn body spent most of its time sleeping, and that gave me lots of time to really think about what was to come. I was going to relive every embarrassing moment, every sickness, every defeat, all the way until my own death, every long night, every heartbreak, every regret, even worse this time around, for knowing they were coming despite my body fooling itself into fleeting happiness. Somewhere in the back of the child's mind sat I, with a piece of folded paper still resting in my hand. It was a two-way ticket, and I could go back. But right now the child was only sleeping, and how could I say that I would prefer hell to this? I would wait, I told myself, until I couldn't take it anymore. One day I'd know my life had been ruined, and I'd use the ticket, but not today or tomorrow, or tomorrow, or tomorrow. Because I had spent a long, long time in the darkness, and I had forgotten how beautiful the world can be. Even if I couldn't control this new body, I still experienced its thrill of pleasure as it made each new discovery. The first strawberry, the first dog, 
the first time seeing the ocean from the window of a car. I had seen infinity after I had died, and I saw it again now through a child's eyes. And before I knew it, the years were starting to pass me by. I knew I was reliving my exact life, but it was amazing how many things I had forgotten over time. Even the childhood memories that I did possess, vague and faded as they may be, did nothing to ruin these visceral experiences. It was almost as good as living for the first time. By now I had spent so long as a silent passenger that it didn't even feel strange not to choose how the story would play out. I'd wince when I knew I was about to slide down that splintery post. But I'd also remember that it barely even hurt when I woke up the next day. I felt a hot rage of not getting a toy I wanted at the store, and then remember that I'd gotten that toy on Christmas that same year, and that it had broken within the first 20 minutes. Every hurt and injustice that I had been dreading so much had seemed like the end of the world at the time, but now that I was living through them again, I knew that none of it would matter forever. So I let the years slip on, and watched as I grew into the same man I ever was. And then I met her again, my first love, and I felt the heart in my body stop, as if it were my own. Looking at her as I did in the moment we first met, I couldn't understand how I had ever stopped loving her. But I would understand, because I had no choice but to live through it all again. I'd relieve every little stress and insecurity, and petty jealousy which would grow until it swallowed me up. I'd yell at her, and lie to her, and hurt her in ways deeper than flesh can heal. Yet, here I was, trapped and helpless as I watched how she couldn't stop smiling, how her eyes would dart away but always find their way back to mine. I knew what it would feel like when all the love drained away from those eyes, only to be replaced by revulsion and remorse. My body didn't understand any of that, though. It only felt the flush of youth and the bubbling of love, so blind and lost that it would chase her again no matter the end. But I knew better, sitting alone at the back of my mind with a folded piece of paper in my hand. There was no point in going back to hell. If I was only trying to avoid grief and pain, hell would be no kinder to me. Here, there would still be moments of happiness to come, but going back to hell would banish even these. If I was only living for myself, then staying must be the right choice to make, and yet if I stayed, I knew I would not be the only one who suffered. Whatever I endured in hell, at least I would be sparing my love and her future children a life with me in it. Better that I should go back where I belong than force fate to play as this hand again. I'm ready to go back now. I said to no one in particular, I've still got my ticket, and I want to go back. I closed myself away from the light and the noise and the smells of the world, and I was in the darkness once more, and out from that darkness I felt a touch upon my wrist, and I thought it was my savior, my grace, come to take me back to the other side. Yet, when I opened my eyes, I saw myself still living in the world with my future love smiling back at me and I knew that I was the one opening my own eyes this time. And when I folded my hand over hers, I knew that was a choice I was making now, one that had never happened the first time around. Whether you're ready remains to be seen, said no one in particular in reply. Are you feeling okay? Do you want to get out of here? My love asked me, just the way she had on the day we'd first met. No, I don't want to leave. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I told her. From the way she smiled, she must have known I was talking about her. My ticket has gotten me out of hell, but will it bring me back again? I suppose that's up to me to decide. The men in black were definitely coming to dissect us. Imagine your own mind is no longer private. Your thoughts are out in the open, no longer just yours. A constant stream of consciousness slamming into your skull. A simple thought multiplying, erupting inside your head with enough pressure to almost knock you off your chair. The men in black are definitely going to dissect us. Ten individual and equally irritating voices hit me like a wave of ice water, a rabid hive mind of thoughts creeping into the back of my mind. There was always an echo, a sharp reverberation rattling my skull like phantom fingers poking at my brain. 
Sitting in front of my college dean, my gaze on the grains of her desk, it took everything in me, grasping hold of the upholstery of my chair and digging the heels of my shoes into the carpet, not to let out an audible cry. Ten voices, ten thoughts, ten sensations, screaming into my skull at the same time. I would compare it to a nuclear bomb going off. I could never pick out one thought, so it was either all of them or none of them. Sam's thoughts often repeated, and Liam's were too quiet. Josie screamed, and Blair was unintentionally painful. Sometimes voices entangled into one single string, a singularity so powerful, I was well aware of blood dripping from my nose. I tentatively pressed the sleeve of my jacket over my nose. Liam and Freddy were the human embodiment of dentist drills, and it was their words, their tangled inner shrieks, that were trying to rip me apart. The men in black were definitely here to dissect us. Dean Carter had a framed photo of a kitten on her desk. I focused on that. On her desk, photos of smiling children and a dog with a squeaky toy lodged into its mouth. Until my brain stopped bouncing around, I managed to exhale when, finally, it stopped. Fading into that same white noise of voices, I still couldn't untangle no matter how hard I tried. Mr. M. Dean Carter's low murmur was a relief, actual speech, opposed to whatever the hell we were. Are you all right? Swallowing a hiss, I nodded. Yes, I said. But could I ask why I'm here? Dean Carter's smile was strained. Uh, Lana, we just want to talk to you. I nodded, sweat beating down my neck and back. That's fine, I spoke coolly, holding my concentration. The white noise shrieking stopped, though I still couldn't sense the eleventh and twelfth voices missing from that spider web inside my head. I gestured toward the deep, blue-colored door on the other side of the room, which hadn't moved in a while. But isn't it illegal to trap your students in the supply closet? Her expression didn't waver. They're fine. The muffled cries we both heard said otherwise. Dean Carter's smile crumpled a little. They don't sound fine. Cocking her head, she changed the subject, of course, back to me. Lana, is there something on your mind? I wasn't sure how to answer that. Suddenly, developing telepathic abilities wasn't the strangest part of my day. In fact, the telepathy part isn't new. It's been going on for several weeks. Getting questioned by my college dean, who was definitely suspicious of us, was new. Weirdly enough, our college has always been at the center of strange happenings and disappearances that couldn't be explained. While the student body couldn't explain them, anyone with half a brain could. In 2017, a freshman girl dropped off the face of the earth with no trace. In 2022, a group of students now infamous for their campus podcast, Know It All, told the story of their apparent trip into the 1980s after slipping through a crack in time in the old student lounge. Their wild story garnered so much attention that some kids had decorated it in fairy lights, penning it a gateway. I guess if someone really wanted to dig into these events, the 2017 disappearing freshman and the student lounge being a gateway to the 1980s, they would find semi-plausible explanations for both. The guys were probably on some type of high and had some mass hallucination and the girl dropped out of school without telling anyone. There. The unexplained was now the explained. One look at CCTV footage showed the girl leaving campus in the middle of the night. Mystery solved. However, there was actual credibility to some of these happenings. Such as Tommy Phelps. I think I spoke to him once or twice. Casual conversation. He was a nice guy, a bit of a cinephile, a twinge of an Aussie accent, and slightly on the pretentious side. In my freshman year, just two months into the semester, Tommy claimed he was kidnapped and experimented on. Something had definitely happened to him. Kidnapping was possible, given the state of the kid, but... The boy's eyes were wide, unseeing, half of his hair shaved off. He stumbled into class one day, insisting his mind had been messed with, and he couldn't remember anything except walls of glass. I remember that class vividly. It was my first time feeling real proper fear. The type that creeps up on you, a phantom snake winding its way around my throat. I watched a normal level-headed boy completely break apart, 
dropping to his knees and rocking back and forth. What he was wearing confused me, an ancient college sweatshirt and a crumpled pair of shorts. It was the college gym clothes, but Tommy didn't go near the sports department. Everyone was paying attention to the markings on his face, noticeable stitches on the back of his head, while I was frowning at Tommy's clothes. Known for his stark taste in clothing, often flaunting waistcoats or tweed jackets with elbow patches, sportswear was definitely different. Not to mention the gym clothes were ancient. Why would he be wearing an outdated sweater dating back to the early 2000s? His feet were bare, pointing to him being in captivity. Please, staggering through the doorway, his steps were clumsy, topsy-turvy. When he hit the ground on his stomach, our startled-looking professor ran out of the room yelling for help. Please help me. Tommy. Rhea Martinez dropped onto her knees in front of him. Rhea had the kind of face you automatically wanted to trust. Her eyes were kind, light brown hair framing a heart-shaped face. She was gentle, tracing the tips of her fingers across his cheek. He wouldn't let her fully touch him, shaking his head rapidly, letting out a soft moan when she firmly placed her hands on his shoulders. Tommy, what happened? I don't know. I don't know, he whispered, frenzied eyes meeting hers. I got it. I got away. Rhea nodded slowly. Got away from where? Tommy's eyes widened, his lips splitting into a cry. So loud. He slammed his hands over his ears. Why are you so, why are you so, so, so loud? Tommy, Rhea said softly. No, no, get off me. Get away from me. Tommy's words were nonsensical and tangled, hands clawing clumps of his hair. Something about a room of glass, and his head being probed and poked at. As he spoke, the boy's sanity bled away, his eyes widening with mania, terror, lips twisting into a snarl, and then a twisted grin, followed by three words that have been analyzed by every amateur journalist on campus. I witnessed them firsthand. Bread. Tommy spoke through his teeth. His gaze was frantic, trying to find a face he could trust. Rhea was already backing away, stumbling over herself. I don't think he really saw any of us, shuffling into the wall like a wild animal. Wrapping his arms around his knees, Tommy continued, rocking back and forth, like he was lulling himself to sleep. Gemini, his voice rose into an animalistic cry, and the boy's body seemed to react, his expression going flat, arms falling to his sides. When his eyes rolled back to pearly whites, I turned away, a sour bile filling my mouth. But I still heard him in vivid clarity, his tone bleeding of emotion. Norbrook. The last words slipped from the boy's lips, and when I twisted around, his head was lolling to the side, deep red rivulets running from his nose. Norbrook. He spoke like he was tasting the words, his body rattling like it was reacting. Tommy's head snapped up and through vacant eyes he peered at us like a confused child, frowning at his blood-slicked hands. Red. He made a fist. Gemini. When Tommy turned to look at us again, his eyes flickered, like he was waking up, emotion igniting his face. Nor? Brooke? Everyone had their own version of what happened that day through word of mouth. Some idiot said Tommy started giggling hysterically, while the head of the college newspaper published that he held us hostage with a box cutter. The most popular and talked about version was that Tommy Phelps attacked a student like an animal, but that's just the sensationalized version. People wanted to believe he was violent because that was interesting. It got likes and comments. It got kids talking, making more rumors and adding to the fire, igniting fear of a viral outbreak and a new strain of rabies. The thing is, though, that... Reality wasn't nearly as horrifying as the rumors made it out to be. Tommy didn't attack anyone. Blinking rapidly and seemingly himself again, he reached out blindly, shaking with terror. For a disorienting moment, his expression bled coherency despite empty eyes staring straight through us. So much so that part of me wanted to believe what he was saying. His hands were caked with dirt, clawing at us. I noticed the nails on his index, pinky and thumb had been pulled off. Help me, he whimpered, when security dragged him from the room. 
Tommy erupted into hysterics halfway down the hallway, those same three words coming out in sharp, heavy breaths, his body violently squirming, kicking and screaming, his voice growing louder, more desperate. Red, he spluttered, choking on the word like it suffocated him. I glimpsed red splatter on the floor. Gemini! Tommy's voice tripped up, his body going limp, the guard wrestling with him threw the boy over his shoulder. We watched silently as the door slammed on the boy, but I could still hear his slurred cry bouncing off the walls. Nor, Brooke. Tommy didn't come back to class after that. He did, however, make a cryptic social media post saying, I was high on cocaine, lol. When the guy was a top student, I never touched the stuff. Sure, we could buy it if we really wanted, but after listening to multiple episodes of Know-It-All, I knew the hosts had not only proved the social media post was fabricated, but also had stalked his dorm, which had been mysteriously emptied, his roommates also MIA. In episode 12, they revealed Tommy's parents had randomly uprooted their life in Southern California and moved to Australia. The college brushed all of this under the rug. However, know-it-all asked them to comment and were swiftly threatened with a stubborn shutdown and forced to make the podcast private. So... I count Tommy's state and disappearance an actual strange occurrence on campus. The conspiracy nut part of me wondered if the college was purposefully over-exaggerating the easily explained to cover up the unexplainable. There was no big mystery, and these so-called strange happenings were just vocalized to make our mediocre community college actually look interesting, while the actual unexplained events, i.e. the infamous Red, Gemini, Norbrook, were ignored. Why don't you apply to Hollingwood University? We have disappearing students and cracks in space and time. Forget about the, uh, the whispers about the boy who actually went missing. Have you ever actually wanted to fall directly into 1985? Our student lounge is a portal. What couldn't be explained in any logic, sense, or aspect, however, was my English language arts class simultaneously developing telepathy out of nowhere. You could argue that it wasn't completely out of nowhere considering the already weird things going on around campus. But for us, this was new. It was weird and confusing, and none of us had any idea how it happened. Nothing connected us. There were no secret experiments, and we hadn't signed up for the shady after-hours classes or been caught up in an explosion. Nope. Two months ago, I fell asleep with a mostly empty head and woke up to a hurricane of painful white noise I couldn't stop or control. It felt like my brain was being cooked alive. When I opened my eyes, my pillow was covered in blood, my lips and chin dripping in smeared scarlet. I stood up and my body wouldn't work, tipping onto the side. My housemate was already in class. It was the TV, I thought dizzily, blinking colors from my eyes. That noise, it had to be the TV, surely. But the TV wasn't on. The TV was never on because who watched TV anymore? I thought I was going crazy. Seriously. I called the doctor, kneeling on my bathroom floor with my forehead pressed to the cool porcelain of my toilet. I can hear things, I croaked out. I need you to get it out of my head, now. Miss Duran, could you please repeat that? Her lack of interest in the call boiled my blood. I said, I gritted through my teeth. I think. Squeezing my eyes shut somehow made the pressure worse spiraling colors in my eyes in the worst damn mind grain imaginable. I did everything to combat it. I lay down in a dark room, but the stream of noise in my head grew louder, TV static buzzing in the root of my brain. I'm going crazy. I could barely hear the receptionist over the constant, never-ending screech in my head. I was still speaking, my lips moving curving and curling and forming words I couldn't even hear. Do you hear me? I had to screech to hear the slightest fragments of my own voice bleeding into my ears. I'm going crazy. I grabbed at my hair, hysterical, clawing at my scalp. There's something in my head. I sobbed, burying my face into the cool silk of my pajama shorts. There's something there. I can feel it. I was well aware of how messed up I sounded, and I kept stabbing at my temple. The pain was helping me visualize it perfectly. I could feel them, sense them, tiny bugs writhing into the meat of my brain, 
razor-sharp teeth gnawing into the tumor-sized cavern they had already chewed. There. I hissed over the whistling that had started up, digging deep down into the root of my skull. It's right there. Miss Duran, I'm not sure what you mean. Throwing my phone down, I found myself half-conscious, blinking down at the sharpest knife I could find, standing in front of my bathroom mirror. I was deathly pale, almost a greenish color, my hair glued to my forehead with sweat. It was never going to stop, the light show of colors dancing in my eyes, my blurry vision contorting the world around me into a slowly collapsing pinprick. I wasn't aware I'd successfully broken skin until sharp beads of red slid down my wrist. I couldn't feel it, the stinging pain of the blade slicing into my flesh. I couldn't feel the twist of my gut, the sour-tasting barf bridging the back of my throat. All I could feel was the thrumming, the bang, bang, bang on the back of my skull, like someone was knocking. I was dazedly staring down at the knife, cinched between my fingers, when it stopped. I dropped to my knees when the pressure on my head lifted just slightly, a single drop of red splashing onto the tiled floor, followed by a voice so casual, so clear, I thought they were standing behind me. Okay, so if I buy three packs of chips, a Coke, and leave like $15 for gas, I should be good? Dad is picking me up in the evening for that uh, football game, and uh, I need to think of an excuse not to meet him after. I can't miss Simon's 30th. When I turned my head, there was nobody there. I was kneeling in my bathroom in front of piles and piles of bloody tissue paper, and a toil seat stained, revealing red. The voice continued, a foreign feeling growing in my head, seeping into my bones. I'm cold. The voice hit me again, this time like a brick to the face. Should I wear a jacket? No, 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 I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Before I could stop myself, I was diving to unsteady feet and clamoring out of the bathroom and down the stairs. Just as I thought, the stranger inside my head was getting louder. I reached the front door, sticking my head out into the early morning sunlight, and there he was. Ah, it's cold. I should have worn a coat. Mom was right. His voice slipped into static once more, before drifting back into fruition. And anyway, it's not like the sex is bad. It was just a normal guy cruising down the sidewalk, clad in a suit and tie, hair slicked back. He looked like a recent graduate. The guy walked past my house and offered me a shy smile, but I noticed the strain in his expression. He quickly turned away, his lip curling. Is that girl okay? Was that blood? Ah, oh, dang. Does she need me to call someone? The guy risked a look back before turning back around. No, I'm late. Probably a nosebleed. He stopped for a moment, pretending to check his phone. Why is she staring at me? Damn, do I have crap on my face? The guy's voice didn't disappear until I was standing under my shower spigot, blasting cold water on my face. And even when it did, another tangle of sharp consciousness dug its way into the back of my mind, a single voice bleeding from the hurricane of noise. Hannah needs to get her head out of his ass, because he's playing her like a damn... Staring down at the shower drain, at red-tinged water, the voice skipped again. This time a woman. I couldn't tell where it was coming from. Outside? Across the road? This thing worked like a cell phone, bleeding in and out of the network. I don't think I can deal with today, the woman sighed. I should have had more sleep, but that spider on the wall could be anywhere, and I'm... So good? A frat boy sounding guy this time. And this time she pulled out. Light. This time a southern accent pierced my skull. I'm late. Jess is going to kill me. Then a teenage girl's violent hiss that might as well have been the curved age of a blade sticking into my cortex. How many times is she going to do this? How many snaps is she going to ignore? She's a petty, childish, damn... The voices kept skipping until I stuffed in earphones and cranked up the volume. Music didn't help, but it did soothe slightly. The voices were still there, but I could drown and out with screamo. Officially, the phenomenon I was going through was telepathy. I googled it, just to make sure. Telepathy, also known as mind reading is the supposed communication of thoughts and ideas by means other than the known senses. Mind reading had always sounded cool in the movies, but actually having it 
is the equivalent of someone implanting a radio into the back of your head. It's not like I could control it. The second I stepped onto campus and removed my earphones, the rush of noise came back, slamming into me, this time in a hiss of incomprehensible voices and an explosion I could feel in the backs of my eyes. The pressure of several thousand voices brought the pressure back tenfold. Different tones, accents, languages and volumes. People think loudly, and they don't even realize they're doing it. Thinking, to anyone else, is normal. To me, it's a tsunami. I had a semi-plan. I would try and tolerate my first class, and if it was too much, escape to the nurse's office off of campus and beg for an MRI. There had to be a logical explanation to why I was hearing people's thoughts, and why they were so loud and intrusive. I had heard of medical phenomenons that even top scientists couldn't explain. Some girl had woken up speaking Mandarin despite not knowing the language. So these things did happen. It was just rare. Keeping my earphones corked in, I stepped into English language arts. I wasn't expecting to bump into a congregation of my classmates standing around a table. A glance to the front immediately put me on guard. Where was Professor King? Standing a few feet away was Jordan Main, an ex-host of Know-It-All. The others kicked him out when he suggested spying on Tommy's family was insensitive. As usual, Jordan's expression was annoyed, his features prickling with irritation. His hair was an untidy mop of dark curls and standing in a crumpled pajama shirt over well-worn jeans. I noticed he wasn't as put together as usual. His camera, also an extension of his identity, was nowhere to be seen. I don't think I'd ever seen the guy looking so disheveled, like he had just crawled straight out of bed. There was a subtle tension in his posture, with the way he was rocking back and forth on his heels. When he caught my eye, I realized the others weren't speaking. The entire class were half-dressed, odd socks and tousled hair, jackets half thrown on. The only one who wasn't joining in was Harry Astor, hiding at the back of the classroom. What's going on? I spoke out loud over my screamo music. Jordan didn't speak, instead motioning for me to remove my headphones. I'm good, I said, forcing a smile that hurt my head. Where's Professor King? His lip curled and again motioned for me to remove my music. I did, after glimpsing the smear of dark red crusting his nostril. Uncorking my ears, the sensation slammed into me, this time a physical wave almost knocking me off my feet. I could hear them, all of them, a tangled wave of screaming slicing into my skull. Jordan's hands pressed down on my shoulder when I tried to back away, forcing me to face the others. Okay, try now. His voice slipped through the noise. Can you hear me? His lips weren't moving. Wide eyes glued to me. Something ice cold skittered down my spine. Jordan Maine was speaking directly into my mind. I nodded shakily, drinking in ten pairs of eyes staring at me. Testing, testing. Jordan's voice slipped into my thoughts and it was just his. From the other's expressions, Liam's lip curling and Min gritting her teeth, they could hear him too. Alright, so this works. It takes time to tune everyone out, but it works. He turned to Sierra Miller, the class's spokesperson. You were saying? Sierra rolled her eyes. Okay, yes. Congratulations, you stopped us from having an aneurysm. And folded her arms. But that's only if you're concentrating, right? So if you let go, the floodgates open and we get blasted. Jordan nodded, shrugging. Pretty much. I managed to speak with my mouth. But how? No idea. His voice boomed into my skull. Stop that. Sierra hissed out. You're going to blow my brains out. Telepathy. Jordan said out loud, instead, a shaky laugh escaping his lips. But there was a darkness to his tone, a hollow look in his eye. I couldn't help glimpse. That's cool. I knew the moment Jordan had lost control, because just like Sierra said, the floodgates flew open, a vicious stream of voices flooding into my skull. No, not just mine. Everyone's. And that was two months ago, and we still hadn't gotten the hang of it. Three days ago, I was trying to talk to my friend, already jittery from our professor's sudden disappearance, which happened to be the same day that twelve of us developed telepathy. Two months had passed, and there was no sign of him. With us being Professor King's students, 
We were the prime suspects. Allison was talking about a TV show or something. But her real voice was lost inside the sea of noise scrambling inside my head. I was getting better at tuning people in and out, but it was still a challenge. The buzzing stream of noise was particularly bad that morning, like someone had cranked it up to a hundred. I think I'm pregnant. Am I pregnant? I'm dropping out. This is too... I'm not happy anymore. Did I feed my cat this morning? No, I did. I definitely... And she's not even being subtle about it. It's painful. What an evil bitch. Lana? Bess's low murmur, barely scratching the surface of my mind, drifted into coherent mumbling when the doors to the main reception opened. Two men appearing. Immediately they drew attention. Men in black. Literally. The two of them were heavily clad in crisp, black suits with matching sunglasses, exuding an air of authority and for the student body to move aside. Bess's mouth dropped open, her eyes wide. She pulled me to the side when they walked past. Do you think they're here for the Professor King case? I couldn't hear her voice, but I was getting good at lip reading when the swarm of voices drowned out real ones. I don't know, was all I responded with, my gaze snapping to Sierra down the hall, buried behind a mop of curls, and then Jordan standing with his friends, his head ducked, jaw clenched. He didn't stand out in the crowd like usual wearing darker colors, hiding under his hood. I sensed the prickle of fear in the back of his head, his voice a soft, Hell, uh, don't, don't, please don't, please don't look at me, please don't look at me, please don't look at me. Sierra's expression was twitching, her gaze dropping to the ground when the men strode past her. Stay calm. Sierra's voice was a low murmur, a gentle prod into the meat of my brain. It's a routine visit, she paused. Probably, I mean... Well, why else? Why else would they be here? A routine visit? Jordan's sharp Boston accent joined the wave. Since when do the men in black regularly drop by? Shut up, I managed to say. Both of you, just, just get off of the hallway. We're attracting attention to ourselves here. I was right. We couldn't have looked any less suspicious. I thought the men were heading toward the office, but they seemed to pivot at the last minute and directly toward me. Lana Duran. Lana, what did you do? Sierra's voice was like symbols being crashed together. Hal, they're here for us. They're going to slice us up and dissect us into tiny pieces. What did you do? Calm down, Jordan hissed out. But even he was skeptical. He was an ex-host of Know-It-All, after all. Tommy, I don't think he meant to say that, but his thoughts were no longer private. Could they be here about... Lana. The man's voice easily sliced through Jordan's mental cry, a prickle creeping down my spine, the physical presence that had become almost familiar to me, which was Jordan and Sierra, was cut away, severed suddenly, enough to sting, and the silence in my head that followed was enough to unnerve me. The man's stance seemed to kill every other thought around me, a short circuit, leaving me alone inside my head for the first time in months, and suddenly, deeply, deeply lonely. Yes? I felt like I was speaking in tongues. Instinctively, my gaze snapped to Jordan and Sierra, who were no longer there. I blinked. The two of them had been spirited away, right in front of me. The world kept going around me, students bustling around and Bess gently nudging me, letting me know she was heading to class. Ten voices entered my mind this time, not twelve, and all of them were screaming at me. The man cleared his throat. Lana, I'm Agent Cassidy, this is Agent Powell. Would we be able to talk to you regarding a certain Professor Jason King? Don't worry, we're talking to everyone in your class, so call it A. The guy's voice slipped in and out of my ears, the cries in my head once again being drowned out. This time I did know the reason. Harry Astor was what we called a barricade. No matter what we did, none of us could hear him. His thoughts were null, nothing. A startling oblivion that was so stark, so deep, I kept my distance. His mind and thoughts were impenetrable. Afflicted with telepathic abilities like the twelve of us, Harry didn't take part in emergency meetings or hanging out. He wanted nothing to do with us. His mind was a vacuum, sucking in thoughts as he walked by with his head ducked. Mr. Rand, are you listening to me? I snapped out of it, my own mind detaching from the swarm of nothing which was Harry. 
Nodding, I let them escort me to the dean's office, only for them to disappear, leaving me stuck with her. Ten other voices followed. A confusing string of, Are we getting dissected? Oh god, are the men in black coming to dissect us? Are we being cut up? Jordan and Sierra were in the closet. I could sense them. Still couldn't hear them, though. When Dean Carter pursed her lips, I tried again. You have my friends locked in your supply closet, I said, and as if on cue, the door rattled, startling her from her chair. It hadn't really bothered me before, but now it felt significant. Why couldn't I hear my Dean's thoughts, too? That is none of your concern, Dean Carter relaxed. Where were you on the night of September 18th? Home, she hummed. And what were you doing at home? Lana, what's going on out there? Liam's hiss was prodding at my skull. I shoved him out. Sleeping, I said, which was true. I slept most of the night. She nodded. All right, well, I have some visitors who would like to talk to you. The door opened, and once again the voices in my head were drowned out, severed by the duo's presence. It felt wrong, alien, a vicious vacuum bleeding into my skull. I didn't realize I was shuffling back on my chair until I had to force my feet into the ground to hold myself. The two of them could be differentiated by their faces. The one on the right had a smile that was almost friendly, while the one on the left was scowling. They asked me the same questions, and each time I felt myself starting to break apart, my facade crumbling. The two of them held themselves well, suave and confident while I shattered under the weight of each question. I was trying to find Sierra and Jordan, that black hole of nothing, but they were gone. Physically, they were in the closet, but I couldn't find them. Mr. Rayon, were you aware your professor was conducting research into life after death? That caught me off guard. I meant to keep my gaze glued to the floor and mutter that I wanted a lawyer for each question, but that one in particular sent my head snapping up. What? Agent Powell, or the scowler, nodded. In 2012, he was arrested for conducting unethical experiments on several volunteers, including sleep deprivation and intentional cardiac arrest. Professor King's medical license was suspended in 2017 under the name Professor David Castiel. His eyes were penetrating mine. Mr. Duran, have you witnessed anything you have not been able to explain? His words were eerily gentle. Strange lights, phenomena, or perhaps an affliction? I swallowed. The lamp on my dean's desk was suddenly too bright, too in my face. No? Agent Cassidy's smile widened. Lana, there's nothing to be afraid of. We can help you. I shook my head, my palms clammy. No, I haven't seen anything. Sorry. The two exchanged glances. Lana, are you aware Jordan Main and Sierra Nicholson were in possession of your professor's phone and ID? I tried to keep my expression nonchalant. No. Powell pushed harder. How about DNA that matches your professor underneath Sierra Nicholson's bed? No. This time I didn't sound sure of myself. I thought they were finished, but the two just stood up. Powell turned to me with a sigh. I'm not sure at what point it was when my brain exploded, but both men didn't seem phased by the sudden shrieking in my head. There was a steel rod cracking through my skull and stirring my mind into a soupy mess. I was on my knees before I could stop my body's knee-jerk reaction, pinning me to the ground. It was worse than every voice put together. A hellish, banshee wail, bleeding into my head that was so powerful, so painful. Warm, wet redness seeped from my mouth and nose, swimming in my ears. Not just voices, but emotions, sensations, slamming into me in a wave. I heard them. All of them. Thousands of mental cries pouring into my skull. Pressing my head into the carpet, I was aware I was screaming, but my own cry was an all, drowned out. Across the room, two voices slipped into my consciousness, entangled in wrong and poison. Harsh enough to rip from my own lips. I was on my feet, stumbling toward the closet, and then backward when they hit full throttle. Red, Gemini, Norbrook. Jordan and Sierra's voices were lower, a synchronized thrum drained of emotion. Red, Gemini, Norbrook. There was something horrifyingly permanent about those words not coming from their lips, but astray in their minds, loose thoughts finally hitting me. 
Miss Duran, it's okay. We're trying to help you. Now, if you could tell us where Agent King is. Agent Powell was behind me, trying to talk to me, but I was screaming, trying to push all of the voices out, and those three words were already threading through me. Before they could, I managed to get out. The last thing I saw was Powell grabbing Sierra and Jordan, who were like dolls, limp, dropping into the ground. Red, Gemini, Norbrook. Their eyes were empty, but their lips moved. Red, Gemini, Norbrook. Before those words could swamp me too, I slammed the door behind me. I was back in the hallway, and there was silence. A silence that almost knocked me off my feet. It was a familiar silence, a void I almost craved. He was close. Harry Astor was standing at the vending machine, his fingers lingering on the diet soda button. The closer I got to him, I expected that void of nothing. Instead, however, a voice entered my skull, sharp, like the blade of a knife protruding inside my head. Skin them alive, dismembering them one by one. His voice was almost a manic laugh. Not natural. His whisper was violent. Not natural. Not natural. Not natural. Uh, I'll stop it. Uh, I'll make sure it stops. I promised them. I promised him. He stopped at the soda button, his other hand clawing at his arm, fingernails scratching at his skin until it bled. I'll, I'll stop it. His expression remained nonchalant. I'll slice up every part, every organ, brain, heart, and everything. Nothing is left. He stabbed at the button again, impatiently, the spider web of insanity growing and growing, leeching itself to me like a virus. My legs buckled when I felt, sensed, the cold ice. I was somewhere hollow, devoid of light and warmth. There was freezing, cold concrete beneath me, something wet and sticky spreading around my head. I wasn't moving. My lips were numb and it was so dark, swirling, black, suffocating me. I could feel others next to me, lumps of flesh piled underneath like dolls, voices in my head crying out, mangled, begging for mercy. Something cold and cruel slipped into the back of my neck in one single stroke, and then again, cutting, slicing through muscle and bone. His heavy breaths tickled my flesh. The knife plunged in again, this time severing my arms, a chunkier, thicker blade for my torso. I felt his hands slick with my blood, my insides staining him, dripping and smeared on his apron. I sensed him stuffing me in a bag, careful to pile the chunks of me so I would fit. His heavy breath when he lifted the bag and I weighed it down. The splash of my remains, our remains, hitting deep water, sinking deep, deep down. I still heard them. Frightened whispers grazing my being. I existed at the bottom of the lake, swallowed in the dark. And I existed as splattered lumps of flesh inside Harry Astor's bathroom, dissolving in a tub full of acid, glued to white porcelain and clinging to the drain. I was still thinking, sensing, drinking things in. I had no body, no brain and thoughts still poured inside my consciousness, that endless, relentless hissing. Buzzing, screeching, it never ends. This thing I have, it will never stop. Clang. The diet soda can finally drop down, the vending machine beeping loudly. Harry Astor stuck his hand through the flap, grabbed it and cracked it open. He took a long gulp, his thoughts still latched onto me. He was going to murder me, dismember my body, dump me in a river, and then destroy my remnants in acid. And I will keep going, keep thinking, screaming into the abyss, tied to this thing. I was still standing in my college hallway, my stomach heaving. Harry was gone by the time I'd managed to get a hold of myself. The agents were gone, and so were Jordan and Sierra. My dean, of course, pretended they didn't exist, just like Tommy. We had a meeting earlier this time off of campus. It doesn't make sense why just Jordan and Sierra were taken. They didn't kill our professor, right? Why would they kill him? The agents opened up my mind to Harry's thoughts and then left. Do they know what he's going to do or are they just as clueless as me? If they knew I was a telepath, 
Surely I would be taken too. I don't know how to tell the others they're going to die. I start to tell them, but the words get stuck in my throat, because then I have to add on that they too are stuck like me, eternally awake, thinking. And I don't know how to tell them Harry will be the one to do it. I'm not going to die. I'm going to keep going. Even after I am brutally ripped apart by my psychotic classmate, I will keep going. I won't have an ending. A real, proper, peaceful slumber. A real death. I'm never going to die. And that terrifies me more than my inevitable murder. So yeah. To hell with telepathy. Let me begin with a disclaimer. I'm a vegetarian and the idea of any human eating the carcass of another sentient animal is absolutely disgusting to me. It would be one thing if we had to kill to survive, but that isn't the case for the vast majority living in a modern society. The only reason we still kill is because we're bored. We're bored of how our food tastes, and that boredom is a death sentence. We're bored of shooting animals in games so we go and shoot one in real life. We even kill each other because we've gotten bored of trying to achieve our goals peacefully. I try not to be preachy with my convictions, though. So when my wife asked me to pick up some beef for her dinner party, I played the dutiful soldier. I shot down to a local butcher and tried my best not to breathe for the duration. This was the first time I'd ever actually gone to a dedicated butcher, and walking inside felt like I'd just stepped down the throat of a living animal. Ribeye steaks, brisket pastrami, beef tongue salami, corned brisket, all heaped in piles behind the glass. Canadian back bacon, castler pork, peppered cutlets, all blending together in a great red wall. Dangling chains of sausages, salamis, bologna, hung up like Christmas lights all around me. The butcher must have noticed how overwhelmed I was, because he came around the corner to help me. He was a kindly old man, wearing a clean white apron, and he gave me a short tour of his shop. He pointed out a hundred different cuts of meat, but I'd never tried any of them and had no idea which I was supposed to get. He laughed with good nature at my confusion and offered to pick his favorite one for me, and I was quick to accept and get out of there. I don't know what kind of meat I actually bought. It looked bright and bloody and the paper package only said grade A meat. My wife wasn't impressed though. She lifted the corner of the paper and took one sniff before blanching. She was mad that I didn't notice how awful it reeked, but in my defense, I thought that's how meat was supposed to smell. We didn't have time before our party to pick up anything else, though, so we just left it in the fridge and scrapped together the best impromptu dinner we could. The grade A meat sat in the fridge for about a week because we didn't want to waste it, but by then, neither of us could take the smell anymore. We compromised by tossing it into the alley behind our house for the stray dogs that nosed through our trash. It was gone the next morning and a big scruffy black lab was hanging around, so I'm sure he enjoyed it. I went back to the butcher store to try and get a refund, but there was a different man working there, and all he'd give me was store credit. Whatever, better than nothing. I picked up some other random pieces to give to the stray dogs. This butcher, a round mustached man, told me he throws out a lot of scraps every Friday, and that I can pick them up for the dogs every week if I wanted. It seemed better than letting them go to waste, so I began this weekly tradition. The odd thing was that I never actually see the dogs get the scraps. I put them in a bowl in the alley, but no matter how long I watched, I never saw one of the dogs come by. The meat would always be gone by the next morning though, so I just assumed it was going to the right place. My wife observed that the black lab hadn't been back though, neither had the little terrier we saw sniffing around one day. It was weird because once a stray dog finds a reliable source of free food, they're unlikely to ever forget. We kept seeing dogs in the alley behind our house, but we never seemed to see the same dog twice. A few weeks into this routine and the mustached butcher asked to see pictures of the strays eating his scraps. I told him that I'd never actually seen them eating it, and he got all huffy saying a wild animal was probably stealing it. He didn't want to give me any more after that, and we had a bit of an argument about it. He thought I was trying to scam him, and even went so far as to deny that I had ever bought meat from him before, telling me there was no old man who worked at his shop. More to prove him wrong than anything else, I made it my mission to prove where the meat was going. 
I went as far as to buy a big, fatty New York steak with the bone still in as bait, then set it out beside a battery-powered lamp so I could watch. I found a spot that I could see from my bedroom window, and I glued myself there waiting for something to happen. About an hour into my vigil, my wife tells me I'm watching the wrong spot. I tell her that's impossible because I'm staring right at the bowl I put out under the lamp, and she tells me there are some dogs going at meat on the other end of the house. It was black outside, but I had my phone for light and could hear the dogs growling and yipping ahead. Glad to have my proof. I have my camera and its flash ready as I rounded the corner. My first surprise was seeing the bright, bloody red slab of meat we'd tossed out the first day. The color was the only recognizable thing about it, though, because it was now several feet across and at least two feet high. There had been two dogs fighting over it, one ugly old bulldog and hyper-aggressive chihuahua that barely touched the ground. The chihuahua was getting the upper hand, and I'd just managed to get the older dog to back off as I arrived. The chihuahua had its back turned toward the meat so it could focus on the other dog. It didn't see the meat moving, not like a natural creature, but swelling and oozing, contracting and expanding to drag itself across the ground. I started shouting to scare off the dog and get my wife to come see, but the chihuahua only turned a snarl at me instead. The slab of meat reared into the air and slammed down on the small dog with a wet thud and a high-pitched squeal. The dog was utterly engulfed and all I could hear from it were the sounds of snapping bones and the wet tearing of meat. I tried to save the dog by grabbing the meat and dragging it away. My fingers slipped along its slimy surface, and I had to drop my phone to try and get a better grip. The tighter I held, the more my fingers burned, until the corrosive pain was too much and I had to let go. The bulldog was barking like mad now, and my wife was shouting back from the house. The meat reacted by swiftly dispersing, ripping itself to shreds like ground beef, while each piece warmed its way into the ground. I grabbed my phone again to try and take the picture, but my fingers were slippery with blood and I couldn't operate the camera before the thing had vanished. All that was left of the chihuahua was a red smear on the ground. I told my wife that I'd just slipped and cut my hands, and I'd hurried inside to wash off. I couldn't bring myself to tell her what I'd seen, but I'm writing this now to explain what my thoughts and words have failed to do so far. I don't know if she'll believe it, but I have to try. If this doesn't convince her that meat is murder, I don't know what will. Old houses have a spirit of their own. We don't usually notice during the day when the sun is warm and the windows are open. Fresh breeze carries familiar scents from the garden, and the flowering jasmine vines snaking their way through the crumbling stonework. There is always too much going on in my house during the evenings to notice then either, with mom bustling around the kitchen and my two brothers jostling over their games in the living room. From somewhere upstairs echoes my uncle's warbling chuckles along with the canned laughter of his shows, and underlying it all comes the scratching, popping jazz, playing from the ancient record player in my father's den, muffled and distant around the many twists and turns of the narrow hallways. The house is comforting and warm and safe until everyone has gone to bed and the house begins to breathe. When the shadows never stay put where they're supposed to and the stagnant air drags heavy with unfamiliar taste. The lights are never enough to fill the room, no matter how many switches are turned on, and the silence is never fully silent. A conspicuous sensation of emptiness, even softer than the creaking floorboards or the rustle of wooden shutters against the wind. There's something else, something deeper, almost like someone figured out how to play the sound of silence to cover up something we weren't supposed to hear. There's an unspoken rule in our house that keeps us quiet at night. Sometimes we'll catch one another in the hallways on our way to the bathroom, or when we're poking around the fridge looking for snacks. We'll greet each other with a nod or a gesture, or sometimes a whisper if we have to, but we'll never speak out loud, even as children. My brothers and I never broke the silence at night. It always felt disrespectful, like shouting during church, as though we were interrupting something sacred that was there before we were born and would linger in those walls long after we were gone. Old electrical wiring can have that effect, my father had said once. He never elaborated on exactly what that effect was 
or gave us an explanation for how a faulty fuse box could feel like something in the dark was listening to you breathe. I sort of like it, you know. Makes me feel all snug, like the house is tucking me in at night. It has to do with the ventilation system, my mother said. I felt it too when we first moved in, but honestly, I hardly even notice anymore. Just leave a window open if it's bothering you. I didn't know how to explain to her that the house didn't want the windows open at night. It was as if I had pushed one of my brothers off the sofa and then immediately turned my back on him. I wouldn't have to see his face to know that he was angry. He wouldn't need to shout or hit me back. I would just feel the anger stirring behind me in the air, an insubstantial thing which glowered down at me until I apologized and gave him his seat back. That's how it was with the house, suffocating me with its anger until I closed the window and let it settle down. No one builds a house like this. If you're asking me, then that's your answer. No one ever built this house. It just grew this way. I liked my uncle's explanation best, even though I never fully understood it. My parents were always busy with something, and my brothers would never let me live it down if I told them that I was afraid. My uncle liked having me visit, though, because no one else ever did. His legs didn't work anymore, and he never got up except to drag himself to the bathroom. I'd sit on the end of his bed after bringing him food, and listen to him while he told me about the feelings I couldn't describe. Don't give me that face. People act like I'm broken just because I don't get around anymore. But being inside all the time has given me and the house a chance to get to know one another. It told me about how people come along sometimes and cut down trees and build up houses, and how the land is hurt by it. Well, how do I know? Because as soon as those people get up and leave, the land is going to try and heal itself. The gardens will start taking over the house, and the weeds will grow up high, and the animals will start jumping fences and given enough time. You'll never know that the people were there at all. Well, it's the same with this house, only the other way around. The land here was hurt by something a long time ago, hurt by something that was here even before the settlers came. And so the land did what it always does. It grows and heals. Only some hurts run so deep they'll never heal right. And so the land has to grow up a house to trap the hurt inside and never let go. You're only saying that because you're thinking about your legs, I told him. How is a house supposed to grow out of the ground with all the wires and pipes and things? My uncle laughed. The familiar deep chuckle that was so much a part of this place that it might as well come from the house itself. The house didn't grow from scratch, carpets and wallpaper and all. The shape of it grew, swelling like a blister on the land. And then the people came along and they must have thought it was an abandoned house that someone before them built. So they fixed it up and made it comfortable for people to live in. As comfortable as they could considering where it came from. And now it is our turn to watch over the place. What about the hurt that caused it to grow? Where did that go? You wouldn't be up here asking that if you already didn't know. You might not hear this in many songs, but there are some hurts that don't ever go. So you might as well make them your friend because they're going to be there until the end of you. If the house ever decided that it doesn't want us to be here, then you won't need me to tell you that. I would never remember those words if they'd been wrong. I think my house really did care for my uncle. And my uncle must have cared back because even when he got worse, he wouldn't let my parents bring him to the hospital. He never raised his voice, but he was adamant that there would be anger if they made him leave. I remember thinking at the time how odd he said it, that there would be anger. And not that he would be angry. But the only thing that seemed to matter was that he was staying put and my parents were very worried. And like the house, they never told me exactly what was wrong. I didn't sleep much that night, and I was awake when I heard my uncle gasping for air. It surprised me that my first thought was to be angry at him for making so much noise when the house wanted it to be quiet. The sound from my uncle was getting more desperate, though, and it didn't take long for me to wake my parents. Everything was loud after that. My brothers shouting, my parents arguing, and even the wail of an ambulance screeching up our street. I think my uncle would have tried to fight them off if he'd still been awake when they carried him out. I know he would have done more to convince us if he could, to make us believe there would be anger when he was gone. My parents both rode with the ambulance, and it was just me and my brothers that knew what happened. We were already scared and anxious about our uncle. It wouldn't have taken much to set us off or make us imagine devils out of the darkness. My brothers were so worked up about what happened that they wouldn't stop talking, though. 
about all the neighbors standing on their porch, about the beeping machines the medical responders carried, about what was going to happen to my uncle. Back and forth, louder and louder, then shouting again when one of them said my uncle was going to die. The shouting didn't stop, not even when both of them had finally shut their mouths. It sounded just like my brother's, the sound of reverberating through the halls upstairs. Only the voices weren't shouting about my uncle anymore. The voices were threatening each other with such cruel and violent acts as to make me flinch in phantom agony. My brothers didn't seem to understand what was happening, and they kept getting angrier at one another, threatening each other for real as they accused the other of trying to frighten them. Then one of them got his hands around the other's throat, and the other did in kind, and both were flaming red in the face as each precious breath was squandered on a snarl of hatred for the other. I involuntarily held my own breath from the tension as I tried to drag them apart, and it was then I noticed that something beside us was still drawing air. Hot and heavy and angry, the force growing with every disembodied breath. A wind inside the house dragged over us so powerfully as to draw us up the stairs, the blast of each rhythmic pull whipping the curtains, twisting the rugs, and ripping pictures from the wall. Hot and wet and insatiable panting, and all the while my brothers doing nothing but fight each other as they tumbled end over end. The cruel shouts and threats filled the air more powerfully up here, joined in by the voices of others I did not recognize. Men and women of all ages, their voices filled with such despising, loathing hatred, as though we alone were the cause of every harm and misery in their lives. Spitting, roaring hatred, wishing our deaths and shouting at us between each infernal breath. Hardest to bear were the voices of children, wailing and screaming at us with such revulsion and betrayal. Their suffering made me feel so guilty in that moment that I was absolutely convinced I deserved whatever punishment I was about to receive. One of my brothers had stopped fighting back by now. He lay limply on the ground with the other's hands still clamped around his throat, both faces nearly unrecognizable for the savageness of their exertion. The heat and the pressure was subsiding around us, however, and the wind was retreating through the cracks in the floorboards and walls. Now suddenly the air came sharp and cold as each window and door was hurled back against its hinges, snapping brittle into place like the fracture of bone. I knew at once the house was giving me this chance to leave it to languish in its hurt and its hatred. I can't explain how, but I knew that I would be safe if I ran for it now, leaving my brothers to whatever fate was bestowed them by the other's hand. But just as clearly as I knew that I would carry the hurt of what I let happen with me from that day until the end of me, and no redeeming glimmer of solace would ever turn that hurt into my friend. I went through one of the open doors that was offered me, but not to go outside. Instead, I went to my uncle's room, climbing into his bed and pulling up his blanket that was still damp with his sweat. I covered myself in that blanket, and I cried until the last haunting echo of anger had settled into quiet, and then into something deeper, that sound of soft chuckling that had always come, as though from the house itself. There is a spirit in the house that no one built, and with it carries a hurt so old that I don't think will ever heal. But I know that spirit by name, and I call him my uncle. I told him that it's okay if he never leaves, because I'm never going to leave either. At night I keep the windows closed, and I stay very quiet, and together we have found peace. And someday, another will name their hurt, and they will know that it is me, and I will never be alone. Either you have a soul, or you don't. It's the same to me, either way. If there is no soul, then a human corpse is no more sacred than ground beef in the grocery store, or the roadkill smashed into the asphalt. If you do have a soul, then it is already gone by the time you close your eyes for the last time. Either way, the body you left behind no longer belongs to you. Now, some might protest and say that a person is the owner of their body, so once they die, their body is inherited by their family, along with the rest of their possessions. If this were true, then anyone would be free to take that body home with them. Maybe they'd prop it up in an armchair or keep it in the freezer until the weather is nice enough to bring along on the next family fishing trip. If anyone tried to do this, however, their family gathering would doubtlessly be interrupted by the police, 
who would be quick to convince you that the body is not your property to do what you like with. That in reality, your body belongs to the state, and that it's up to them to decide your ultimate fate. In other words, no. I don't feel bad about stealing bodies from the state, who has no right to them in the first place. I work in a mortuary, but I'm not going to tell you which, because that would be bad for business. The first body I took was destined for a closed casket funeral. She hadn't been wearing a seatbelt during a car accident, and the force of impact from her face hitting the windshield caused her skull to completely flatten, like someone had taken a hammer to Play-Doh. I commented on the incident at the time to a friend, a male nurse who worked at a nearby teaching hospital. He offered me $500 on the spot so he and his friends could have some extra autopsy practice, and I couldn't think of any justification to say no. The reasoning was straightforward enough. He and his friends would benefit from the extra experience. That experience would then benefit other people during their medical careers. And of course, I would benefit from the extra cash. Meanwhile, the corpse certainly wasn't going to mind, and the family was never going to find out. So a strictly utilitarian philosophy dictated that this was the right thing to do. The woman weighed 126 pounds at the time of her death, exactly the same as 28 bricks, which I lined the bottom of her casket with. The funeral went as all funerals do, with tears and speeches and many furtive glances at the clock hanging at the back of the church. It wouldn't have been worth mentioning if the woman's father hadn't made this selfish request to see his daughter one last time. I possess a good deal of confidence in my ability to be persuasive, added by the air of authority I've cultivated in being a medical professional. Somehow I doubted that I could conjure any medical terminology of sufficient verbosity to convince the man that the accident had condensed his daughter into a pile of bricks, though. Instead, I was forced to rush from one member of the family to the next, convincing each in turn that seeing the mangled corpse would instill a traumatic memory in them that would forever taint the recollection of the deceased. Once I had sufficient support for this idea, we all descended upon the father in a flurry of pleading for him to forego the request. It was a weight off my heart when he finally acceded and withdrew his intention. As you can imagine, I learned my lesson after that. I would never again let myself be put in that untenable position. From then on, I would only sell the corpses of those destined for cremation instead. It's not like I had much choice in the matter anyway. It turns out that Wagner, one of my friend's colleagues who participated in the unsanctioned autopsy, wasn't satisfied with a single body. Not only would Wagner require a steady stream of them, but he even threatened to report me to the authorities if I did not provide. If I were the only one who paid the price, I might have fought back, but then Wagner went on to say that he would tell the family of the deceased. I couldn't bear the thought of how they would react, particularly the father who had only wanted to see his daughter again. One body a month. That's what he wanted to purchase. An insignificant number compared with the volume of business my mortuary processed. It wasn't difficult at all to move the covered bodies into the back of his van, nor was it hard to disguise the incinerated remains. Everything looks pretty much the same after it's been blasted with 1800 degrees in the cremation oven for a few hours. Perhaps simply working with corpses all day has desensitized me somewhat, but it didn't take long before these monthly transactions have become a regular part of my business. It's not like I was only in it for the money either. I've actually been donating all the money I get to help the families with their funeral costs. One time I was already waiting for Wagner by the back door with the body ready to go. He took one peek under the cloth, turned up his nose and said, I don't like that one. What else you got? What's not to like? I asked. I grasped hold of the deceased man's fat belly and shook it with both hands. He's jammed full of lovely organs to play with. We're studying the removal of ovary cysts, Wagner told me. I only want females from now on. The younger, the better. It just so happened that I had a girl in her mid-twenties scheduled to be cremated, and I saw no difference in making the switch. This continued for another four months before I had the chance to catch up with my friend again over coffee, and he was shocked to hear that Wagner still wanted bodies at all. Didn't Wagner tell you that he dropped out of medical school last semester? My friend asked me. No, he didn't mention that. What's he using the bodies for then? My friend asked. And as we stared at each other over our coffees, the unsettling possibilities began to float up from those dark places in the mind.
that we try to forget are there at all. Well, it could be worse, my friend said after a long pause. Then another as he took a sip of coffee. At least he isn't hurting anyone. You don't think he's... Wagner's always been a weird dude. That's... What's wrong with it, though? My friend asked, nonplussed. It's not like you're doing it with a kid or animal or anything. It's not like anyone's suffering. Well, we have to tell someone, don't we? I asked, not sure what I was hoping to hear. My friend shrugged. Telling someone would hurt people. Not telling would not. Besides, I heard Wagner used to have a girlfriend, but it ended badly. She got roughed up and the police had to get involved. To this day, he swears she's the one who started it and he was only defending himself, but she was like a foot shorter than him and half his weight, so none of us really believed it. So you're really doing the community a service by keeping him away from living girls. But why would he need a new one every month, I asked. Why do you care? It's not like the other girls are going to get jealous. Anyway, he's had enough medical training to know how to preserve them properly, so it's not like it's going to be a health issue. Shortly later, my friend got a call and had to go back to work. I kept sitting there for about an hour, not drinking my coffee, just thinking, while trying not to visualize anything too clearly. I know it's wrong, but for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Of course, my instincts revolt at the idea, but does being offended make it wrong? After all, humans have a long history of being offended by everything from scientific knowledge to using birth control, or even eating the wrong kind of meat on the wrong kind of day. And none of those hurt anyone either. And even if the offense of thought itself is the sin, then the only way the families would suffer is if I stopped providing the bodies and Wagner followed through on his threats to tell them. Not to mention that I wouldn't be able to donate to the funeral expenses anymore. That's why I'm writing, to ask for your opinion. Should I cut Wagner off, or let him have his fun? I have two immediate neighbors in my apartment building. Miss Bangles is a 60-year-old woman who somehow has a different man over every other week. Based on the noise I hear filtering through my wall, I'm inclined to believe she really likes the Discovery Channel and has the hippo mating season on DVD. It's the quieter neighbor, Mr. Rasish, that I'm worried about. There's this skittering, shuffling sound that makes my skin crawl. I never notice it during the day, but without fail, once the hippos have settled down, I can hear something scuttling around. I still don't like to cause problems, though, and I've gotten into the habit of just playing soft music at night so I don't have to listen to it. This worked pretty well until I started dating someone, and she spent her first night at my place. It turns out she can't sleep with the music on, or with it off, given the symphony of thin-walled building that plays every night. I told her I felt uncomfortable bringing up the heaving, grunting sounds from Miss Bangles, so we agreed that she would speak to her about it in the morning, if I talked to Mr. Rasish. I got the bad end of that deal. Mr. Rasish is a short, dark-haired man with a mustache and glasses. In other words, somewhere between an IT guy and the man at the playground with no kids. He was wearing a bathrobe when he opened the door, and there was more hair spurting out of his chest than I have on my entire body. Police? He asked, standing in the crack of the doorway like he didn't want me to see inside. I was in sweats and a baggy t-shirt. Nothing about me looked like police. I told him no. I was his neighbor, and I just wanted to say... Click. The door snapped shut, right in my face. I knocked again, feeling more than a little insulted. Again the door opens and he looks me up and down. Then I heard the scuttling sound, and right there on his foot was this cockroach-looking critter at least three or four inches long. It was crawling between his toes on his bare foot, and he didn't seem to mind. That, that, that's why I'm here, I said, pointing at the giant insect. What the hell is that? His mustache wiggled when he grinned. Her name is Percy. Do you like them? He opened his door a little wider as if to invite me in. I threw up a little bit in my mouth. The floor was covered in them, so thick I could barely see the tiles. More on the counters, scampering over the spoiled and uncovered fruit and open cereal boxes, scaling the walls, wiggling through the carpet, and burrowing into the couch that had so many antennae sticking out through the rips in the fabric that it almost looked furry. Sitting in the corner was a thin, unhappy-looking woman who stared down at her magazine without looking up. Her baggy skin hung loosely from her bones, 
as if she'd recently lost a lot of weight, which I'm sure I would have done too if my kitchen looked like hers. She made no move to shoo away the creatures, and it would have been a futile effort, as she already had a good number visibly crawling through her frayed hair. This is Yulene, my wife, and all our wonderful children, Mr. Rasish beamed. We would do anything for them, wouldn't we, Yulene? Hmm, Yulene grunted, flipping a page. She glanced up at me briefly with heavy eyelids, a weary, long-suffering face, before letting gravity droop her head back down to the magazine. A few of the insects made a bounding rush for the door, but Mr. Rasish closed it most of the way again and wedged his bare foot to block the exit. I tried not to look at the especially large insect trying to squirm free of his toes to get away. Well, don't just stand there, he told me. You can come in and meet them or go, but we can't just chat here or they'll all escape. I honestly don't know what I told him. I was feeling a little dizzy and my brain couldn't quite register what I'd seen. All I know is a minute later the door had closed and I was standing there like an idiot, not wanting to knock again. I'm going to tell the managers at the front desk, I shouted through the door. You aren't allowed to keep those things. They need to send an exterminator. How dare you threaten us? The voice came back through the door. Yulene and I would die for our children, wouldn't we, Yulene? Don't you dare come back. I didn't stick around long enough for him to open it again. I ran straight to the administration office on the first floor, but it was closed. Sunday. They didn't open until 11. I didn't want to go back to my room and explain to my new girlfriend what was there, because that would be the last time she'd ever visit me. I just waited at the office for someone to come. About 10 minutes later, I see Mr. Rasish, fully dressed, hustling for the door with a suitcase. It squelched as it dragged it, and a little red liquid drizzled out through the zipper. I called after him, but he just flipped me off and rushed out. My girlfriend started texting me asking where I was, so I made up the excuse of going out to get us breakfast while I killed time until the office opened. The only thing more disgusting than seeing those teeming masses of insects was imagining them while I was getting food. I felt like I didn't want to eat anything ever again, but I picked up some stuff for her and hurried back. The office was open by then and I explained everything I saw to a bewildered lady who looked at me like this was all my fault somehow. She said she'd call someone about it, but I wouldn't back down until she agreed to come upstairs with me and see for herself. Mr. Rasish was home again by the time we knocked. He fully opened the door and grinned, his stupid little mustache wiggling as he did. The office lady seemed embarrassed, but he laughed at her stumbling questions and invited us both inside. The moment the lady had passed, his expression changed to one of brooding anger in my direction. The place was spotless, and I felt like the biggest moron in the world. Clean counters, clean floor, I know I wasn't imagining it though, because the couch was still perforated in a hundred places where the insects had been burrowing a moment before. No, no pets, just me and the missus sleeping in the other room, Mr. Rasish was saying. The office lady apologized again and glaring daggers at me, moved to exit his apartment. Let's see the bedroom, I demanded. This is getting absurd, Mr. Rasish protested. These baseless accusations are no excuse to harass my wife. I didn't wait for an invitation. I barged through the place and flung open the door, half expecting a torrent of insects to come tumbling over me in an avalanche. The room was dark, with no sign of the creatures. There was only the fat lump of Mrs. Rasish, peacefully lying in bed. That's enough out of you, the office lady said. She grabbed me by the back of my shirt and began to drag me from the room. I'm so sorry for disturbing you, sir. I promise you won't be hearing from us again. How could I explain what had happened without sounding insane? It doesn't matter how many layers Yulene wears when she goes out. It doesn't hide how much larger and lumpier she is now. It doesn't hide the limping shuffle she makes as she staggers along, always leaning on Mr. Rasish for support. What kind of monster would I be to criticize a woman for her handicap? Not to mention the ripple under her skin, like a thousand marching feet going about their business. More importantly, how am I ever going to sleep at night with that damned scuttling sound? <laughs>